A little while back, I used to do this show on the After Dark channel called Manga Mondays, where every Monday I would review a manga that I'd read, usually while taking a shit. Usually just the first volume, but sometimes I would continue on past that point. This is a compilation of all of those episodes. I plan on bringing this show back. It won't have the same name. It probably won't be exactly every Monday. However, I will from now on be warning you about what I'm going to read so you have a chance to go and check it out if you're interested before the review comes out. The next one I'm going to be doing will be on Dragon Half. It's going to be more of a slightly more edited show than the old one, so what you're about to see is not necessarily completely indicative of what the new Manga Mondays will be like, but nonetheless, uh, Here's a whole hell of a lot of manga reviews. Hello everybody and welcome to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show with a constant threat of helicopter noise looming overhead. I'm your host Digibro and I am someone who buys lots of manga uh, by volume and reads them physically, usually while taking a shit. And I don't read them online and I don't stay caught up with anything, so this is going to be a show for out-of-date manga reviews of single volumes that most of you, if you cared about the series, read years ago and uh, don't, don't care what I have to say about. But I'm going to try to talk about some interesting and fun manga that I've been reading, that I've been picking up from the store and checking out. And if you're the kind of person who goes out and buys manga like I am, maybe you'll find some of it interesting. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Cells at Work, which is essentially... Os Osmosis Jones, or Ozzy and Drix, uh, but in manga form, as opposed to a weird, um, kind of shitty CG movie. It's about cells working inside the human body and doing their jobs. And it's presented as a over-the-top action comedy. Like, this is like page one. Shit's exploding. Shit's going on. I would actually compare the comedic tone of this to, like, One Punch Man or something like that, where there's, like, all these, like, super villain, like, big shonen, uh, you know, uh, monsters attacking, and the main characters have to fight them off. There's quite a bit of blood sometimes. It's, it's pretty fun and utterly chaotic. The most noteworthy thing about this manga is that there's just a ton of detail and a lot of shit going on at basically all times, and the artwork is great, um, but there's just so much that sometimes it can actually be difficult to process. You really have to take your time with each page, and there's also constant, like, notations about the human body and what each, like, cell or character does, because all of these are literally personifications of bodily functions and, 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 like, cells and different things inside your body. None of them is, like, just a human kind of character living inside of the body. They're just literally the cells doing the job of cells, but presented in a way that's comprehensible to a human being. But, like, for instance, the white blood cell, who's pretty much the main character, um, his mission is to kill viruses, and that's just all he does. Like, he is just... He is just a killing machine. He just goes around and murders evil alien-looking virus monsters. And, um... And that's, like, his whole fucking thing. And then there's... There's scenes where, say, a virus outbreak and a bunch of, like, mutagens and, like, uh... Uh, antiviruses are all coalescing into just these huge, chaotic maelstroms of shit going on. The, the whole thing is just, like, a non-stop explosion. There's never, like, a dull page. There's never characters standing around talking about something. Not a thing. The whole thing is just, like, each chapter will start off, a virus gets into the body, all the cells are freaking out, everything gets destroyed, you know, uh, just, just chaos at all times. And because, you know, their cells, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of them. So there, there's often chapters where, even though these two cells are sort of focused on as main characters, they're not special. They're just another, like, her name is Red Blood Cell and his name is White Blood Cell. They are not, like, named characters who are distinct from the rest that are out there. They're just one of thousands of these cells. So, like, when there's a reason for them to all be in one place, you'll just see, like, a hundred thousand fucking characters all doing the same thing, you know? Nothing is special about these guys. But there's just a lot of creativity in the way that they personify the different bodily functions and, and what they do. For instance, platelets, because platelets are smaller cells, are all lollies. 
and they're all like on a school field trip looking at all times and they just act super adorable but then they're also like you know they have the powers of platelets so when their job is necessary then they can be the most the most powerful guys around and yeah it's overall very entertaining i would say that this thing is worth reading entirely for the concept and execution of that concept but there's like there's no real story there's no real characters it's just about watching cells fight monsters that's the whole thing it's just action and humor like no one in it is like a standout memorable character and in a way that's kind of the point because each of them is just fulfilling their job as part of the human body you know they're all part of this one organism they're all uh you know just cogs in the machine which is why it cells at work it is not them doing anything else other than work, um, and their work just happens to involve... Here's a... Uh, well, you know what? I don't want to spoil that. <laughs> I was going to show something, but I don't want to spoil too many details about what happens, because it's, it's the kind of manga that you turn a page and you see something really outrageous happening, and that's a lot of the fun of it, is just that it's, you know, every page you turn, something new and crazy and, and uh, inventive will be happening. And it's uber, uber dense. There's just so much going on. It can be tiring at times, just the sheer level of, like... Like, if you look at this page, we've got, like, four different boxes just explaining... No, five. Explaining what those characters do, like, what their function is in the body. Like, this is borderline edutainment. Whoever wrote this either did a shitload of research or was a doctor because they know everything about the the human body and what all these functions do and it's constantly explaining those things which is like on the one hand i feel like this would be an awesome anime because it's so action-packed and if it was done with the style of something like one punch man it would be a really like fun kinetic experience but then the actual experience of reading it is it takes a like it takes a long time because there's so much text just explaining what's happening like what all of this is a metaphor for fucking helicopters they're just, they're just like landing on my house right now it sounds like they're coming to take away my mangas anyway Cells at Work's a pretty good time. I enjoyed reading it just for how out there it was like it's not the kind of series that I got like deeply invested in. Uh, again, there's no real story or characters. It's just about watching wacky stuff happen. And if you're the if you're someone who enjoys that kind of story, by all means pick this one up. If you want something a little bit more like heartfelt or emotional or anything, this is not at all something to come to. It is pretty matter of fact about itself. And that's the first manga Monday. Come back next Monday for more manga from me. Hey, welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show with a constant threat of helicopter noise that's filmed all in the same day and released over weeks at a time. Today I'm going to be talking about the first volume of Wandering Island. This one is a manga by Kenji Suruta, who I think this is his first manga to be published in the U.S., but he's been around for a, a million years and made a million things. I knew him best for a short manga called Memories of Eminon, I think that's the, the title, which I know was uh, sort of popular on A and, and around the internet for a little while. Um, but this is like an ongoing series that he's been doing. As I understand it, it updates very slowly, even in Japan. But um, I picked it up... For a very, a very clear reason that you will all understand immediately, which is that it's got really pretty art and the main character girl is always in a bikini uh, and she's cool as shit. She's this like 20 something girl who her grandfather dies at the start of the manga and he was running a, uh, a air air transport business he he flies packages to all these little islands in japan because japan is a gigantic archipelago a lot of people forget that you know there's a million little islands in japan and a lot of those they don't even have like any like boats that go to them or planes or anything like you know like they'll get a if they need mail then they've got like one girl on a biplane, you know, flying mail out to these islands and shit. And that's what her, her grandpa was running that business. She was kind of working for him and he dies. So she takes over. Now he leaves behind a package addressed to an island called Electric Island that nobody thinks exists. Here's her wearing shades and looking like a badass. 
This is this is the main reason I bought this manga. But basically, um, she becomes obsessed with trying to find this mysterious island that supposedly is just drifting around the uh, the Pacific Ocean. And like, there's all these old tales of people who have seen it, but all of them are of course full of shit. But she actually does see it, and she becomes obsessed with trying to find it again. So, uh, pretty much the entire volume is, like, a lot of build-up to her getting to the island, and then the entire rest of it is her obsessing over how to get back to the island. And it gets to the point where she's, like, this takes place over quite some period of time, um, and it's just her losing her fucking mind and growing more and more tired-looking and dead as she tries to find this island for, like, months. You know, her power gets cut off at some point, she's like... You know, everyone's worried about her. They're like, what the hell, girl? What are you fucking doing? She s sits around at home with no shirt on and fucking uses computers. I mean, basically, the, the, the look, there's one reason to read this manga. This main character girl is cool, you know? I think I was flipping through it in the store, and I saw this page where she's, like, hanging out naked and playing with a toy gun. And I was like, I love her. I want to read about her. I want to know her story. Um... Look at this shit. Look at, look at her. Fucking coolest chick in the world. She's cooler than anyone else in the universe. I want to know everything about her. Unfortunately, there's not that much to know about her. She has, like, uh, a teacher who she was in love with who had also disappeared before her grandpa. It seems apparent that both of them were researching the same thing. The island, they both ended up going there. She's trying to, like, this, this thing is very dry and slow there's not much that happens it's like pages upon pages of like no text of just her you know kind of wandering around getting into airplane shit and and occasionally talking to people and being shirtless like it's mostly just kind of a psychological exploration of this character losing her mind trying to find this island with really gorgeous art i don't even know what else to tell you that's basically it. I've said it all. Now, do I recommend this? The thing about it is, this was a $15 manga. And had I read it beforehand, I would not have paid $15 for it just because literally nothing happens other than what I've described. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's just kind of pleasant to take in like the images are cool and and i love like like these facial expressions and stuff and just i can't really get it in focus good but if you enjoy just looking at this girl if her personality is something that resonates with you as it does with me then you might get enough out of this to make it worth reading i don't know if i'd recommend buying it i don't know how long it's going to take for volume two i don't know if anything's going to happen in volume two um but it's it's cool to have. It's cool to remember that there was a cute girl existed. You know? That's it for this episode of Digi's Manga. I didn't have enough to say. That's all there is. That's Manga Monday. Sorry if it was a little short. Hey everybody, welcome back to Manga Mondays. The only manga show that's filmed five episodes at a time all on the same day and then staggered across weeks on end. And the only manga review show with a constant threat of helicopter noise. Today I'm going to be talking about... Let's see, what should I pull out of my pile of manga stacked up here? Uh, Neko Gahara. This is a very strange one. And I picked it up specifically because it's by Hiroyuki Takei creator of Shaman King, and I was just curious about what he's up to these days, because I read the first probably three volumes of Shaman King, in fact, I think I have the first two right over here, uh, back when I was a kid, when I was like 12, and these were in uh, monthly Shonen Jump in the US, and like, I've always thought they had really cool artwork, but Shaman King has fairly typical Shonen art, like, let me, let me show you some images just so you'll be able to compare. Like, you know, this is, this is not a typical of the genre. Let me find a big fight splash that I know is in this first chapter. Yeah, I remember, th I remember tracing this page into one of my school notebooks, um, of him hitting this guy with a giant thing. So, like, but Hiroyuki Takei is someone whose art style has evolved a lot over the years. And I remember seeing, I never actually read it, but he had his manga Ultimo that he was doing with uh, the fuck Stan Lee. 
And um, the art was a lot more wispy and sort of stylized. And then you get to Neko Gahara, and I mean, just look at the cover. And I flipped through this thing, and the artwork is fucking insanity. It's drawn all with this, like, uh, with what looks like just a real fountain pen. Like, it's all this inky, blotchy, old-school, like, classical-style art. Um, and also, all the characters are cats. All of them are literally cats. So, seeing... And, and also, it's a samurai story. So, just seeing this incredibly odd collage of elements, I had to pick this thing up. Um, I mean, I really do think the artwork is gorgeous, especially in, like, its backgrounds and its more... Um, like character portrait st style stuff here. Let me show you another good, good fucking image here. Stuff like this, like really strong, impressive character art with really great line work that um, that all looks. It's 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 got a deftness to it. Like each stroke was very purposeful. Now, the funny thing about this is this is it's about cats. It's in a world where, like, cats basically... It, it takes place in feudal Japan, and basically cat society is just a downscaled version of human society, but they're existing in the same world as humans. So all of this is taking place parallel to, like, I think the Warring States period, or one of the one of the eras, it might be closer to Nobunaga's period, I'm not sure. So Somewhere in the samurai times. I'm not very good with Japanese history, as you can probably tell. But somewhere in samurai times... Uh, the cats just have a society that kind of mirrors that of humans. And, um, like, cats who have been owned by a human have a bell and are, like, you know, considered owned cats. And, like, they're, like, a different kind of class from, from normal cats. And there's, like, a really rigid caste system. I mean, the whole thing is just a metaphor for the samurai times, but with cats. Except that it also takes place in the literal samurai times. It is just about cats being there at the same time. Do you do you understand how this is like weird? It's kind of like a mind fuck to think about. Um, so the cats live in this feudal society, and like the thing is that the dialogue in this is like laden with cat puns. I mean, I'm sure that the Japanese version was probably mostly just saying them saying ya at the end of the lines. English liter uh, translation, you know, does what they always do and turned it all into cat puns. But, like, the story is a completely serious, violent Chanbata story. Like, the main character is an anti-hero who's fucking insane. He really bears most resemblance to, like, Mugen from Samurai Champloo. He's just, like, a, like a fucking vicious killer who will murder people. You know, this is not him murdering people. It's just cool-looking art that I flipped to. But, like, let me find a, a good example of, like... The utter gore and bloodshed that goes down in this fucking in this fucking manga. I don't want to spoil anything, so I don't want to go too far. But like, this is a really legitimately violent, insane. There's like drug use. Like catnip is like an actual drug that like here here's him just having slaughtered like the first you know chapter one mid boss kind of guy. Like yeah, it's violent as fuck. Even though it's about cats. And the main character is like a, like a tortured past kind of samurai. He's like, you know, he's one of the super badass samurais who, like, everyone else in the story just pales in comparison to him. But he's wandering around being, uh, like, look. he says he's looking for a place to die. Um, but, of course, he's not just going to take death lying down and he's going to fucking murder anyone who tries to fuck with him. And it has a lot of the same kind of themes of Samurai Champloo of, like, not... Uh, not just kotoing to the demands of society and, like, being your own free-willed cat and, you know, uh, being a, a real stray. You know, he's like, there's a very romantic, romanticized take on the idea of being a stray cat over being a kept cat or being, like, a, you know, a part of a society. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's so weird, though. Like, I can't quite place it. As you can see, um, sometimes they represent like, beautiful women cats, like, these weird, like, whenever they're trying to portray a particularly, like, sexy woman cat, they always look way more humanoid than all the other cats do. Like, there's girl cats who look like cats, and then there's the ones that are, like, in the whorehouses who look like, uh, you know, look like borderline furries, which I think is hilarious and kind of adorable, but, uh, the whole thing is madness. Now, the problem is... That as gorgeous as the artwork is, 
the fight scenes are borderline incomprehensible. Like, there's just so much going on with the wispy art and, like, so many lines flying in every direction. I'm trying to find a good example of how, like, once a fight breaks out, sometimes it just becomes totally unclear what's happening. And there's just too many lines going in too many different directions, um, like this. I don't know what the fuck is happening in this image, but it's totally chaos. It's just like, you know, the already... The already very intricate, wispy lines being combined with speed lines on top of that and just odd compositions of frames makes it so the action is pretty hard to follow. Here's another... Here's a big splash of him, like, cutting down a giant... Like, it's... it's Yeah, it's pretty chaotic. So, on the one hand, it's pretty cool because, like, it's a cool Chanbata samurai thing, but then when the actual fights happen, I usually just kind of get lost and, uh, and I don't really know what's going on until the dust settles. So... The artwork goes back and forth between being, like, incredibly rad, like this, just, I mean, it looks cool, to, like, panels where I don't even know what's going on. So, I'm divided about it. On the one hand, it's such a unique and weird concept that I like it. But, I mean, the tone is so just implacable because of the fact that it's both dark and violent and goofy and about cats. And I can't really settle on if it's supposed to be serious or if it's not. Sometimes it feels like it's supposed to be schlocky. Um, you know, it kind of makes... Like, the first chapter was particularly hard to follow because the main character in that one comes off as more of, like, a contemplative, uh, like, you know, uh, like, traveling... Not traveling monk kind of guy, but like a like a... He comes off as more of a gene, and then he turns out to be more of a Mugen. And they portray him more unhinged as the chapters go on. And I think that's when it kind of gets a little bit more into its stride. But um, by the end of the volume, I really had no idea what to expect, other than that they're introducing some cute girl cat at the very end there, uh, who looks like she might be a badass too. But yeah, I mean, if this sounds like something you'd like, give it a shot. If this sounds like something that you'd want to stay away from or you don't like the art, then I would, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not giving this like a glowing recommendation. It's fucking interesting. I just don't quite get it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, that's your manga for this Monday. Come back next Monday for more manga and helicopters and, and the same shirt I'll be wearing. Welcome once again to Manga Mondays, the only manga show with a constant threat of helicopter noise that's filmed all at once, five episodes at a time, uh, and released over the course of weeks. T -t Today's Manga Monday, we'll be talking about In Clothes Called Fat by Moyoko Ano, which has a very cool striking cover that I really like. Um, for those who don't know, Moyoko Ano is the wife of Hideki Ano. She wrote Sugar Sugar Rune and uh, and the insufficient direction, the, the manga about being married to Hideki Anno. Um, and I enjoyed that manga, and I wanted to know more of her work, because she's a pretty prolific and famous Jose author. Not a lot of Jose stuff gets brought to America. This is one of the very few cases where it did. And it's published by Vertical, um, which is somewhat unfortunate, because this has the most pretentious back copy I've ever read. I'm going to read it to you, because it's so fucking embarrassing to me. It says, <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm going to skip the part where it's just summarizing the plot and go right to the, the praise for the book. Originally serialized in a major weekly news magazine for adult women, Shukan Jose, the first of its kind to be launched in Japan, this early gem from graphic novel megastar Moyoko Ano may be her most searing work to be published in English yet, closer in spirit to some of the best stateside indie comics. Originally, given its mainstream pedigree, or ironically, given its mainstream pedigree, than to most translated manga. In Clothes Called Fat is an indispensable addition to your growing library of sequential art for mature readers. <sighs> I hate Vertical for this shit, because they constantly try to make... Vertical's always out to make everything they publish sound like the fanciest, coolest, most like adult, mature books. You know, like, their stuff is, like, like is somehow better and more, like, uh, premium, which they charge $17 for a volume, so, you know, it's, 
It's I feel like they get away with charging more for stuff because they try to present it as being fancier and more adult and more mature when it's it's just fucking manga, you know? It like yes, it is a it is a story that is more adult than normal, but that does not make it better than you know, than everything else, to the point that they're saying that it's comparable to stateside indie comics as opposed to most translated manga. Because apparently most translated manga is just garbage, and indie comics are so fucking cool. Um, but that's neither here nor there. So, this is a very adult story, with lots of outright nudity from page one that I'm probably not going to show the camera, even though it's it's kind of, uh... The art style is very, like... It's got this, like, Jose look to it, but everything's very wobbly and sort of undefined. Um, like, there's there's very little, like, hard, like, like hard lines to it. Everything is sort of uh, drawn in a... I don't know how to describe that. It's, it's, uh, it's like, a, a, like, bubbly, almost. And basically, it's about this really fat lady who um, is in... She's... She's in a relationship with a guy who just likes her fat. And he, like, just keeps letting her get fatter and fatter because he has control issues and wants a girl who will be subservient and just just love him unconditionally, even though he doesn't really care about her all that much and is fucking one of her co-workers on the side. Her co-worker being, you know, the hot, beautiful, trendy girl who also is a total psycho and likes her men to be subservient and she's like a like a like dominating and the guy likes her because she reminds him of his dominating mother but he also hates his mother and wants someone subservient that he can kind of bully on but as much as that would make you think you would be sympathetic to this fat girl who's kind of the victim in this situation her her way of dealing with this is never to learn from her mistakes and to get better. She does eventually figure out how to lose fat, but none of it makes her a better person. And if anything, she just perpetuates the cycle that the other people have put on her and just kind of becomes as shitty as the rest of them. So this is a very dark manga. Everyone in this is a bad guy. No one is sympathetic. Everyone is just going through the harshness of their personal lives. Everyone is driven by their hangups. They're all, you know, emotionally destroyed people. They're manipulative. Some of them are just downright evil. And the artwork's really odd and uh, kind of off kilter. I mean, I don't see this art appealing to everybody, but I think it's good for the story. I think it's good that the characters are all a little ugly because they are certainly ugly on the inside. Um, yeah, it's just a it's just a really fucked story. It's just you you watch this girl, this fat girl, and at first you're kind of hoping for her to get better, but then as the manga goes along, you you start to feel like, you know what? Fuck her. Fuck her. She's she's not making the she's not making good decisions, and in a way, she's you know. Her, her reasons for being fucked up are only as valid as anyone else's reasons in the story. And in the end, they all just come off as going down the wrong path. And no one's really happy in the end. No one comes out on top. Um, you know, everyone treats each other badly, moves on. And uh, it's brutal. <laughs> it's kind of, it's almost like a... Tonally, I would put it similar to, like, Birdman, the movie. Uh, like, it's it's the kind of thing that, like, you completely understand why everyone acts the way they do. And you can't even really blame them in a way, but at the same time, you can't forgive them for the, the terrible things they do to each other and themselves. So, yeah. If you just want to see some bleak shit about the perpetuating cycle of being fat or skinny when really it's not the fat or the... S it was never this woman's size that was her problem. It was her attitude and personality and those of everyone around her. There's a great line in here where uh, this weight coach who had been trying to help her says, like, it was... She says, her weight was never her problem. Her soul is fat. And uh, it's a fucking incredible line. So yeah, um, 
if you've always wanted to see more Jose manga, something serious and adult and uh, biting and cynical and sexual, um, there's a lot of sex in this, actually. Uh, you know, this will scratch that itch. Just don't expect a happy story. Don't expect anything uplifting. Don't expect to see a character turn their life around and get better. This is a story about people being fucking miserable and terrible. And that's it for this episode of Manga Mondays. Join me next Monday for another manga that I can talk about that maybe won't be so sad. Hey, welcome once again to Manga Mondays, the only manga show with a constant threat of helicopter noise. I actually started this one in the middle of helicopter noise. Uh, this is the last one I'll be doing all in this sitting, so Jesus Christ. In the next episode, I might actually be... It's, it's just happening! It's happening! They're coming for me! That's my windows rattling, in case you're wondering. Um, <laughs> this is the last episode of this arc, because I'll be wearing a new shirt in the next one, probably, because this is the last manga I have to go through uh, right now. But it might be my favorite of all the ones I've talked about so far, which is Please Tell Me Galko-chan, which was adapted to a great anime series in 2016. You must have heard me talk about it, because it was in my top 20 of the year list, which would have come out like five weeks ago by now. Um... And this is, if you've seen the anime of Galko-chan, the first volume of the manga covers almost exactly all the same things in season one of the anime. So if you've seen season one, you've read this volume. However, um, there's a lot to this that makes it interesting in its own right. First of all, the art style is super fucking fascinating because it's all drawn in colored ballpoint pens. Or at least it's stylized to look like it. I think it might actually be drawn in them. But the entire thing is colored ballpoint pens and it's really fucking cool and like highlighters for for like the yellows on her shirt and, and on Galco's shirt um I love the aesthetic I love that it's all these like purples and blues and reds um it looks totally different from any other manga I've read and of course it fits the idea of like a classroom it's about a bunch of girls sitting in class talking and like it feels like it was drawn it, it was drawn to look like, you know, something a girl would be scribbling in class in her notebook, you know, and, and passing around to her friends kind of thing. Now, the the general idea of Galco is that it's very, like, racy humor that's all about approaching all these, like, t these taboos or cliches or, like, different ideas about girls that, uh, the, that the girls will discuss. Such as, so, is it true that girls with large breasts have large areolas. And the girls will just kind of have a conversation about that, usually concluding in Galco being embarrassed about something. But the characters are all very, like, sincere and heartfelt characters who are really fun to read about. They have great chemistry together. They have surprisingly, like, detailed backstory together. And, um... And it's all really fun to read, and it's just really upbeat and poppy and adorable. Now, the thing that I want to show you that's different about this from the anime edition is that every fucking page, there's these little notations on the end. And every single time, it will say, it'll start with, uh, Despite her sharp tongue, she's a nice kid, describing Galco. She's popular and popular in class. Uh, and of, 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 uh, of, Otako. She and Galco are good friends for some reason. And of, uh, what's her name? The o Ojo and Airhead. But then it'll also have some kind of notation about the discussion in that chapter, such as in the large breasts and areolas. Of Galco, her areolas are obviously smaller than car tires, as that was the joke in there. Uh, Otako, her areolas are bigger than, a mi bigger than miniature toy car tires. And, uh, and, and Ojo's, they're about the size of toy car tires. So yeah, it's like each one is like basically responding to the chapter with personal information about each of the girls in relationship to what they were just discussing. Sometimes it can border on feeling like it was too much information and was like they're like it's it's hard to tell if this is intended to be fan service or if it's just intended to be like who cares and we're telling you anyways. Um, but sometimes these can get, like, in-depth, and, like, the side notes become a part of the story, and, um, it can be interesting, like, what little details they decide to fill in through the side notes. But I will say, 
that it can get very tiring to read the side notes on every fucking page, especially because they always start off with the same sentence. So, like, you really have to, like, adjust your brain to figure out that you can skip that first sentence and read the other stuff. Um, but aside from that, I really love everything about the way this is printed. That, like, you know, when a chapter ends, there will be, like, this, this splash page of, like, pink with stars that goes on to the next one, um, you know, and there'll be, like, a little bonus panel. Like, it's just really pretty to look at. Every page looks really nice. This is one of the best printing jobs that Seven Seas has ever done. Usually their stuff is pretty bare bones, and their their spines are usually hideous, but this one looks great. I love the whole aesthetic of the cover and back cover and every single page. The, the pages feel weighty. This is, like, a, a really high-effort production which is really surprising because it's not like this is a manga that i would have expected to get super popular or anything um but it just looks so fucking good and feels good and again the chapters are hilarious the characters are a lot of fun there's very um you know like a lot of variation in the designs and stuff we've got the the i'm trying to look for the the pool chapter where they introduce those two uh little girls with the shark teeth yeah that's around around here hold on where where this this little boy is getting bullied by these two little girls and like these girls in in the anime i remember being struck by the fact that these two girls had such distinct designs even though they only show up for like 20 seconds in the manga they're like squished into one little panel that's like the whole appearance of these girls and yet they have completely distinct designs. Every classmate in Galco always has, like, a totally unique look. All of them have their own personality. Everybody in it is a distinctive character with in, with their own colors and everything, you know, in this version where they're, they're each drawn with a different style of pen almost. Uh, and then we also have some bonus pages in the back that are all pink. Yeah, it's just really lovely. And anything I said that's good about the anime is also true of the manga. I had just as much fun reading this as I did watching the show. I do think it adds a little bit to have the the descriptions, which are even on the cover, the little the little side descriptions, and the the art at the top of the pages, which is I keep trying to find one that doesn't have any pictures of boobs. Well, here's one of a uh, torn hymen. Um, but yeah, like. I, I like all the little additional stuff. I think it adds to it and gives it a certain rhythm that as when you're reading this, you know, uh, chapter after chapter, and even each chapter heading is a, like the headings are a different color depending on the chapter. Like that one's orange, that one's purple. Just so many little fun details that go into this printing. So if you liked the anime, I think the manga is worthwhile to read, even though it covers all the same ground. You know, the anime was a very faithful adaptation, but the manga has a totally different aesthetic, and it makes it fun to read a second time. Um, you know, if you like, if you like the idea of the story that it's just a bunch of fun, you know, it's like a fun little four panel. It's it's kind of like a four panel comedy, except it's not actually four panels, but it's treated in the same way, where each page is its own gag. Um, if you like that kind of thing, you'll enjoy this. It's as good as any other I've read, and the fact that it's willing to be raunchy and to, like, like most cute girls sitting around in classroom stories are the total opposite of this. They're very chaste and just, like, girls trying to be adorable and, like, talking about normal stuff. You do not get any other four coma or, like, you know, high school comedy uh, with four girls sitting around that's about their periods and breast sizes, you know? Well, you do hear about breast sizes, but this is a lot more in-depth and specific. And, and not trying to be cute about it. Like, it's it can be gross and dirty, but, but, not, but not, like, in your face with that. It doesn't feel like it's trying to, like, go, ooh, whoa, we're talking about periods. It's just, like, it's more like it's saying... This is totally normal, and it's it's weird that we think this isn't normal, you know? I love it. I have a lot of fun with it, and I will definitely buy Volume 2 when that comes out. And that's it for this episode of Manga Monday. I'll see you on the next Manga Monday when I will have read more manga. Uh, guess I shouldn't even bother telling you what they are, but you'll find out uh, at some point. Yeah! Hey everybody, welcome once again to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that is months ahead of itself in schedule. Uh, I'm Digibro, and I'm going to be talking about the first volume of Bloom Into You, 
which is a Yuri manga, rather obviously, that came out through Seven Seas that I had low expectations for, but it actually exceeded them. It was pretty good. I enjoyed this. And I had low expectations because back in the late 2000s, Seven Seas was a publisher that I was following very fervently because of the fact that the two things that they were trying to do that no one else was really doing at the time was light novels and Yuri manga. Two of my favorite things at the time. Um, but unfortunately, their light novels, most of them they stopped publishing because they weren't successful, and their Yuri manga mostly sucked. I uh, bought the first volumes of Tetragrammaton Labyrinth, which was abysmal, the first two volumes of Venus vs. Virus, which I didn't end up liking, the first volume of Hayate Crossblade, which was stupid. So yeah, I didn't really end up liking most of the Yuri stuff they put out. So, but the, their Yuri was a lot more successful than their light novels, and they've kept they've kept up with doing Yuri. They're no longer releasing it under the Strawberry imprint that they used to have. There's no no imprint at all on the back here, but um, but it's a nice looking volume. It's it's very aesthetically pleasing, which is kind of why I gravitated towards it. Aside from it being Yuri, and I was just like, you know what? Let's give it a shot. Let's see a new Yuri manga. And I actually flipped through it first just to confirm that at least a kiss happened in volume one. That was my prerequisite. And it, I mean, it happens fairly early on, but I was like, I need to know that at the very least, this is not going to be some like vague Yuri. I don't want this to be something I have to wait a hundred volumes to find out if it's actually Yuri. I need to know that there's going to be girls who are having some kind of relationship by the end of the first fucking volume or else I'm not even getting involved. And, um, I wasn't entirely right about that, but what's interesting about this manga is that it's about this this young girl who starts up high school at a new high school, um, and she has a run-in with the student, well, the, a prospective student council president. This girl, who's her senpai, who she sees turning down uh, some guy who's confessing to her. Now, the girl herself also recently was confessed to by a guy who she realized that she doesn't she doesn't like. Um, and she'd always fantasized about being confessed to. She's a big shoujo manga fan. She sits around dreaming of her starry, bright first love. Um, but when she actually gets confessed to, it turns out that she doesn't feel anything from it. And so she sees this student council president girl turning someone down. And she tells her, I also have never, f like, I've never felt any love from any of the people who've confessed to me. I've never felt anything, um... So, you know, so they sort of form a connection based on the fact that neither of them has ever felt love for anyone. However, it may be that the reasons for them not having felt love are totally different because student council president immediately falls in love with this girl. Now, the interesting part is that what it would suggest about this whole dynamic is that maybe neither one of them realized they were into women all, all along, you know? That's what it seems to be suggesting what you'd assume, but that's not really the case. That might be the case with President Girl, but she doesn't feel anything for President Girl either. She doesn't feel anything at all. And if anything, what ends up happening is that she becomes really jealous of the fact that the other girl has found love. Because she still wants to find love, and she thought that they had a connection in that neither of them could understand love, and they both wanted it. But now she has fallen head over heels for her, and she's having all the lovey-dovey experience towards her, but she feels none of it. Very interesting dynamic that I've never really seen before done this way, where the two of them are friends and they're working together because basically she ends up being the campaign manager for her attempt to become student council president. And so they're working closely together and President Girl, you know, is like trying, like, I mean, she's, she's full blown in love with her. She knows it, you know, they, like she's telling her, she's acting the way that someone acts around someone they're in love with but the other girl doesn't feel it back. And as the story goes on, it's sort of like she's... At first, she's just kind of angry and jealous about it. Like, she's just bitter that she has to be... You know, that, that, that this person she thought she could connect with, now she can't, and that person's hanging around her, almost rubbing it in her face that she's feeling these emotions that she doesn't get to feel, um, which makes her mad. But n then she's starting to become more and more curious about it and, like, sort of wanting to study almost the way that this other girl feels towards her and try to understand it better so maybe she can feel something like that herself 
So yeah, it's an interesting story. Um, I it's a romance I've never really seen before. I'm curious to see where it goes. I will probably buy the second volume of this, um, which is surprising because I really thought that at thirteen dollars and this tiny little volume that I was gonna end up disappointed with this no matter what. But uh, it was a pleasant surprise. The artwork is okay. Um, it's just it's very just normal looking. I guess uh, it's. Not quite realistic, not quite anime-ish, it's just not not quite shoujo. I mean, this ran in Dengeki Daio, apparently, which is a, a shonen, um, you know, it's it's where, uh, like, I think Gunslinger Girl ran in a certain scientific railgun. So, so, so it's a surprisingly, like, down-to-earth and quaint Yuri story for being a not shoujo. Uh, or not like a tr like not published in like a Yuri magazine or anything like that. Like it feels more along the lines of like a Milk Morinaga kind of manga. Um, but it's but the the art style to me feels very anime. Like the way that panels are laid out and the way that the character designs look and the fact that it uses uh, a pretty good amount of shading and screen tone. Uh, just the whole thing, like the way that panels are paced and stuff, feels like. Like, 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 if the anime adaptation of this happened, it could just copy the manga one-to-one, -one and it would feel the way that, like, that, I don't know. I don't know how to explain that, because, I mean, a lot of anime is based on manga in the first place, but just something about it, the way that panels are composed has the same flow as an anime would have. Now, I will have, I have one major complaint about this particular publication, and I would encourage you... To just read this story online if it's been translated, I don't know if it has. I mean, I'll probably keep buying the volumes even though this annoyed the shit out of me. But there is constant fucking um, uh, intonation in the in the words. Like there's like uh, words that are bold or italicized all the time. Like they constantly tried to make it so there'd be emphasis on certain words, and it's really obnoxious because like. It just doesn't flow with how I would read it. Like, if I was reading the sentences in my own head, I would come up with my own intonation. I would come up with my own, you know, like, voice acting in my mind. And the way that these are done, it, it feels like a like a bad dub. Like, the way that the, the words that they choose to stress, it feels like the characters are talking as though they were bad dub actors. And it drives me fucking insane. I'm like, why did you have to do this? I could have done this in my own head. I don't need you to put emphasis on certain words. Um, like, oh my god, I find it so annoying. And, like, every time I picked up the book, like, to read another chapter, I had forgotten that that was, that it does that. And I'd start reading, and I'd be like, oh god, and then I have to, like, kind of get used to it and try to, like, look past it and not read it that way. Because if you read it that way, it's just, it's so clumsy feeling. Like, it's, when, when, when they do that, it causes you to imagine the voices, you know, in that that way like you're gonna read the bold voices with more stress which means you're basically concocting a voice acted version in your head but whoever chose the intonations here was not a voice actor whoever did this is not someone who knows how to make stuff sound right doesn't know what syllables to put stress on or what words to put stress on it's just it's really annoying um uh, i hate when any manga that does that uh, I remember Yu Yu Hakusho doing that back in the day. I don't know if it was all of Shonen Jump or just that, but like, I've seen it in certain manga and it's always annoying to me. And this one goes way overboard with it. It's like every single speech bubble. So yeah, um, if that seems like it would annoy you, maybe read this one online. If it doesn't seem like something that would annoy you at all, if you don't even care about that kind of thing, go ahead and pick up the volume. Um, I mean, the artwork, it's nothing special. It can be a little bit wonky at times even. Um... But it's worth it for the storyline, I think. It was it was an interesting little kind of Yuri romance uh, like none I'd seen before. So, yeah, I do recommend it if you like Yuri especially and, you want, and, and that relationship dynamic sounds interesting to you. Check it out. Hey, everybody. Welcome once again to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show where you'll get to see the sun slowly set on me and the lighting shift as the day wears on into evening. Uh, probably no helicopter noise today, haven't heard any helicopters, so we might be out of the helicopter woods, at least for now. Today I'm going to be doing a very special review of a one-volume complete story, A Girl on the Shore by Inio Asano. 
who is a very popular manga author, very critically acclaimed manga author, best known for Oyasumi Poon Poon, Solanin, uh, Nijigahara Holograph, uh, all very critically acclaimed stories um, that people have wanted me to read for a long time. But of course, when I was at the store deciding which manga I should buy, I thought, why don't I buy the one that I've never heard anyone talk about that is described on the back as uh, the most... One of his most challenging works yet. So, of course, I had to go for that one. I don't know how much I'd say this is challenging um, in terms of being difficult to understand or follow. It may be challenging if you don't want to watch 14-year-olds have sex a lot. This is probably the most sexually explicit non-pornographic manga I've ever read. It is pretty much about the sex life of a 14-year-old girl and the boy that she starts having lots of sex with. And, um, I mean, you see tons and tons and tons of graphic sex in this book. I mean, I, I'm afraid to try to, like, flip through and just show you random pages because I don't want to end up, you know, accidentally showing you some, some hardcore stuff that I probably couldn't get away with showing on a YouTube video. Um... It's all uncensored. It's in it's in great detail, and the characters are very realistically drawn, so it feels pretty real. Now, the story itself is basically about a 14-year-old girl who's not really sure what she wants out of life. She lives in a really small town. She is a very just, I guess, sexual person, and she wants to fuck this the, like a hot guy who who she who she likes basically her her goal seems to be i want to fuck this hot guy but the hot guy is just a shallow asshole who doesn't really pay attention to her so she starts fucking this other kid who who really likes her but she doesn't really like him so she basically starts using him for sex and as the story goes along it very quickly becomes apparent that she's developing some kind of feelings for him but she doesn't want to admit them to herself she's not really sure what she wants out of life besides the, you know, the sex, and he, on the other hand, is extremely depressed and traumatized and suicidal, and, you know, is fully aware, like, basically he's constantly criticizing her for the fact that she's uh, abusing her power in the fact that he likes her, and that's why he's willing to have sex with her, even though, you know, sh he can't get what he really wants out of the relationship. He wants to actually be... A couple with her, you know, but she won't let him have it. And it's sort of the story of her taking, like, it's sort of a question of will she recognize her feelings for him in time for him to reconcile them before he, uh, you know, goes through his own sort of arc. I've probably said too much and spoiled this, but like, if that sounds interesting to you, then go ahead and give this a read. It's a very sort of uh, atmospheric, slow-moving story that is is very small and personal. It's really just about these characters and their hang-ups. There's a lot of panels of characters just sort of staring off into space thinking about things. It's very introspective and... Um, and not very forward with its emotions, except when characters are actually explaining them to one another. And there's a lot of sort of scene setting. There's lots of characters just in classrooms talking about music or or anime and stuff like that. You know, lots of just kind of getting you into the heads of these characters and sort of bringing the world to life is a very important element of this. I would really compare this... It, it feels very cinematic. I mean, the span of this... The time it takes to read it is probably that of about a film, um, and it's it's sort of paced like one. If you if you're interested in like mumblecore kind of movies, this is that kind of thing. Just a very quaint, small story that tries to make realistic characters with realistic dialogue, even realistic diction. The characters all it goes out of its way to have them talk naturally and have like really natural feeling conversations none of it feels like dialogue as much as it just feels like uh you know real real text except for in certain scenes um i mean the most interesting thing about it really is the approach to sex and sexuality of very young characters you know they're in middle school and 
it's a it's just a way that like feels so much more real than what you get out of manga most of the time where sex is like this really bizarre chast like like every with manga it's always like this weird combination of characters who feel incredibly chast and yet are presented incredibly sexually which is really bizarre this is just realistic like it's not really one way or the other a lot of the sex in this is not even really gratifying certainly not for the reader and sometimes not even for the characters and even when it is gratifying for the characters it's the way it's drawn just looks like real sex it's just kind of sloppy and uh unkempt and it's bodies tangled together and flesh everywhere you know it doesn't try to like hypersexualize anything not to say that none of it is ever like gratifying at all there's there's one bit where there's like a like a, a fucking really long continuous sex scene um that's like you know just seems like yeah this is pretty much this seems like what i'd like to be doing you know having this much sex it looks like a lot of fun but it's not it's definitely not intended to be pornographic or for you to get off on it which is the only reason I can imagine that this got published in the U.S. And I talked about this in my, uh, in my Insomnia Analysis 3 video, that Vertical Comics, who, if you've seen my, my video on Enclosed Called Fat, I accuse them of being very pretentious, that they try to, to sort of present all the manga they release as being, like, high class and, like, something really special, you know, sequential art for mature readers and all that. And on the one hand, I really hate that. And I hate that that's necessary, but in a way, I think that's why they're able to publish this. Because this is a graphic sex book about underaged kids, you know. And even though I think, personally, that this is... I don't make that much of a distinction between this and porn in, in terms of which one's more artistic or which one's more meaningful or which one, like, you know, is or isn't something that people should be looking at or whatever. Like... If, I mean, I, I've seen pornographic stories that are gratifying, that are meant to be sexual, you know, for the audience, that are still tell good stories, or even just the sex itself is good, you know, like, sex is a, is a part of life, it's a part of human nature, it's something that I think should be represented in art, and I've, I find it really kind of insulting that, that, like, it feels as though the only reason this can get away with being called, like, high art is because the sex is often not gratifying, and it's drawn realistically, and it's not drawn in a way to be satisfying for the audience, even though I don't think that drawing sex that way is, like, a like a bad thing, or that it's, like, somehow less artistic. Like, like we would not say that anything that's not perfectly realistic is therefore not art, you know, like... You're just expressing what sex means to you in a way that happens to be gratifying or idealized for the audience. You know, idealization does not mean not art. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's sad to me that we can only get something like this if, it's, if it is hyper real, you know, if it, if it seems highbrow, if it seems like it has a deeper message other than just the sex, and if it's being published by Vertical Comics who are willing to, you know, to, to go, ah, but this is high art, high art, you know, and granted, it's, it is artistic, you know, it, I completely agree that it has interesting things to say about sex and about sexuality, um, and about the, the sexuality of young people, you know, um, but I just, I kind of lament that it has to be this way, that it has to be presented as, you know, as challenging and bold in order for, for a sexual manga to be published. But at the same time, I'm glad we at least got it. I'm glad that this could be published in English because it's kind of shocking that it can, you know, I've seen, uh, cases of, Stories that can't be published in English because they feature, you know, these kinds of sexual, uh, sexuality between younger characters and stuff like that, uh, even if it is interesting. So, you know, I'm glad that Inio Asano has such clout that they can publish something because, you know, the fact of the matter is that 
14 year olds do have sex in this world and they do have complicated interesting feelings about it that are relatable and interesting to think about you know um they can be challenging to think about but nonetheless it's a part of our world that i don't see reflected in manga and it drives me it kind of drives me insane that that like most manga that i read is like romantic between characters even older than these ones and sex is like a like such a taboo topic between them that they won't even address it even though the whole art style is hypersexualized and i'm really going to get into this when i talk about the next manga that i think i'm going to be covering on this show um i don't know if it'll be the next one but it'll be soon cuz there's a manga i've been reading lately that that really exemplifies my problems with how sex is handled in manga, and this felt like, this was such a breath of fresh air compared to that. To just see characters who just, like, you know, to, to see a story that presents sex as a normal thing that actually happens, and be like, yeah, this is, this is what is actually, like, this is normal and real in the world. Um, you know, the story itself is, it's a, it's a sad kind of story. I would only recommend this if you want to read something very melancholy, um, that's very much about emotions, and, uh, there's, it sort of becomes more plot-focused in the second half, it develops more of a, of an on, like, a, of a, like, the first half of it is very meandering, it's mostly just these characters sort of, like, getting into their heads and exploring what they're doing together, and, uh, and the way that they sort of bounce off of each other emotionally, whereas the second half really develops, like, a plot, and, um, and furthers the characters and their arcs. And the way it ends is sort of ambivalent, and the whole thing is really pretty... Amb I would say ambivalence is the emotion this is going for. Um, so overall, I enjoyed it. It's not the kind of story that I think would stick with me in a really major way. Like, the, I think the, the thing that makes it stand out the most is just how much sex there is and how, like, uh, how graphically it's depicted and, and how it's not shied away from it all, which even in non-anime or manga mediums is, is pretty rare, you know, to see a story that just goes all in on exploring sexuality. But it's not that it says anything so deeply interesting or resonant that it's like, wow, that's the most, that's the most uh, artistic thing I've ever seen. It's just, it's good. It's a good manga. If you like Inio Asano, you'll, you know, well, I don't know. I haven't read any of his other stuff, so I don't know how this compares or stacks up or anything like that. Um, you know, it's definitely not his most popular work. Uh, perhaps it is indeed his most challenging, but I overall had a good time with it. And I'm glad I got to read something so different from what I'm used to. Oh, and that's it for this episode of Manga Monday. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Manga Mondays. Now, nighttime edition. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a different one because I'm not reviewing just the first volume of a manga. But the first eight, as put together in giant volumes of Mysterious Girlfriend X, this one. This is a manga that I'm extremely ambivalent about, and um, the reason we're doing all four at once is I bought all four at once, I decided to just fucking go for it, and I I kind of regret it, except that I'm, it's, it, it's an interesting feeling, so it's, it's not that it wasn't worth it, but that I, I don't think it's very good of a series, or one that I don't like that much, perhaps. So, Mysterious Girlfriend X... I first read the first couple of chapters of this back when they first came out in, like, 07 or something. This manga is old as shit. And, um, yeah, it was, like, just starting. It was just starting to get scanslated. I read the first couple, and I really enjoyed it at the time because it felt like a really weird, off-kilter take on a high school romantic comedy. You have, first of all, this very old-school art style where... It's, it's, it's very, like, late 80s, early 90s feeling with the character art. And um, the main girl, Urabe, is, like, this girl with hair in front of her eyes. She's got uh, scissors in her panties. She carries around a pair of scissors in her panties, um, which she uses to, to cut things up with extreme proficiency. She's, uh, the, her relationship with the main character starts when he tastes her drool, 
uh, cause she was, she was, she was drooling on her desk. He tastes the drool for whatever reason, and it causes him to become addicted to her drool. And the two of them have a bond through the drool because Urabe, for whatever reason, is capable of communicating through her drool. And she thinks that because she's able to do that with them, it symbolizes them having a very special connection to each other. Um, and specifically what she tells him is that she realized he would be the one to take her virginity. Now, this on so many different levels makes it feel like a kind of weird and off kilter story at the beginning. You know, the, the weird designs, the weird, uh, fetishistic kind of connection between the two characters. The fact that Urabe is very standoffish and doesn't, uh, she's, she's very indirect and you get this sense that this is supposed to be like kind of a, um, a story that's meant to be somewhat veiled and mysterious. She's the mysterious girlfriend, you know? Like, this is going to be something a little bit different. There's these weird dream sequences in the early part of the manga where uh, the main character will have dreams of him and Urabe dancing. The main character, Tsubaki. Him and him and Urabe dancing in this, like, crazy, uh, like, MC Escher drawing world, almost. And so everything about it, is like this should be unique. Let me see, let me find the pictures of the the dream world for you guys. Like this. Like these these crazy dreamscape pictures and him and Urabe are dancing and um here's the thing. This very very quickly devolves. It very quickly stops being a super unique and interesting story. And instead, it becomes an incredibly repetitive and boring story that makes no progress. Now, in, like, Chapter 2, I gotta show you this. Because in Chapter 2, um, Urabe feeds him drool that, that makes his nose bleed. And she, she made him cover his eyes. He has to close his eyes. She gives him drool. And it turns out that it was drool while she was naked. And she says it was produced while I was feeling very excited. So overall, this just felt like it was going to be kind of like a weird psychosexual manga. Like, it felt like it was going to be, um, you know, something that was more an exploration of that aspect. Especially when the fact that she outright says, like, you will take my virginity at the beginning of the comic. It feels like it's going to go a little further, maybe, than most romance manga do. No, it goes less far. It goes as little far as it possibly can. The truth about Mysterious Girlfriend X is that this is just a displaced-in-time Rumiko Takahashi manga. Like, it's just something from that era, those old, etchy rom-coms from the late 80s and early 90s. There's lots of fan service, cute girls, and, and like, the same thing happens every chapter. So as you go through Volume 1 of this, it very immediately devolves into every single day... The main character guy walks home with his girlfriend, and she feeds him some drool, and they have some kind of brief misunderstanding, or the, some some something happens in their relationship. Like, maybe uh, he sees the girl that he used to like, and Urabe is jealous, but after, like, or, or they, they have a question of, like, oh, does this affect our relationship? Then they taste the drool, and they understand each other better. And sometimes it'll just be, like, some weird little thing happens to the main guy, like, he, uh, is sick, and then her drool cures him because she didn't wear a bra when she fed him the drool or something. It's really trippy. I'm looking through Volume 1, and, like, the art looks so different from how it does by the end of this comic. Because it goes for fucking ever. This has been running for, you know, or it was running for, like, nearly ten years. Um, so... The first thing that happens to change up the formula at all is that a a, a new character gets introduced. Because this, this fucking comic really has two characters at the beginning. It's just Urabe and Su Tsubaki. And it's just them walking home, tasting the drool. No progress made in the relationship at all. It's just a bunch of little one-off adventures that often just have no real point. Then they introduce a girl named Oka, who is dating Tsubaki's best friend guy. And Oka is also kind of a mysterious girl. She takes an interest in Urabe, and she's sort of like a flirty kind of uh, small. She's like this little, this little cute flirty girl. 
And the idea at first is that Oka is making faster progress in her relationship than Urabe is. And so it feels like her existence is meant to kind of egg Urabe on and try to get her to make more progress with Tsubaki. Like when we first meet, uh, when we first meet her, Oka, she's just had um, a kiss with the or with her boyfriend, and they fi- Tsubaki walked in on it, you know. And so we find out that they are making faster progress. So it kind of puts it into like uh, puts it into oh uh, god, I'm getting all their fucking names mixed up now. It puts it into uh, oh Jesus, I've completely lost track. L- luckily, there's a character guide at the start of each book. Let me just consult that real quick. Urabe puts it into Urabe's head that like maybe she should do something. But the weird way that relationships are handled in this manga is, like, like in real life or in a natural-seeming relationship, you would kind of have a moment where things keep escalating. Like, you know, if you make it to the point where you start kissing, you're probably going to continue kissing more, like, more often, you know? You're probably going to make progress at a faster rate once you reach a certain point. But the way it is in this is, like, Oka shares a kiss with that guy, and then, like, a few months later in the story, there's, like, another moment where she kisses him, and then a few months later than that, like, there's a moment where she kisses him, and then she lets him, like, cop a feel once, but then not again, you know, and then, like, like, it's, it's, like, this weird meeting out of, of, like, progress, of, like, uh, you know, every once in a blue moon, we'll do one more slightly more thing than before, or, or we'll do the same thing we did before, but it's just as much of a big deal the second time. There's never that breaking point where it's like, okay, now we've kissed, that's now a thing we do, which I feel like is what's normal in a relationship. You get to a certain point, like, if you hold hands, now that's a thing you guys do now, is you hold hands hands in this manga they could hold hands once and then never again you know and it'll still be treated like it's a huge deal if they hold hands again it's just an odd kind of pacing of the relationship that makes it so nothing ever makes progress even with oka's relationship where with her it seemed like the the idea was she was kind of moving faster but then her relationship kind of slows down almost as if because they, you know, don't want to have hers, like, rush off and not be relatable to Urabe anymore, but they want to keep Urabe's relationship slow, then they both end up being slow. Now, the other thing about this is that o- Oka and Urabe are the the characters that are worthwhile and interesting. Subaki, the main character, is just completely milk toast. He's just guy. He's just guy protagonist guy who's dating mysterious girl you know he has there's nothing to him and the same thing goes for oka's boyfriend because he's subaki's best friend he's also just perfectly milk toast nothing character so the two of them are totally boring and oka and urabe don't make any progress and there's a moment towards the end of volume one i realized that urabe was just a boring character like there is no mystery they call her the mysterious girlfriend the idea is that she's very veiled and guarded or whatever But the truth of the matter is that she's just shy. That's all there is about it. And she communicates through her drool because she can't communicate well through words. But the thing is that every time someone tastes someone else's drool in this manga, they then just immediately explain what the emotions are. Like, Urabe will say, here, taste my drool, and then she'll just explain to him that the reason he's having the reaction he's having is because she felt this way when she gave him the drool. So it's like, what even is the point of the conceit of the drool? The characters can all understand, they can all explain themselves perfectly well and understand each other without needing the conceit of the drool. Now, it does come into play later times where it's more of like a proving it kind of thing, like proving what you mean or like that you feel the way you do, but... These early chapters really just become so fucking tired. Now, on the upside, the girls in this are unbelievably fucking hot. Urabe is really hot. Oka is heart-stoppingly beautiful. The girls who get introduced later are all really hot. And as this thing goes, it becomes more, like, fan service focused and I think that actually works to its benefit. Because in the early chapters, it feels like it's trying to be about the whole girlfriends are mysterious thing and the whole like this is what it's oh for a young man his girlfriend is nothing but a bag of mysteries but that just gets so tired so quick i was completely sick of this manga by the end of this first big book like by the halfway mark i was like all right 
uh, Oka's cute. Where's this going? And then it doesn't go anywhere. So then you get to book two, and it's mostly more of the same. The only thing that changes is that it grows more and more fan service focused, and Oka becomes at least somewhat more interesting because she's becomes like more of a tease. She's sort of teasing Urabe and like uh, trying to get into her head. You know, like, because at first, Oka is also presented as mysterious, so they both just seem like the same kind of character. But as we go, Oka becomes more of, like, this lively, energetic character who's trying to get Urabe out of her shell. And so their interactions are a lot of fun. But then the interactions they have with their boyfriends are just the same old shit. You know, there's panty scissors come out every fucking other chapter. It's just, like, it's just so repetitive. Then finally we get to here. I'm going to find the moment where it's, like... As we get into these, like, beach chapters, it becomes lots of full-page spreads of just, like, fan servicey moments, you know. Um, God, Oka is so fucking cute. Look at her. She's perfect. Um, yeah, so as it becomes more focused on just, like, showing off how cute the girls are, it's like, okay, well, at least I can enjoy this as just a fan service manga, you know. And, like, it's very clear that a lot of it is, like, the author just picking things that he finds hot and writing a chapter about it. Like, this one's about how girls wearing clingy sweaters is really hot. Or this one's about how, uh... Oh, what was another one that was really funny to me? Like, it'll, it'll just be, like, something that girls do or wear that's hot. And there'll be a whole chapter dedicated to, like, the realization that it's cute when girls do that, you know? Now, as this goes, also, I will say that... The faces keep getting better, and the art keeps getting better, but it also becomes weirdly homogenized, where all the characters kind of start developing the exact same face, and uh, we start seeing more and more of Urabe's eyes, because in the early chapters, you didn't, really see her, you didn't really see her eyes much, but as you see more of her eyes, they keep getting slantier and slantier and more angry looking, because that's just what the author likes, so by the time you get to volume three, she's got, like, permanent angry eyes, and, um... You know, there's just so many, like, splash pages of basically the same thing. It's either fan service or it's a a relationship moment. Urabe cuts something up, says something dramatic, uh, or, you know, maybe Tsubaki will get a nice picture of her that he gets to have around or so. Like, it's... It's very middling, and it only finally starts to get interesting at the very end of this fucking... At, of, of volume four, where... He reacquaints himself, Tsubaki reacquaints himself with the girl that he used to have a crush on, and she is trying to sort of steal him away. So where this story finally gets entertaining is when uh, Rechi Ueshiba realizes that he should put in some antagonists to finally make something happen. So the whole first half of this book is all about this girl from uh, Tsubaki's past coming back and trying to, to take him away. From uh, Urabe. And she's super cute too. As At this point we've gotten to like. Critical mass of every single shot of the girls is cute. Like there's no longer any just normal shots in this manga. Now it's like all fan service. It's all cute girls. And then it finally just goes like way over the top. By the end of this arc. Where there's a whole. Here let me show. There's a whole sequence in here where both girls are naked feeding him their drool and they're both naked for like a whole chapter and this is where we get to like this is now just a fan service like this is now just any etchy comedy and like the pacing is way better. It starts to get like there's there's less of the repetitive stories we're getting into like real arcs where like a villain is introduced it's about like you know how the characters are, are going to get through this situation using the technique of the drool and everything as, as, as like a, a narrative conceit and um, it picks up but it also just kind of loses the whole identity it used to have like in the beginning it felt like something so distinctive and weird then it just became really boring and now it's just like it's more fun but it's completely average like it's just a totally indistinct um you know fan service comedy except that it has really cute art uh and like really attractive character designs that look like the, they're from the 80s so then we get into this whole arc where um there's a girl who looks exactly like Urabe, who's an idol, uh, who, like, tries to switch places with her. And this is, like, a huge arc, like, almost two whole volumes 
of this, and it's pretty entertaining. It's an all right time. It really kind of feels like too little too late. It's like I wish the whole manga had always been like this. I wish it had just been a fun uh, romantic comedy, you know, like, 80s-style thing, because that's when it's at its best, and, again, the girls just keep getting cuter, the fan service keeps getting better, um, they introduce new characters who are actually interesting, and we get, like, it gets progressively goofier, where, at this point, there's a whole section of this arc where Urabe is, like, kidnapped by the idol's producers and, like, forced to pretend to be her for a while, you know? And it's, like, just... All pretense of her being mysterious are gone. Like, she just starts acting normal at this point. She starts acting more like a... Almost like a sundere, where she's... Like, it, it, it starts to feel like... Her putting on the aggressive act is no longer out of being mysterious, but just kind of obstinate or stubborn, you know, because she clearly has a deep love for Subaki and, like, is no longer acting quite as, like, coy and not willing to discuss her emotions with people, but she's still keeping him at arm's length in terms of the relationship. Now, unfortunately, after the whole idol arc ends, about this far into the book... Uh, it just devolves completely back into what it was before. It just becomes, like, episodic storylines about the characters hanging out, doing whatever. Though they do introduce this girl who is super fucking cute, and I love her. But she doesn't really do much. And, like, it just becomes daily life stories again. And, like, I'll say the art is a lot better at this point. And, like, in the early chapters, it really was just, like, static shots of Urabe and Tsubaki walking home every fucking chapter. And it was really boring to look at. At this point, at least the imagery is more dynamic. The character designs have gotten better. We get more expressiveness and distinct expressions, you know, as opposed to, like, the same faces every chapter. Now we've got Urabe making all kinds of emotions. But at the same time, she feels like a totally different character now. Um... He was just Oka looking cute. And, uh, and yeah, the rest of this book plays out with, like, there's kind of, like, a minor arc across a couple chapters here and there. But none of it is progressing the relationship at all. None of it's really moving forward. And there's only four more volumes of this. I mean, two more giant volumes that haven't come out yet. But there's four more volumes before it ends. I've read spoilers about the ending. I know this doesn't go anywhere. I know it stays this way through to the end. It's just it's just a bog-standard romantic comedy manga. It's just the same thing as any of the others. But I think about it in comparison to, like, Ranma One Half, and Ranma just has so much more going on, where, like, you know, Mysterious Girlfriend X, it really just has the drool thing, the scissors thing, and that's it. You know, for the most part, it's just the characters are, are pretty normal. Ranma had the whole everyone can transform into something else. The main character switches between a boy and a girl. There's like a thousand characters, and they keep introducing more and more of all these wacky characters with their own things. Like, Mysterious Girlfriend X is so slow to introduce new characters and concepts, where, I mean, it was fucking, it's like the whole first volume before they introduce a third character in the form of Oka, you know, and then like once per couple of volumes, they'll introduce a new girl. And it was like, I mean, it was such a breath of fresh air when they finally just like introduce anybody. And all of them are ones who were set up earlier. Like Tsubaki had mentioned like him having a girl he liked before was like a one-off thing in the early chapters. And the idol thing was a one-off thing in the early chapters. But both of those girls come back and become actual characters later, which is fine. It's just so funny that it's not until volume like, Eight that an actually new character is introduced who was who was never there before, um, and I'm just thinking about how much more goes on in something like Ranma, and it's like mysterious girlfriend kind of pales in comparison to the classics of the genre. Really, the best thing it has going for it is that the girls are really, really hot, you know. And I mean, even that's just going to be a matter of taste. But personally, I think the girls are extremely hot. So, like, yeah, I mean, parts of it were fun. When it got into the fun later chapters, it was a good time, but again, it was too little too late. It was like, why wasn't the whole thing like this? And I know it's not going to go anywhere. These arcs don't matter. None of this matters, you know? And when it gets back into the same old shit, it's just like, 
I can't believe this is still going on. Like, how could this manga have lasted so long, making so little progress and having so little of interest unless it was just because the girls are cute? Like, that's the only reason I could think of, which I guess is enough for a lot of manga. Okay, as I was watching that back, I remembered a couple more things I'd wanted to complain about that I forgot. One, it's really weird how the drool, as the series goes on, no longer is just a thing between... Urabe and other people, it's just like a universal thing, which is super weird, because in the early chapters, a lot of focus is put on the idea that the drool has, like, magical properties, like, Urabe can, like, can, like, not only can she instantly communicate different emotions to people, depending on, like, you know, how she's feeling when she gives the drool, and she can understand other people's emotions by tasting their drool, or at least she can understand Tsubaki's, like, there's also, like, full-blown magical properties, like it can cure colds, and it, like, just causes different effects, like the main character getting literally addicted to it. And it feels like in the early chapters, there's meant to be this sort of magical realism to the story that centers around Urabe. That's part of why she is mysterious. And then when Oka gets introduced, she and Urabe also have a connection through Urabe's drool, and that's why she is, like, willing to entertain her being around, you know? So, the idea here is, like, Urabe's drool is special, and if you have a connection to Urabe, then that drool will, will do something. But then, when they start introducing the villain characters, in both cases, Urabe basically teaches them about the drool as a technique that just anyone can do. That any two people who have a connection to each other will be able to have effects of their drool. So there's, like, these whole arcs of, like, other girls, you know, making uh, Tsubaki taste their drool as, like, a co competition thing. Like, whoever's drool he reacts to more is the one he's really in love with. And I'm like, why is drool in this universe just, like, now, now it's just everyone. Now it's just, if you're, yeah, if you love someone for real, then your drool will have effects on them. It's not just a Nurabe thing. So that's fucking weird. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but I'm okay with that for the most part, because the drool thing never made sense in the first place. But then there's also this, this manga's weird take on, like, relationships and what it seems to think is just, like, matter-of-fact stuff. Like, for instance, Oka and Tsub um, or Oka's boyfriend and Tsubaki are, like, basically the same guy. And both of their relationships are basically the same relationship. And it really gives you this feeling like the author thinks this is just, like, the only way relationships are or something. Like, that in both cases, it's like the girl has all the control, really. Um, she just, like, kind of forces the guy to just move at her pace. In both cases, the guy, of course, would love to go faster, but is just going at whatever speed the girl commands him to. You know, like, that's all there is to it. It's just, she's in control, that's the relationship. The guy is just a hapless, going along, along for the ride kind of guy. And these relationships go for what seems to be years, even though the characters don't age or move on to the next grade. Like... In one of the early chapters, it's summertime, and uh, the main guy is thinking, man, I'd love to see her in her summer clothes again next summer. And then you see that next summer, and then you see another next summer. So, like, two years have passed, but no actual time has passed in the story, even though we've gone through two whole seasonal cycles. Don't know how that one works, um, but that's sort of a common issue, I guess. But, yeah, they're all in the same class still. So I have no idea how much time has actually passed in this manga. It would seem like, I mean, there's times where characters make reference to something being months ago. So it's just like, they're in this weird limbo of no progress being made, even in their own lives. But yeah, in spite of how long it lasts, nothing ever changes about the characters' relationships. It's always the same dynamic in both relationships. And then there's also the weird way that, like, all of them... Like, every time something happens to one, it'll happen to all. Like, like um, we find out that uh, Oka's boyfriend is kind of possessive. And then Tsubaki realizes that he's kind of possessive. And then Oka uh, uh, Urabe realizes she's kind of possessive. And it's like, you're all just the same character. Like, like it's, it's as though he thinks, the author thinks that, like, all people just feel the same way about each other, you know? And then there's this, like... 
this weird thing where it's like Tsubaki will have moments where he tries to hug Urabe and she always refu- like she won't ever let him touch her. She's like, don't ever hug me without my permission. And she'll take out her scissors and swipe at him. But the weird thing is that it's not, it, it's like half the time it's presented as if Tsubaki literally can't control himself. That like when certain things happen, his body just reacts by trying to hug her. And like he, it's like not even something he thinks about or something. It's really odd, and it, it feels like, it just feels like the author has a way that he thinks everyone thinks about relationships, and a way that people act, and that's just how everyone acts in this. Everyone has the exact same view of romance, and, and pacing their romance, and how to act around each other. It's bizarre. So yeah, I would not recommend this manga. Like, it, I mean... If you go into it expecting it to just be a bog standard etchy with some pretty attract, like if you like the designs, then go for it. You know, like it's it's not that it's not worth reading because I've read plenty of bullshit like this. You know, like it's it's better than like Two Love Rue. It's or I don't know if it's better than Two Love Rue, but it's you know it's on the same kind of like wavelength as that. Um, but, like, don't expect something better than that. Don't expect this to be better than Two Love Rue just because it looks like it's from the 80s and has kind of a weird concept. You know, like, if you go into this thinking, oh, it's so off-kilter and weird, um, you're just going to be let down. And uh, so, yeah. I can't say I recommend it. And on this show, I've usually talked about manga I recommend because it's, you know, it's only once a week. I feel weird about, like, I feel like, Part of the appeal of Manga Mondays is you watch the show, I tell you about some weird manga, and then you go read it. Um, and so far, the closest I've come to not recommending something was probably Wandering Island, and even that I, you know, somewhat recommended. Mysterious Girlfriend is hard to recommend. Again, if you think the girls are super cute, give it a read. Don't buy it. Uh, read Ranma instead, or watch Ranma instead, or uh, read, like, I don't know, there's, there's lots of other, you know fun, etchy high school comedies that do more and are not quite as redundant as this one. Getting to those early chapters was really a slog. Volumes 3 and 4 of the big ones were a lot easier. Even Volume 2 was a bit easier just because the fan service got better. Volume 1 was a real fucking slog, so, uh, yeah. Anyway, that's Manga Mondays. This one was extra long. Um, it took a lot of... I, I really had to power through all those to make this video because... After I read Volume 1, I was like, I, I gotta get this done. Because I, it, the, the problem was that I was reading it... What I usually do when I read manga is I read it on the shitter, you know, and I read, like, one chapter per time I use the bathroom. And so I was, like, for days just reading the same chapter over and over again in Volume 1, and it was driving me insane. So finally I just read through all the rest of the volumes, like, each one, one at a time, like, the whole thing, and um, powered through it. But yeah. Uh, next time, something easier. Yay. Hey everybody, welcome back to Manga Monday's Sunset Edition, the only manga review show where the lighting progressively gets worse over the course of the video, even though it's already dark as shit. I'm going to be talking about Platinum End, the first volume in this video. I don't think the second volume of this is out yet in America, but I know it's being scanslated. Um, online, I've only read the first one, but this is the new manga from Tsugumi Oba and Teshi Ta Takeshi Obata, the duo who brought us, most famously, Death Note, as well as my favorite manga of all time, Bakuman. Now, this one is very much more along the lines of Death Note than Bakuman. It's going right back into the well of sort of edgy, teenager, um, high-concept kind of, like, a death game sort of plot. Not quite a death game, but there... A lot of people are comparing this to Death Note for the obvious reason that it's from the same authors, and it's once again is about a young a young man who is granted some kind of uh, godlike power. In this case, by an angel as opposed to a Shinigami, and this one's more like a Christian mythos as opposed to um, whatever the hell the Shinigami were supposed to be. I guess there was a lot of Christian mythos like imagery in uh, Death Note, especially in the anime, but. But this one is an angel who works for God, comes down and gives these powers to this young man as a candidate to become God. And there's like 13 candidates. So in spite of the fact that this is being compared to Death Note, it's really almost the exact same plot as Future Diary. 
Um, except that the characters have more consistent powers. It's not that they all have the exact same things going, or they, that they all have wildly different things going on. They have pretty similar ones. Um, in this case, the main character is given uh, the power of two arrows, one which can instantly kill people, and one which can make people fall in love with him, and to such an extent that he basically is able to mind control them. Um, but that effect lasts for like 33 days or something like that. And everyone has, like, like him and the other candidates, some of them have both of these powers, some of them only have one, um, some of them may or may not have more, like, the, the basically depends on how strong the angel that they have working for them is. So the main character is this young boy who gets this super fucking cute angel girl who does, who's, like, his guardian angel... God, I can't make this focus well. I'm sorry, it's so dark. Um, basically, she grants him these powers because she thinks that he could be a good god candidate. And she really wants him to succeed. She's all about him. But what she can't quite grasp is why he wants no real part of this. Now, this kid is a very tortured young soul. He's like 14 years old, and his his family died when he was young. He was taken in by his aunt and uncle, who just abuse him and treat him like shit. And he sort of gets out of that situation by the end of the first volume because of these powers. All he wants is to live a normal life. He wants to be a normal high school kid. He wants to fall in love with this girl. He just wants everything to go you know to 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 let him be happy and he has a lot of philosophical waxing about his desire for happiness and about like his thoughts on like um like what morality means to him and how he just wants to like be happy and to treat and to love other people and and stuff like that that's all he wants so he's in many ways the opposite of light yagami here's him seeing the angel girl god i wish i could get this better in focus because the girl is fucking gorgeous um, but he ends up, you know, enraptured in this whole scenario where there's all these angels and all these other candidates to be God who are all using their powers in different ways. The first guy we learn about is this asshole, this smug, uh, comedian who decides to use his powers to, uh, just rape all the most beautiful women in Japan, um, which has this kind of epic shot of him in a in a limo with like every beautiful girl that he's mind controlled to fall in love with him there's like a limit of how many i think it's like 12 or something like that um he's he's crying about how he can't do all 48 members of akiba 48 at the same time because he can only control so many girls but uh yeah he he has them all in this orgy pile i'm, tr I'm glad the lighting is bad so you can't see all the tits that are actually evident in this surprising amount of nipple but um in this manga but yeah so he, so the first guy is using his powers for evil. Um, then we are introduced to someone who's trying to use their powers for justice, who is obviously like the L character of this, but he seems a little bit more of a bad guy, um, and he wears like a hero suit, and uh, but he's obviously going to be like the other big one that we all need to look out for. And then the main character, uh, you know, here's the guy, here's the other dude. He's uh, you know, another wavy-haired, beautiful guy. And the, uh, the girl who the main character is in love with comes into play towards the end of the volume in a way that seems like it could be interesting. So yeah, it's a very plot-heavy thing. This is mostly about this, this death game story, how these different mechanics are going to be explored. And honestly, this first volume, like, I didn't find it that interesting because most of it is just setting stuff up. Like, so much of it is just, like endless exposition scenes there's so many scenes of this the angel girl explaining rules at great length or them discussing the main character kid's emotions and like his philosophies on life none of which are very deep or interesting like this is definitely written for like 14 year olds you know like this is this is a very uh teenage feeling manga it's very like shonen in spite of the fact that it's so edgy and like violent and uh and has sex and nudity and stuff like that but like it's obviously meant for a younger audience um in much the same way that death note was but i feel like death note had more of a broad appeal than this this feels a little bit more juvenile than death note did um but so much of it is just talking and explaining the rules of stuff and like you know there's very little of the powers being used in interesting ways or or getting into characters heads you know, there's there's not much establishment of how this whole game is going to be played out, like what each person's goals are, how those goals are going to come into conflict. It's just a whole lot of explaining the ground rules of the game. And uh, so, you know, it was kind of interesting, but it didn't really feel like it was going anywhere. And, like, I mean, I'm curious enough about 
what might happen that like if i started hearing people say that the series gets really good then i'd be interested in it but it doesn't have the the sort of ideological simplicity that, uh, like the strength and simplicity that death note had where it was like really about this battle between this guy who's trying to like end all crime on earth and this other guy who's trying to put a stop to him and you know they both believe in their own brand of justice this is battle of wits that was really exciting this doesn't have that element. It doesn't have the Battle of Wits feel. It doesn't have, like, a villain who's exactly opposed to the ethos of the main character. You know, it just kind of feels like it's wandering around through the story. Just introducing all these elements of, like, how the story works without really doing anything with those elements. At least so far. I mean, I don't think it's bad. It's just not terribly interesting yet and there's just so much sitting around and it really feels like a shame because Takeshi Obata is an amazing artist like the there's there's illustrations in here like character art that's just really fucking gorgeous but all the characters do is stand around and talk and I mean Tsugubi Oba scripts have always been very talkative Death Note and Bakuman were no different most of it was characters sitting around talking I just gotta wonder like isn't Obata bored of this by now? Is he not bored of just drawing characters stand around and talk in, like, hotel rooms and just drawing their ridiculously gorgeous hair, you know? It just feels like a waste to have this beautiful art for a series that's mostly characters standing around. Um, but, you know, again, if I started hearing... Like, I, I don't intend to buy the second volume of this. If I started hearing people tell me that this series gets amazing, which I have not been hearing. I've mostly been hearing that it's okay, that it's just kind of a fun little shonen thing you know like i don't think this is even as exciting as the first volume of future diary was you know so like as far as being this kind of story goes it's pretty middle of the road there's a lot of stuff like this out there there's a lot of these 13 people are given powers and told they have to fight you know kinds of stories like this is not treading any new ground it's definitely not blazing blazing a trail here it's it's pretty standard um, so, you know, you could pretty much read any of, I mean, if you like that kind of story, maybe you'll like this. I don't think it's terribly exciting yet, but maybe it will get there if you're into that, uh, that genre. I'm not that big a fan of this genre. You know, I love the, the duo. I mean, Death Note was fine. I liked Death Note back in the day. I love Bakuman, so I was willing to give this a shot, but ultimately I just kind of felt like mm, this one might not be for me, but, uh, you know, we'll see in the future or you'll see and I'll hear about it and then maybe read it. <laughs> That's it. See you in the next week. Welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that's getting fucking ahead of itself again, baby. Yeah, we're going to have scheduled videos for weeks. I am reviewing Golden Kamui, which is a new series that I picked up just because I hadn't heard of it, and I thought the cover art was pretty striking. There's a fucking vicious bear on the back. And I gotta say, if you look at this cover art, and you get excited at the prospect of this being the main character, like a hardened, older, uh, fucking soldier guy, and you like the idea of what he might have to do with a grizzly bear, you're gonna love this manga. Like, if, if that's the kind of thing you're excited about, you will love this manga. This is a thriller story about a guy who is known as, a uh, Immortal... Sugimoto, and basically he was fighting in the Russo-Japanese War. This takes place in like the very early 1900s, um, and he he was fighting in the Russo-Japanese War, and basically he couldn't die. Like he he got stabbed and shot multiple times, but he would always fight on, and he murdered tons and tons of people during that war. And uh, sometime after the war, he's trying to basically find gold because one of his friends who died on the battlefield was trying to. Uh, send his sick wife off to America to have, like, eye surgery done on her or whatever. But he dies in the war, so the main character is trying to uh, find some gold so he can take care of that guy's dying wish, essentially. And uh, he's just a super badass who's going out of his way to find this gold. And at first he's trying to prospect for it in the mountains of Hokkaido, uh, which is the northernmost island of Japan. When uh, he meets somebody who tells him this story about all these prisoners with tattoos on their backs that lead to a, uh, that like are a map for a secret gold stash that some famous criminal has somewhere. And so the main character has to embark on this journey to find all these people with tattoos, gather them so he can get his way to the gold. Um, all of which, this whole story is themed around the Ainu, which are like the native people of Hokkaido. 
Um, and the main character teams up with an Ainu girl, and the two of them are fucking... are gonna go on this quest together. So, uh, yeah. This is a deeply violent and extremely fast-paced manga. Like, this thing moves at a breakneck speed. It's always introducing new plot points. Like, everything I just told you, that's just the setup. Like, that's all... You know all that by the end of chapter one. And from there, it just barrels through plot points at a constant rate. They're always introducing, like, new characters, new ideas, uh, new, like, action scenes, and then each one will be over in a couple of pages. There'll be times where a character's introduced and you really think, like, oh, this guy seems like he might be an actual character. He might be a recurring character. And, like, three pages later, he'll get shot in the face, and then they'll be moving on to the next thing. So that's kind of what keeps this interesting. And the artwork is really nice. I mean, it's sort of a realistic style, you know, um, our main character guy is an, an older dude with scars on his face. He's a very classic badass kind of character. Here's the Ainu girl he teams up with. She's like a preteen, um, but she's a badass too because she's a woodsman and she knows her way around. Oh, here's a great shot of her uh, shooting a bear with an arrow. Um, the artwork is dynamic. It can, you know, it can be uh, all kinds of different stuff. There's lots going on, and again, the pacing is just insanely fast, and the action's really exciting, because it uses lots of unique ideas. It uses lots of Ainu tricks and stuff like that, where they'll set traps in the woods, either to catch animals or to catch people. Um, there's, you know, there's gunfights, there's bear fights, there's knife fights, there's people getting disemboweled, there's lots of extreme violence, in spite of the fact that the artwork feels very light and breezy, like... In general, it doesn't ever take a dark tone. It's always sort of in the thriller mindset, even though there are some incredibly violent things that happen. Um, you know, you will see some guts. You will see lots of dead bodies. You will see uh, people just get fucking brained <laughs> out of nowhere. Um, so it's pretty exciting, but never, like, overly dark, never overly gruesome. It just keeps you on your toes and keeps moving. It keeps moving. And, um, it's, uh, it's pretty fun. Like, I think I would probably lose interest in this story if it was any slower, because it definitely isn't anything with, like, thematic depth, and, and the characters aren't, like, super memorable. The main guy has a decent amount of, like, backstory that's doled out over the course of the manga that gets you to kind of understand, like, what he's about and why he cares so much about doing this, but... There's not necessarily a sense of like, oh, I love this guy. He's like the coolest dude in the world or the Ainu girl. She's, you know, kind of just the like standard sidekick support character. But, uh, you know, because the artwork is so good and the action is so fun and it moves so fast, it's, um, it's still exciting all the way through. I really did not expect to enjoy this as much as I did. I thought this would be perhaps more self-serious or more like just trying to be ultra badass, but what impressed me the most is the amount of, like, research that went into this. Like, this has tons and tons of historical details, and there's a frequent use of a narrator just to, like, explain what's going on to keep the pacing fast. Like, there's times where during an action scene, there'll just be, like, a paragraph explaining, like, why this thing happened so that we don't have to show it in extensive detail. Um... And sometimes it can be a little weird, but it does keep the flow going. Like, it keeps the manga insanely fast. And um, there's lots of little details about, like, what the, what Japan was like around the time that this was happening. Lots of details about the Russo-Japanese War. Lots of things about Hokkaido. Lots of stuff about the Ainu. Um, you know, it'll be, like, notation pages and stuff like that. In the back, there's, like, a whole breakdown of... Um, we're just, like, showing off what the uh, the girls' robe patterns are like, you know, just to just to make sure you get a full, a full scope of the details here, you know. And uh, all that's really nice. It makes this feel like a smart story. And uh, it, it really does have, like, lots of clever moments that I think, uh, here we go, like, explaining uh, all the stuff, all the gear that he's got on him and uh, just some facts about Japan and... Um, you know, what was going on at the time. So, yeah. This is a, a very clever thriller manga. And if you're into those kinds of thrillers, if you're into, like, action movies, like, stuff in the vein of, like, a James Bond kind of film, like, those just 
fast, fun, like moving from plot point to plot point types of action, you will definitely enjoy this manga. It, I, this isn't even really my genre, and I enjoyed it a lot. So I think if this was your genre, you would probably be like way, way into this. I could easily see this being someone's, you know, one of their favorite manga, um, even if it's not super duper memorable in the way that uh, you know some of the other darker seinen series are that people remember. But anyway, yeah. Go ahead and check that out. Again, if you if the cover excites you, you're you're in. Just go for it. <laughs> it's exactly what you think it's going to be. It's a manga where a guy fights a bear. So, yeah. Uh, and that's it. See you next week. We're we'll probably covering other manga. Hey, hi. It's Manga Mondays once again, nighttime edition with me, your host, Manga Mondays guy. The only manga review show that's recorded literally months in advance. It's it's February right now. I'm recording this in February. And I'm going to review the first two volumes of Immortal Hounds. This is a manga that I picked up just on like cover art. Like I saw cute girl with guns, tons of blood, flipped through it and just saw like general action shit going on. Lots of uh just bloody gruesome mess and I was like this is obviously for me this was made for me this is my kind of thing Immortal Hounds is a very straightforward fun action spectacle romp and the conceit of the story which is again this is totally just made for me is uh that it takes place in a world where everyone is immortal but the way that immortality works is that if you die you come back like healed so in this world in the very first pages we're introduced to the concept that like a character gets sick with a cold and so rather than waiting out the cold she will just have someone shoot her in the head killing her and then she'll come back fully well again like like in her in in the best natural state that your body could be in so people are constantly killing themselves as a way of healing themselves but there's a disease going around called rds which is that if you get this disease, you gain the ability to die. And the way that this disease spreads is through falling in love. It's not entirely clear what that means at first, and it's kind of implied that it's a sexually transmitted disease, though it becomes apparent that it's more of like a literally if you fall in love, uh, then you'll die or something. I don't know. It, it's, it's still pretty vague. This, this manga likes to keep a lot of things vague, seemingly as the author figures out what he wants to do with those things. But it can be interesting once those things come to light. So the, the story is just, it's, it's pretty batshit insane because the policy in this world is if someone has RDS, kill them immediately. And it's pretty easy to figure out because if you shoot someone and they end up dead, well, they were a dangerous, you know, they were a danger to society. They needed to die. If they tr come back to life, well, no harm done. So their policy is basically just, if you suspect someone of having it, shoot them immediately, ask questions later. So the police in this story are going around trying to murder anyone who has RDS. Whereas there's this organization, which the main girls, as depicted on the cover, well, depicted on this cover, this guy is the chief detective guy, uh, but they, the girls work for an organization that's trying to protect people with RDS to get them into, uh, like, just get them out of the fray of society and, and put them up somewhere. It's still kind of mysterious what the nature of that organization is. So it's mostly a, like, police, like a cops versus bad guys action spectacle romp. But the action is pretty intense because of the fact that you can freely have characters just, you know, tearing each other to shreds with bullet fire and then coming back to life. So it's it's pretty lighthearted. Like, it's it's an action piece. It's not like it's a comedy or anything. It has funny moments. Uh, but it's not dark, in spite of how insanely violent it is. It's all sort of tongue-in-cheek and fun. And, you know, characters get torn to shreds on a regular basis uh, just to come back to life. So, um... Yeah, it's a really fun read, and the art style really reminds me a lot of Gunslinger Girl. Like, I would not be at all surprised if the author of this was really influenced by Gunslinger Girl, um, because all the characters have this sort of blocky um, look to them, where, like, they... It's sort of like an odd mix of trying to be somewhat realistic, but also somewhat, like, anime and cutesy, but it loans itself really well. Like, these sort of 
almost geometric designs make it really easy to put them into action scenarios and to draw them from lots of different perspectives. And I think that's why they might have favored this kind of art style. Um, or, you know, it's just how the person draws. But it's very similar to the way that Gunslinger Girl looks. But um, our two main girls are these sort of gothy, dark circles under the eyes, which you know I'm all about, uh, girls who go around. And they wear these... uh, They have these little slips, these little slips of paper next to their face that, for whatever reason, like, emits a light that makes their face impossible to see. So, basically, we've got a almost Lupin the Third-esque situation here, where this girl's going around saving uh, RDS people, and this guy's trying to stop her. And it's just about their run-ins, and, like, you know, them, like, trying to out-tactics each other, out-maneuver one another, and, like... Um, and have all these plans, and by the end of this volume, the girl, who just happens to be undercover working for the the, the police organization, is given the task of trying to fall in love with this guy so that she can give him RDS. But both of them are completely void of personality people who, like, just are duty-driven and they just want to get their job done. So it's interesting to see the sort of... Ice, the, the glacial romance between the two of them, where the girl is just desperately trying to make him fall in love with her, but she has no like she she approaches this with a robot's understanding of love, whereas he approaches it with a uh, no interest whatsoever and just kind of going along with it out of curiosity to try to get information kind of stance. So they have a weird kind of hilarious romance that emerges, uh, especially in volume two. But mostly, this is just about action spectacle. And, like, at first, I thought that this story, the the concept makes no fucking sense. Because why would they have guns in a world where everyone's immortal? And, like, why would things have played out this way? But as the, the story goes on, that kind of becomes the point and the central mystery. Like, basically... It's starting to suggest as it goes along that the whole immortal society thing is actually not normal and seems to be some kind of controlled experiment, like an almost dystopia kind of thing, where the people with RDS seem to be existing in the the real world outside of this crazy, weird world where people are immortal, um, and the people inside that world don't really know what's going on. So there's a lot of, like, mystery hanging in the background here that's kind of interesting and does start to help justify the absolutely batshit insane narrative, um, like, volume one, I really thought this is just popcorn, it knows how stupid it is. It's, it's not trying to be anything deeper. And Volume 2, I mean, it's still not deep in, like, a thematic way or interest, or anything like that. But the story starts to get a little more interesting and to suggest that there's more going on. Now, I will say, this thing's fairly slow-paced. It hasn't made much progress in the greater overall narrative in these two volumes. It's mostly been, like, a background mystery kind of thing. While it sets up these kind of funny characters and scenarios, it's mostly about action and cool shit happening. There's a part in here where there's, like, a really extensive... Um, like, chase slash train uh, sequence where the girl, I believe in this page, yeah, she is, like, surfing on a machine gun while grappled onto a tank. Like, it's got that kind of shit. You know, it's just, like, crazy, batshit insane um, action sequences. And again, over-the-top violence, which is really entertaining because of the fact that it's not dark. This thing never gets... There's, there's never a moment where you feel, like, really bad, other than maybe the very first chapter, like, uh, like where there's actually, a, like, a character who legitimately dies um, in kind of a sad way, but most of it's like this. Like, she has these, these, like, these, like, whip pieces on her uniform thing that can just, like, tear people to shreds, but it doesn't matter, because they can come right back as soon as they get shot, and oftentimes... Their strategy for dealing with their enemies is to not kill them. It's to, like, cut off all their limbs and leave them there so that, like, they have to take the time to bleed out before they can die and get right back up and fight. Because if you just shoot somebody in the head, they're just going to come back and fight you a second later. So it does some interesting tactical stuff with the death mechanic that's really entertaining because of, you know, what it is. So if you are someone who's like me, who you really love lighthearted action stories and you really love violence and gore, but you don't like when it's dark, if you're a fan of stuff Stuff like the violence in Bacano or something like that, or uh, Gunslinger Girl again, which is darker than this, but it's the, it's a similar kind of tone. Um, this one's a little bit more silly and uh, it doesn't take itself as seriously. 
and doesn't have as much thematic weight to it, but it's still pretty entertaining. I enjoy it. I'll probably keep buying it. It's it's definitely popcorn entertainment, um, but I, I've been having a good time, so I'll probably keep reading it as long as uh, the volumes keep hitting the shelves. By the way, I keep forgetting to clarify this in every one of these videos. I almost d didn't do it again. Um, I turned off the clip. But the reason, like, I, I want to make it, make it clear that this series has been, like, manga that I buy and then read and then talk about on this show. Like, it's all stuff I just read. I'm just clarifying that because, um, some, I guess... I said in the first episode that these ma that these videos were all out of date, that I was talking about out of date manga, and some people seem to take that to mean I meant like older stuff. These are all new releases in the US, it's just that they are stuff that's already, you know, a lot of it's already been translated online, or you could easily read past volume one, whereas I'm like buying volume one at the store because it's the only one that's there, reading it and commenting on just that. Um, whereas you could go online and probably read these entire stories and be way ahead of me. That's what I mean by out of date. Um, and the fact that I'm recording these like months in advance at this point. But like, uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that. Everything that's on the show is something I've just read. So if I start covering older stuff, it'll be because I've gone back and read them or there's some stuff in this collection that I just haven't gotten to yet. So, um, yeah, uh, I don't know why I found that important to clarify, but I did, so there you go. Uh, and see you on the next episode. Hey everybody, welcome once again to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that may legitimately be having a negative impact on the life of its host by fueling an addictive negative habit. I recently stopped smoking cigarettes and stopped drinking caffeine, and I think that I may have traded those in for a shopping addiction. I can't stop buying manga. I just went out the other day and bought like seven or eight books, spent like $100 in one sitting, and one of the things I bought is a manga called There's a Demon Lord on the Floor. And I have no idea why I bought this, because I could tell from the cover that it was gonna be stupid. It looks like a dumb, generic comedy, and I flipped through it, and I thought, well, I mean, it looks like a dumb, generic comedy. But I think what sold me on it is that it looks really high energy. There's just lots of smiles and fun and, and, and ex you know, expressions. And I thought, well, this looks like a fun time. It's got like a little blonde lolly girl on it, which is, you know, my thing. So, so I bought it just on a whim amongst all this other shit I bought. And the thing about this, look, this is not a bad manga. There's nothing wrong with it, per se. It's just that it is the most thoroughly generic thing I've ever read. There is not a single image in this that I have not seen in a thousand other manga before. And what was incredibly frustrating to me as I read this is that I feel like there's one other manga that's exactly the same thing as this, or one anime, because it feels very anime, the way the, the pacing and everything of images is. Like, this feels like every comedy anime I've ever seen. But I, c I couldn't shake the feeling that there's one that's exactly the same as this, but I can't figure out what it is, because it also reminds me of everything else. I mean, first of all, the setting is literally the same setting as working. It's another family restaurant... Uh, based show where, you know, everyone works at this restaurant. But it's also the exact same premise as Hataraki Mao-sama because this girl is the demon lord, the generic demon lord who is a, a character in literally everything now. Uh, there's been so many interpretations of the demon lord, it's fucking ridiculous. Um, and she, because the demons lost the battle against, who did they, was it to humans, I guess? Uh, the earth was ruled by demons, and then the clan of light, uh, took the surface from the demons. So, in light of the demons having lost the war, for whatever reason, the demon lord is living under the floor of this family restaurant, and so she gets a job there. She's just a, she's just an airhead lolly. She's just a really high-energy airhead lolly. The fact that she's the demon lord is virtually inconsequential. The main thing, the only real thing that matters about it is that when she has a full belly, she transforms into a sexy adult form. Let me find it. Uh, here we go. Yeah, she transforms into full demon lord mode. 
uh, when she is full. And then when she gets hungry, she transforms back into a lolly. She also summons this familiar who's like a mushroom girl. She can also grow big and has giant tits when she grows big, but ordinarily she's just a little mushroom girl who literally has no personality. She's just like a background character who just is, she's just there. She just gets summoned at the start and is just around. Um, <laughs> barely even speaks through most of the, the, the manga. So, yeah, I mean, it's Hataraku Mao-sama, it's working, it's also basically just like, um, uh, Yusha ni Naranakata, what was it, Yushibu? That's the short version, I'm not gonna try to remember the full name of that fucking show. Which is an alright show, uh, but th this is the same thing. And then it's also the same as, like, it's got a little bit of Monster Musume, the style of humor is probably closer to Monster Musume and like the the way that it's written and paced, maybe a little bit of Two Love Rue or something like that. Like it's it's just along the lines of all of those. Like it's basically the same thing as all of them at once. And it's so baffling because it's like again, there's not a single image in this whole manga that I haven't seen before. Every single thing, every joke, every Every expression, every page turn is all familiar to me. And it's so bizarre because, again, it's not badly done. Like, it's not generic by way of, like, like being incompetent. It's really competent. All of it's... The girls are cute. The artwork looks good. The pacing is, of panels is really good. The jokes all land. It's just that none of them are original. Not a single one. There is no moment in here I haven't seen at least five times in the past. It's surreal. It was like breaking my mind to fucking read this and have this realization. So if you've seen a lot of comedy anime, you do not have to read this. You've read it. You have read this. Like, regardless of what skin it has on it. Um, and if you really love that genre, those kinds of high energy, fun little comedy shows, then th this is a passable inclusion. I'm sure this will get adapted to anime one day. It'll feel exactly the same as the manga. It'll be a one-to-one -one translation because it already feels like anime, um, in the way that it's paced and everything. It's got some cute girls. It's got some fan service. It's completely vapid. Like... Of the main characters, there's the demon lord whose thing is just that she's high energy. She's just a high energy lolly. Uh, she eats and she grows big and she's powerful. The mushroom girl, literally nothing. No personality. Um, there's, there's like the, there's the main character guy who I can't even really say he's the main character. He just is the guy who is just there to be the straight man to everything else that's happening. There is nothing else to him. He has no personality. He's just a straight man. And it's weird because there's so little focus on him that like you could forget he exists entirely. Like he's just there so that when someone does something dumb, he can react to it and be like, like, just be, oh, I gotta put up with this. Like, that's his whole personality is, is a facepalm, you know? Like, that's all he does is facepalm. There's, there's the other girl who works at the restaurant with him, the other normal girl who works there before all these weirdos show up. And she's like, short girl with really big tits, kind of like a, a poplar. But like, her personality is kind of confusing because she's just kind of, like, she gets excited about stuff really easily, like, almost sexually. Like, she gets, like, aroused easily is what it seems like her deal is. But she doesn't really have any set personality. She's just kind of there. Almost everyone in this is really high energy in Genki. Like, there is no, um... Like, even the girl whose thing is that she's shy, she's, like, a knight who works for the Demon Lord and, like... She's shy about being seen outside of armor, but, like, her personality is still really high energy and, and kind of hyper. And then at the very end, they introduce a Shrine Maiden character who's also high, high energy and hyper. Like, that's just everyone. This whole thing is just, like, constantly blaring on full blast at all times. So I guess that's... Uh, it, it, it's almost endearing because of that, that there is no, like, boring character. They're all, like, just... Like other than the the guy, they're all just like blaring it on a uh, on a hundred percent. They're all fucking loud, insane people jumping around, hugging, being being crazy, getting all over everything. But like, aside from that, 
the, none of I mean there's some there's some cute expressions. Look at that face. But it's just so redundant. It's so it's so <laughs> it's it's hurt it hurts me. It hurts to read it. Just looking at it and having that weird feeling of like I can't I can't say it's bad. There's nothing like like if this was the first one of these you'd ever read, if you've never read this kind of comedy before, it might be really endearing. Like you might actually enjoy the the like it's again, it's well paced, the jokes land. They're just all generic. So yeah. I can't recommend this to anyone who's ever read a comedy manga before or or read a lot of these. Like if if what I've shown you looks like cute and looks like your kind of thing, I mean, if you're the kind of person who would enjoy this, you can probably tell by the images alone. Like, you can just look at this and you can tell if this is your kind of thing. If you look at this and you think, hmm, that looks cute, but I feel like I've seen a lot of stuff like it and I, I think I know what to expect, you are correct. This is exactly what you think it's going to be. It's exactly what I thought it was going to be when I looked at the cover and when I flipped through a few pages and I thought, well, it's high energy. I'll give it a shot. And I read it and I was like, oh, yeah, it's it's what I expected. There's nothing new here. Um, so, yeah, a belated recommendation to the few people who have somehow not already read this or aren't sick of it yet. Personally, I'm just a little too sick of it. I, I definitely would not buy another volume of this, um, even though I don't think it's bad. Is that girl supposed to be white-haired? I never realized. Uh, yeah. Alright. Hey everybody, welcome once again to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show where I look and sound like shit because I'm sick. Um, I'm gonna be talking about, this time, a manga called Spirits and Cat Ears. Now I bought this for exactly one reason. This girl on the cover is cute as shit. Um, and I flipped through to confirm that she would be cute. I mean, look, like page one, I'm just completely in love, right? This girl is tiny, skinny, huge tits, white hair. She's got this, uh, sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? Lilting expression, I guess. She's got the, the sort of downturned eyes. Look at her. Look at her. She's so fucking cute. It's like more than I can handle. So I bought this just on the strength. There's some fan service. Here we go. Some uh, some fan service. Because I looked at this. When I looked at the cover, I saw this incredibly cute girl. But I also saw this pretty boy. So my first thought is, this looks like it's going to be some kind of shoujo manga. Like, you know, there's pretty boys in it. So am I going to get as much cute girl as I want? Uh, you know, is this going to be more of a romance thing or more of a... Like, what is it going to be? But as I flipped through, I just kept seeing more and more of this cute fucking girl. And I thought, well, that's more than enough cute girl for me. And the fact that there's plenty of fan service, you know, means it's definitely uh, intended. God, look at her. Just fucking look at her. She's perfect. I could do this all day. I could just keep flipping to random pages. Like, almost every single drawing of her in this manga is just perfect. I even love, look, look at her hairstyle. She's got like a borderline, um, uh, what's it called? Princess braid. Like she's got one of the, the on the bottom ones. I absolutely love that. I think it's called a tuck actually. Tuck braid. Um, it's one of my favorites. So yeah, uh, that's why I bought this. Now, as for what this is, this is belongs to a sort of sort of a genre I would consider it of um seinen manga that looks and feels like shoujo manga sort of similarly to something like um Inari Kon Kon Koi Iroha uh or even and this is a shonen one but uh what's it called uh Guguri Kokuri San like these manga that are aimed at guys, but they have the attitude of stuff that's aimed at women, or, or they just look a little bit like shoujo, or feel like shoujo, this is drawn by a woman, which probably has something to do with it, uh, but it, the, the basic concept is that this girl grew up, uh, she, she has cat ears, because she's got a curse, 
And uh, because she grew up with cat ears, she was bullied as a kid, and so she retreated from the world and has been living as a hikikomori alone for a long time. But she also has spiritual powers, I guess, as a result of the cat ears. So she, in her loneliness, summoned a familiar, which is this guy, and he's been looking after her ever since. And then at the start of the story, she, I guess, finds an ad for this inn or like a shrine or something that they're they're trying to look for a priestess. So she decides to take up this job as a priestess to try to meet other people and and uh you know, do something with her life. So she goes to this place and there's a bunch of other people, basically a bunch of other cute girls who also have familiars who are all training to be priestesses. Honestly, the plot not that important in this. Like there's I mean there's plenty of dialogue about the plot. There's lots of little rules and explanations and stuff, but, like, the the thing about this is each chapter is really long, and they're very meandering. Like, it doesn't really get to the point quickly. Most of it is just about these characters kind of hanging out and exploring the relationship between these two, which is very obviously all the author really cares about, um, because this guy is the familiar, and he's just sort of a deadpan guy who just really likes tying this girl up in chains. He manipulates chains. He likes to chain up his master and sort of uh, tease her. She's very easily teased. Um, and I I gotta say, I mean, I appreciate the man's taste. Uh, and he's in love with her. He admits that in the first chapter, sort of out of nowhere. Um, and she's maybe developing feelings for him you know this thing's mostly just kind of cutesy fun interactions it doesn't really worry about drama or melodrama at all it's mostly just kind of like a cutesy fan servicey uh romp um there's a bunch of other girls oh, there's this girl who uh who at first is a soon and she becomes dere towards main girl i happen to show them in the bath together uh, <clears throat> and she's, like, become super attached to her. Honestly, who even cares? Like, literally, who cares? The plot in this is meaningless. It, this is a manga for looking at this cute girl. That is why this exists. To look at her and go, holy fuck, this girl is so fucking cute. Look at her. She's so, she's so fucking cute, it hurts. And, and there's, you know, there's other cute girls, but none of them are as cute as her. But they're, they're hanging out, they're doing shit, you know, being adorable. That's, that's the point. Honestly, I can't see myself buying another volume of this because the plot was not really going anywhere, nor do I expect it to go anywhere. Um, it's really obvious that the intentions of this are to draw these cute couples and to have them chain each other up. So... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, story-wise, it's boring, and I don't care, but I was able to, like, maintain interest the entire time on the strength of how cute the girl is, and, like, um, I, I, I think if this was adapted to anime, I would probably watch the whole thing, as long as the character designs look as good as they do in this book. This seems like the kind of show that would get, like... This is the kind of manga that would get a 12-episode anime adaptation that goes nowhere and has no conclusion, and everyone just kind of forgets about it eventually. That's the kind of thing this would be, you know, that I would give a, a strong 6 to a light 7, never think about it again. That's the kind of manga this is. So I'll probably never buy Volume 2, but I'm okay with having read this. I recommend it if you think this girl's as cute as I think she is. Uh, otherwise, there's no reason to read this. And that's it for this episode of Manga Mondays. Hello everybody and welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that is, in fact, back after a long period of hiatus. And I'm going to be telling you about the life-changing manga of Tidying Up, which I purchased specifically because it looked so non-manga and so different and intriguing and, um sounding like a self-help book that I had to pick it up. And it is, in fact, based on a self-help book. This is a manga adaptation of the book The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up by Marie Kondo, um, who is represented here and is one of the main characters of this book. She literally looks exactly like her manga-ization. Hold on, I think there's a picture of her. Yeah, like, she is this character. So, 
This basically takes the self-help book that teaches you how to tidy up your house and creates a story out of it where uh, Marie Kondo um, comes to this woman's house who is basically this woman who is extremely messy. Her house is a fucking sty. And um, she hires a consultant, a tidying consultant, Maria Kondo, to come help her to clean her house. And over the course of the story, she teaches her the KonMari method of cleaning, and uh, she cleans her fucking house. There's a bit of a subplot where her next door neighbor is this handsome guy who um, she's like kind of probably falling for because she's someone who's like uh, falls in love very easily and like a lot of the clutter in her house comes from past relationships and stuff like that and um so basically when he first sees her apartment at the start of the manga he's like disgusted with it but as they keep running into each other over the course of the story they start to you know become a little closer and she her as her house gets cleaner he's impressed you know, so there's like a little romance subplot, but mostly it's about teaching you how to clean your fucking house. Now, in spite of what you might expect from me, my place is relatively tidy. My room was... My room could go this way or that way, uh, but for me, the biggest problem with tidying up, for me, is that I have too much space. I am somebody who has so much space that I just go, well, I can have an infinite number of things because I have space for it all. Like, to me, a tidy space just means, hey, as long as I can work comfortably and walk around comfortably and do that stuff, then it's all good. I am not in a situation like this girl who literally, she can't, like, you know, she can't do her makeup right, she can't really cook in her kitchen because it's too messy, she can't really move around, it's uncomfortable, she's always sitting on stuff that's laying around and shit like that. I do a good job of making sure that doesn't happen, but this manga made me realize that I should be doing a lot more. And, um, basically the, the guiding principle behind the, uh, Marie Kondo, uh, method is to only keep things that spark joy. If you look at something and it sparks joy with you, you keep it. If it doesn't, you get rid of it. And you go through things in order, starting with, like, your clothes, your, um, uh, what was the second thing? It was like clothes and then something else and then papers and then everything else is the other category and you go through that. And a big part of the method is gathering everything into one place, everything of one item into one place and then sorting through it, which is something I already do. So like a lot of this is stuff I knew. This is stuff that I, uh, that I use myself in how I keep my house clean or my room clean and, um, you know, I, I've I've already been using a lot of these techniques, but the the most important thing that I learned from this book is um, this idea of don't keep things just because. They keep repeating that, like if you have a bunch of shit around that you have just because, then it's just taking up space. It's just weighing on your mind as opposed to being free from it and like you know everything in your house being something that's good that sparks joy. And that really got me thinking about the fact that, like, yeah, again, because I have so much space, I've held on to everything. I have tons and tons of shit. And I, I got lucky, because I just moved into a new house. So this is a very appropriate time to read this, you know, um, as, as a way of approaching my new place. Because I had just enough stuff that I filled a, a U-Haul trailer in my car with all my shit and drove it upstate, uh, or up, up, the, up the coast. And... I was lucky that I had just enough space for all of my shit, but immediately upon moving in here, I, you know, bought a whole bunch of new shit, collected more stuff. I just got this new couch, you know, had to leave my couch behind, um, and got a new one. So it got me thinking about the fact that like, when I move again, I'm going to have way more shit to take with me unless I cut down on my shit significantly. And yes, I can fit everything in here, but there's lots of stuff that when I was putting it on the shelf, it like it just makes me mad that I still have it. I just think, well, uh, I don't I've never read this book, I'm never going to read this book, but I've got space, so why not? And the thing is that the way I organize my shelves, look at this. Look at this bookshelf over here. Okay. Literally, the top shelf is all of my favorite manga. 
any ones that I don't like hate or that I'm still reading are in the front. And then there's an entire layer in the back of just manga I don't care about. Ones that I'm hiding from view so that they won't be taken as representative as part of my collection because they're not manga I actually care about or read. Why do I have all these manga? And for a long time, I justified it as like, oh, well, it'll be part of my set. You know, I have, if I have a ton of anime, it looks cooler on camera. But like, I don't really frame my shots that way. I don't really frame myself around a collection that much. Half of it's hidden anyways, and it was in the previous room as well. And I keep having to buy new shelving units because I don't have enough space for all my crap. As you can see, there is a gigantic stack, three gigantic stacks of DVDs over there because of the fact that I didn't bring all of my shelves with me. And I shouldn't have had to have that many shelves in the first place because, like, over there, some of those are just empty boxes. Like, Gurren Lagann, um, Volume 1 had come with this box that contains the entire series. But Victor kept buying special edition uh, DVDs, so they would come with these other boxes that are just full of random crap. And But those boxes are now useless. But he got rid of them and gave them to me, and I've just kept them. I have a bunch of empty boxes that need to be thrown away. They have, they're have they not interesting. Like, every time I look at them, I just go, oh, I've still got this, you know. So, obviously, some things in my room bring me great joy. Like, elated Arab gentleman. He will stay forever. I will always have him. But there's plenty of shit that needs to go. And this manga definitely helped open my eyes to that. It made me reconsider what things I have, um, what things can go. I have a whole drawer of my dresser where it's like, there's the shirts drawer, the pants drawer, underwear and socks, and then there's a drawer of shirts I don't wear. And some of them are shirts that are like too small for me, but I like really like the shirt, so I'm always hoping that when I lose weight, I'll be able to fit that shirt. But other ones are ones I just have to have and I will never wear them. Why do I still have them? And granted, I even when we first moved in, I threw away a bunch of shirts or uh put them in a, you know, a a disposal pile. But there's a lot more I can get rid of. So yeah, I mean, the way that this manga is presented, the way that the method is presented is that it will literally change your life. That like it changes the way you think and what you can do in your house and like it'll completely change all your relationships and everything you do in life. Like, for this character, it completely changes her entire life. Um, I don't see anything that extreme happening for me, but I do think that if my room was less cluttered, it would give me more opportunities to organize things in a more interesting way. Right now, everything's literally just stacked because I have so much crap that, like, every time I go to organize it, like, for instance, I didn't even alphabetize these. I just threw everything in by size, um, but they're not even in alphabetical order because I have so much stuff that the thought of like every time I buy a new manga having to figure out where it goes is a pain in the ass. But that wouldn't be if I didn't have so much fucking manga or, uh, you know, so many DVDs I don't watch or will not watch. So, yeah, I think it would change my ability to like manage the space and make it interesting as a backdrop for videos. Um, there's also a lot of like kind of weird spiritual element to this where Mary Kondo is always talking about Marie Kondo is, is always saying things like you know like you're communicating with your clothes and like pass your energy to it kind of thing like there's a little bit of that uh I think most of it's kind of as a medicine to like wash this stuff down like a lot of it's just about the sentimental aspect and, like, um, you know, appreciating that the reason it's hard to get rid of this stuff is that there's a sentiment to it. And if you discard it with sentiment, like, not flippantly, but, like, thank it for its service and say, like, okay, I enjoyed you at a time, but you're gone now, you know, then you'll you'll feel better about getting rid of it, which is an interesting idea and um, it's kind of cool. Um... Yeah, overall, I really enjoyed this. I burned through it in less than a day. Um, it's paced well. It's got uh, handy guides. Like, for instance, there's an entire section on just the folding, because I think this is probably the most famous aspect of the original book, is the folding technique, um, where you stand everything up, and it not only saves space, but prevents wrinkles, and um, there's, like, pages of folding techniques for all the different uh, types of clothes you have. So, yeah. Um, I would definitely recommend this book to anyone who has a messy house at all. I would probably make all my friends read this just because, 
um, it does seem like this is an immediate way to just make your living space better. Like, immediately. You follow this method, and you'll be like, oh, like, I read this, and I went, oh, yeah, I can make my house way better, you know, just by doing these things. It's not even bad, but I can make it better, and why not make it better, you know? So, yeah, um, cool manga. Read left to right, incidentally, because uh, I'm guessing they were trying to market this outside of... I've never even heard of this company, 10 Speed Press, who released it. Um, I don't imagine they necessarily wanted it to be in the manga section, but that's where I found it. But, um, yeah, uh, it's read left to right, so you can give it to your fucking parents and they can read it too. And that's all. See you next week with more mangas. Hello everybody, welcome once again to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that will probably outlive all of the other weekly vlogs that I've been doing because it's by far the most fun to do and conceptually actually makes sense since I actually talk about stuff I just read on the show. Today I'm going to be talking about Black Clover. This is one of the newer manga running in Shonen Jump. I think it started in 2015? 20, yeah, 2015, and um, I would assume that it was sort of taking the place of either Naruto or Bleach, which was ending at the time, because, as you may be aware, um, aside from One Piece, most of the really big titans of Shonen Jump have come to an end in the last couple years. Bleach finally wrapped up, Naruto finally wrapped up, um, oh, what was the other big one? I know Toriko ended... Some other big stuff ended, so it's it's been a it's been a, a time of changes in Shonen Jump. Where now the biggest thing other than One Piece is like Haikyuu. Um but one of the new one of the new starters is Black Clover, which I think is the first of the like really new ones that's actually come stateside. Seems to be fairly popular, and I decided to give it a look just because I kind of wanted to see what the new generation of Shonen Jump is going to be. You know, I mean, I grew up with Naruto and Bleach. Those were some manga that I read when I was a fucking teenager. Um, you know, I was reading Naruto when I was 12. So the idea of, like, seeing what's it like now, what are they going to be aiming at kids my age today, and I will say, Black Clover is definitely a manga I would have enjoyed as a 12-year-old. Um, as an adult, I mostly see it as a kind of just an amalgamation of, like, Everything from Shonen Jump ever. This has definitely has no really new ideas, um, and and what's there, it's it's not it's not necessarily like done exceptionally well. I think it's a solid so Shonen du jour kind of thing. You know, there's a uh, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing exceptional about it. It's it's a uh, kind of fun, kind of funny. Has kind of okay action kind of a kind of okay artwork but there's just there's nothing particularly special about it so it's basically about this kid who um is naruto he's an orphan who lives in a a uh, a village that has a sort of hierarchical system at the top of which is a wizard king i think he's called the wizard king something like that and uh and he wants to become that one day so he he basically wants to be hokage just like naruto wanted to be that um you know also an orphaned kid who's kind of kind of bratty and untalented and everyone else thinks he's not going to make it anywhere but he goddamn believes in himself now personality wise though He's less like Naruto and more like the main character from Haikyuu. He's he's short and uh and you know he's physically very active and he's very determined and he practices all the time because in this this is a world where everybody can use magic except for the main character. So it's the world of My Hero Academia. So you've got the My Hero Academia situation where the main character has, you know, he doesn't have any superpowers, everybody else does, but like the main character from Haikyuu, in spite of the fact that he's so, um, you know, under underprivileged, I guess, he trains constantly. He's just completely confident he's going to be able to make it. You know, he has no questions about this idea. He's just always training physically to make up for his lack in magical ability. Now, he has this rival, who's this dark-haired sort of wonder kid who everybody loves and thinks is amazing. Um... So, a little bit of a Sasuke. He's less of a shit character than Sasuke is at the start of the story. But, um, but he's the, he's the rival who 
they both grew up in the same orphanage together, uh, but he's got really great magical powers. And so there's this big ceremony where when everybody turns 15, they get a grimoire that gives them powers. And, uh, or, or gives them magical spells they can use, I guess. And, uh, the, of course, this guy gets the Four Leaf Clover book, which is the ultimate. And he's got all the, the best magical powers in the world, and he'll probably become Wizard King. But then this kid gets a Five Leaf Clover, which is the, the anti-magic book. His thing is that he's, his magic is so lacking that he can cancel magic. So he gets this big-ass fucking sword, um, which is pretty, pretty good sword. I'd, I'd give it a, a strong sword to a light sword. You know, it's a fucking... It's a big... It's a big sword. Let me find a good picture of this big sword doing something cool. It's big and black. Um... I'm not finding a good picture. I would have thought it was a cool sword as a kid, you know? I wasn't necessarily into gigantic swords, but I do like the sort of stripped-down swords. I like swords that are just, like, simplistic but dynamic-looking, you know? Um, especially a black sword. That would have been pretty fucking cool when I was a kid. Sort of like, sort of like the swords in Claymore, but, but a little fatter. Not quite a guts sword, though. So anyways, yeah, this kid, he's super underpowered. Everyone, like, half the dialogue in the first half of this volume is just character saying, there's no way that kid from the boonies with no magic can do anything, and then he shows everybody up by doing amazing magic. Um, now, the one thing that I will say that, that was somewhat different was the one spark of creativity in this that I kind of like. Not that I've never seen this before, I just can't think of one off the top of my head from Shonen Jump. But the main thing that was interesting is that this guy looks up to this guy, and sort of vice versa. They Their rivalry is on the same grounds. They both want one another to... To they, they both want to be the Wizard King, but they also want one another to be their competition for it. So they're both equally enthusiastic about the other person's success and defensive of one another. You know, when, when either one of them is in trouble, the other one will come to help them. And, uh, you know, even though he's got all the magical ability, he still thinks that this kid has, you know, is, is his only real competition. So, like, that's, that's the one element of the, of the rivalry that I do think is cool. Unfortunately, whereas that rivalry is the strongest thing about this manga for the first half of the volume, it's kind of completely shelved in the second half, because the two of them become magical knights, and they go into different platoons, and we don't really see Rival Guy at all throughout the rest of the volume. So then the main character joins this platoon of magic knights who are, like, it's like the asshole team. It's like all the, like, rejects and weirdos. The scene where he goes to their, like, headquarters is almost, like, identical to the scene of uh, Soma from Shokugeki no Soma going to the, uh, like, meet his crew. Like, it's the same kind of thing, like a dorm full of wacky, crazy people who are all, uh, losing their shit, you know? Um... Though this one does not end up giving the characters the kind of strong characterization that happens in that early part of Soma, where, like, they all kind of bond and everything. That doesn't really happen here. The main character kid kind of bonds with this other gangster guy just because they're both strong, I guess. Um, whatever. Finally, they introduce this very cute um, girl who's, like, the girl. I, I don't know if she's a love interest, per se, but her thing is that she cannot control her magic. She has extremely powerful magic, but she can't control it. And so she finds a kind of kinship with the main character, um, you know, who can't use magic at all, because he thinks that her magic is super cool in spite of the fact that she can't control it. And also, she's a noble. Um, I kind of like her character from what they've shown so far. I like that she's... Uh, that she... She starts off, like, kind of seeming like a tsundere, like, she's, she's like, oh, I'm the proper, I'm, she, she, she reminds me of the main, the girl from Soma, from Shokugeki no Soma, and that she's, like, a very prim, proper lady, but unlike that girl, she actually, like, recognizes that this kid's cool and kind of seems to take to him quickly, um, though not romantically, it's not really clear where their relationship will go from there, because it just kind of jumps into the first action part after that, and the, the first villain is just, like, ridiculously overblown evil. And the whole scenario they get themselves into is really corny. It's just, like, they get called out to some village, uh, they go there, and this guy's about to murder all the villagers because, uh, they're, you know commoners are weak magic users, and he thought, uh, he's extremely strict with time, and he thought, mm, you know, the fact that these people exist might eventually cause me problems with timing in some way, so I'm gonna kill them. It was just, like, it's totally... 
random. I'll say that the the style of comedy of this and the overall tone and also the kinds of villains all feels very One Piece to me, but not as good. Like, it doesn't have the same energy that One Piece has, but it, it, it has that same kind of pacing to it of, like, uh, you know, somewhat serious dialogue, then joke, then, like, wacky over-the-top reactions and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's totally, I mean, this face, this is a totally One Piece face right here. So it definitely feels like One Piece was a big influence. It just, it really feels like every other Shonen Jump manga combined into one. Like, all the Jump manga of the last 12 years. Like, it, it feels like it's meant to replace Naruto. It feels like it take, took, takes elements from, you know, all the popular stuff right now. My Hero Academia, Haikyuu, and Shokugeki no Soma. And blends all that together into a, a story in a fantasy setting. And the funny thing about that is that, like... While the artwork, like, the main thing that makes this feel high fantasy is the sort of wispy line work. I guess you can't really tell that well on camera. But, like, you know, everything has that sort of, uh, that wispiness that's very, like, berserk-esque. But there's just not enough detail. Like, occasionally you'll get a big detailed shot, like this library shot. Or, um, there's one in the first chapter of, like, a big environment shot. Yeah, here. Like... This is, like, the most detailed and fantasy-esque image in the whole thing. But most of the time, there's not really much backgrounds. There's there's not a whole lot of background art. There's no real sense of place or setting. Um, like, you'll get a broad sense that they're, like, in a castle or something, but you never see where the characters are, like, in relationship to anything. They're just kind of around, you know? There's, there's very rarely a sense of the the environment or backgrounds or the world that this takes place in I, it just kind of seems like a generic fantasy with wizards kind of world uh I, I just i'm not entirely sure what what exactly the vibe is supposed to be of it because there's so little background art and just yeah i would say it doesn't have a lot of its own personality you know it it has shades of like one Piece, or even Rave Master, reminds me a little bit of, like, Hiromashima's style, but, like, there's nothing that makes this stand out as, like, this is the new go-to series. Even the artwork, I don't think, is really exceptional in the way that, like, the first time you see Naruto, it's like, whoa, that's a really different kind of style, you know? This, it has the wispiness going for it of the line work, but I, it just doesn't come off as, like, particularly unique to me. The only character design that actually struck me is the girl. Like, she actually, I thought, was a kind of cool design and uh, and is pretty distinct looking, whereas the main characters just look like, you know, shonen manga characters. I really hate the design of the guy whose face I showed and said it was a very One Piece face. Like, that guy is the leader of the... The squadron the main character joins, and I just think he looks ugly as hell. But yeah, um, so that's it. It's it's Shonen Jump du jour. You could read, you know, any of the stuff I, I named is better than this, at least in the first volume. And I mean, I flipped through volume two of this in the store just to see, like, if it would go anywhere. It didn't look like it would. It seemed like it, because the story doesn't really make any progress in this. Like, the two main characters, we know that they want to eventually be wizard kings, and they join the magic knights at the beginning, which seemed like that was going to be kind of an eventual goal. It's kind of like if, you know, in My Hero Academia, if the main character had got accepted into the academy in episode one, and they just let him go on hero missions immediately. You know, that's what this this feels like. It's like they just join the Magic Knights and they just are Magic Knights. And now they're on a mission and it's like, what is this? Like, what are we building towards? What are they hoping to get after this? You know, they're already in the Magic Knights. How do you make it to Wizard King? Where do you go from here? Like Naruto, you had this understanding that you, you become a Chunin at some point and then you move up through the ranks. And like, I just don't know where this is going at all. Um... So yeah, like, I mean, if you just want to read a shonen manga with action and stuff, go read My Hero Academia, you know, like, that's the better one running right now, unless you just want to see Big Fucking Sword, but you're probably not 12, so I don't know if that's enough to sell you. Anyway, that's it for this episode. Hey everybody, welcome to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that I'm doing right now. And today I'm going to be talking about a, a, a pretty great 
manga, in my opinion. It's called Fire Force. This is the new series by Atsushi Okubo, who previously did Soul Leader. Soul Leader was, for a considerable amount of time, one of my favorite manga series of all time. And I only say for a considerable amount of time because I caught up to the series when it had about 16 volumes out, um, which would be, I don't know, 2010 or so. And I was following it monthly for a little while, but the thing about Soul Eater is that it had just completed the big arachnophobia arc, which was fucking awesome. Everything up through that is, is really great, and the arachnophobia arc is su super fucking cool. And then after that, it kind of felt like it was going in a weird direction, and uh, over time, I mostly heard people saying that the later arcs were just not that good. This was about the same exact time that Soul Eater Not started, and I'd read the first chapter of that and didn't really care for it, didn't care for the anime adaptation either, so I just kind of felt like my reputation with Soul Eater was kind of souring, and I would wait till it was over, and of course it is over now, but I still haven't gone and caught up on it, and I've sat there looking at all the volumes in Barnes & Noble, all 25, and going, I should just buy this whole series. And I've had that moment several times, I should just buy this whole series, but I can't bring myself because I was like, what if, what if it's just gonna be a huge letdown? Or what if it's not as good as I remember, even in the part that I did love? And I gotta say, when Fire Force came out, I kept looking at it and thinking, can this possibly be as good as Soul Eater? Because one of the coolest things about Soul Eater is the fact that it has such uh, punk and hip-hop and styled artwork, that it's got this really crazy out-there world and aesthetic to it, where every character has their own way that they dress. Like, every character has their own fashion sense. Every, just everything in the story is so unique and distinctive. And with this series, I mean, right off the bat, it's a bunch of firefighters who are all wearing the same uniform, you know? And I'm sitting there thinking, well, this doesn't seem like it plays to Okubo's strengths. A manga about firefighting, which flipping through it, I just was like, I don't know, this doesn't look like an Atsushi Okubo book. Um, so is this, and, and you know, I, as far as I know, he's declined as a writer towards the end of Soul Eater and with the with Soul Eater not so I was worried about it but I finally picked it up and I was shocked by how much I love this manga and it's entirely because of how great Atsushi Okubo is as an artist because this is kind of deceptive to refer to as a firefighting manga. It's really a shonen action series, a weekly one at that, which is kind of amazing that this late into Okubo's career, he's moving up in speed. I believe Soul Eater was a monthly series, and so was not. I guess he was doing two monthly series at the same time, but now he's doing a weekly one um, with one of the biggest magazines. I believe it's... I don't remember the name. It's the one that's not Jump. <laughs> the second uh, the second most popular, I believe. Um, he names it in the back of the book. Let me see if I can find that. I don't care. So, this, yeah, this is an incredible action manga. And what it's really about, and I'm sure that Okubo came up with this concept because he wanted to draw cool fire effects. Um, this, is, this, this book is basically the phrase, fight fire with fire, made into a whole story. The concept of it is that there is this ep epidemic of spontaneous human combustion going on. And when someone spontaneously combusts, they turn into an infernal, which is like a monster where they, they sort of lose their consciousness. They have a little hint of their human memory left in them, but they just kind of go on a fiery rampage and just start burning people and things all over the place. And so there's a special fire force, which are the firefighters who wear blue bands around their belts. And they are people who can manipulate fire because they're sort of descended from infernals or something. It's kind of unclear. Uh, it seems that, like, there's, like, different generations of people related to these, uh, these monsters who can control fire. So the, uh, the second gen people of this, of this, uh, I don't remember what they call the, the race of people who, who can do this, but the second generations, they can manipulate fire, um, just like they can, you know, whatever fire is already there, they can move it and change it and do all kinds of interesting things with it, which, of course, 
because Okubo is a, you know, shonen action writer, he finds ways to give each character really unique ways of using their fire powers, especially as we get into volume two, where we have one guy who, uh, you know, fights with guns, but he controls the level of ignition in the gun so that the bullets, like, he can control how hard they are or how hard they hit. Like, so if he wants to just shoot one of his friends, he can because he can make the bullet softer or he can control their trajectories. All kinds of cool stuff like that, you know. So different level 2 people might have different uh, kinds of powers. Then there's the level 3 people, such as the main character guy here, who can actually generate fire. And so the main guy, his thing is that he has f he he has the devil's footprint, as they call it, where he kind of lights his feet on fire, and it operates kind of like jet boots. He can propulse himself really quickly, and um, and, it, and is a great fighter because of it. And he's uh, good with kicks and stuff like that. Whereas there's another third gen here who uh, he's obsessed with the concept of himself as a knight, and therefore he uses a plasma sword um, that he's generating. And that's another thing, each character's power is tied kind of into their personality. The main character guy's thing is that he wants to be a hero, and therefore he has a flying kick like Kamen Rider because that's the kind of hero he wants to be, whereas this guy wants to be a knight and ergo uses a sword. So, you know, what this really is is a shonen action series just with a pretty unique premise that it's about... Uh, you know, people spontaneously combusting and about how scary it is to die in fire. <laughs> Which, you know, this manga has some scary moments and it has a, you know, it has a, it has a dark tinge to it in that it's a world where people are dying in fiery infernos on a fairly regular basis. The main character is uh, a... He's, he's got this devil power, you know, he's, he's stronger than most, and therefore people kind of fear him, and additionally, that's also because he has a weird condition, not yet explained, but I suspect it may be eventually, where when he's nervous, he breaks out a really devilish grin. He's always smiling madly. Let me see if I can find a good picture instead of just trying to simulate it myself. Um, when he's, when he feels nerve, see, we're first introduced to it because... He knocks a girl over, um, and then he can't help but have this sick smile, but it's not intentional. He makes that when he's nervous, and therefore, people think he's some kind of monster because in bad situations, he's always smiling like a madman, such as the bad situation of when he was a kid, his mom and baby brother died in an inferno in his house, and everyone thinks it was his fault because he had devil powers, and he's too young to completely understand what happened himself, but he knows it wasn't his fault, and he wants to get answers, and so that's his main motivation. And he had promised his mom he'd become a hero, so he joined the fire force so he could become a hero, and you know, find the answers, uh, possibly that people in the Fire Force might have because they're the ones who, you know, showed up on the scene when he was, a, a, a kid at the time. So now he joins this crew, and that's all fine and good in itself. At first, this seems like it's mostly going to be a shonen story centered on the main character and his journey to get answers, and that's fine enough. It caught, carried me through the first volume because the artwork is so fucking good. And I don't just mean in terms of, like, the actual style. It's really, what, what this made me appreciate more than anything is just how good Okubo is at flow. Now, I've always thought that Soul Eater had the best fight scenes I've ever seen in manga. The fight scenes that happen during the Arachnophobia arc are fucking amazing because they, they, have, they, they have a sense of choreography about them. Like, you know, there's a good reason Studio Bones had to be the ones to adapt Soul Eater because Okubo is as good at drawing fight scenes as fucking they are at animating fight scenes. You know, he has that level of choreography and timing in his panels, and he is ruthlessly good at the page turn. There are so many instances in here where I turn a page and the next thing I see is something really fucking badass, and also of building tension. Here's a, a small example. So we've got, like, this woman appearing in the midst behind the main character, and then the, the guy yells, Shinra, you know, at the last second, and you've got that sense, and then, boosh, he gets hit, but he blocks it just in time. I realize it's hard to tell with, these, with this shitty camera. That's why I'm not showing too many images from this, but, like, 
if you read through this, it's really exciting as a page turner. And the chapters are so short because it's a weekly series that I would sit there getting to the end of a chapter while I'm taking a shit and just want to keep reading. I ended up burning through this damn thing way quicker than I would a normal book. I realized the pun only seconds after I said it. So... Yeah, this is a great entertaining read, and so much so that I actually went and bought Volume 2 before filming this. I had initially just got this one, and I thought, well, I want to be able to talk about where the story is going, and whether I think it holds up, and I already knew Volume 2 was out, and so many of the other manga I've talked about on this show had a new volume come out, like, immediately after I recorded the episode, meaning that it will have been months ago, and probably another volume's out by the time the video actually releases, so we might as well get up to date on Fire Force, and I gotta say, the story gets even more interesting in the second volume, because here we learn that the crew that he's joined, which is like Division 8 of the Fire Force, they're sort of the motley crew, of course. They're the one that's, you know, not fully established, they're pretty new, they're, uh, their members aren't, like, bad or anything. I mean, all of them have kind of weird personalities, but they're all really powerful, uh, you know, magic users or whatever, or they're good at what they do. It's simply that they're new and not well established, but the reason that they've been put together is because they're extremely trustworthy and good-natured captain, was assigned to basically become the internal affairs of the Fire Force because all of the other divisions are all kind of working in their own interest because some of them, one is owned by like a big business, one is run by the government, one's run by the church because the church plays a big role in this. Not the Christian church, though it's obviously modeled after it, but they, uh, they worship the sun god Amaterasu. By the way, this is kind of like a steampunk world like the world itself seems not dissimilar from ours but the way it's drawn is definitely not uh you know tokyo it's it's some kind of almost steampunky looking place that where they all like worship the sun and i think everything is solar powered that's the impression i've got they haven't really gone into depth about it but if you look at all the machinery it all seems to be solar powered so it is taking place in a unique setting because okubo is boundlessly imaginative and he could not just set something in our world the man is too good for that so you know these different factions that are controlling different parts of the Fire Force all have their own interests. And the ultimate purpose of the Fire Force is that they're supposed to be trying to figure out what is causing people to spontaneously combust, to solve the mystery of the Infernals, and, uh, you know, be able to move on, I guess, with their lives. But the uh, other people are not necessarily sharing information with one another because they have their own things to gain. So this group is trying to bust the other ones. And that's where it really starts to get interesting because we see not only our team kind of unify in one great purpose, but it becomes an us versus all the rest of the society that we're a part of because these guys are, of course, the kind-hearted do-gooders while everyone else has their own agenda. And we start meeting the other teams who are just full of assholes. Um, I mean, this very quickly starts to resemble Soul Eater as it goes. The attitudes of the characters, the attitudes of the villains, um, the first, like, major sort of, uh, well, I won't say major, the first, like, big minor villain that we get, um is a psycho killer who was formerly a part of the fire force who goes infernal but maintains a consciousness and this is like oh shit you know this, this might change the game um and the way he acts is just exactly like the psycho killers from soul eater so like you know okubo's f his style just seeps more and more into it as it goes along kind of unsurprisingly but i mean it's really the artwork that makes this shine. The fact that he's so fucking good at drawing action and having panels with punch and having moments where I turn the page and I'm like, fuck yes. I don't even want to spoil some of the best ones from this volume because there were moments that I legit like, you know, had that hair raising, fist pumping, yeah, shonen moment, you know. This is what I want from shonen manga. I want it to be badass and, you know, and to just, ooze technical mastery, not simply to regurgitate things I've seen in every other shonen manga. No one could imitate this because even though the story is not particularly unique, the way it's presented doesn't feel like any other shonen manga other than Soul Leader. Okubo just has that much of a distinctive voice in the way that he writes characters. Now, not all of it is sunshine and rainbows. There are some 
questionable things, like how the female characters have very little personality and have lots of fan service. Um, there's one girl who shows up towards the end of Volume 1 who's a part of one of the other teams, and her, like, th her gimmick is that she has, like, some kind of almost curse that she gets into accidental pervert scenarios a lot. Like, that she, lots of accidental gropings happen to her, but, like, to such a ridiculous extent that it's funny, except that it's also totally out of left field, and there's nothing else to her character, really. So it's... It, and she just shows up out of nowhere and just has these jokes. So it's a little weird, um... The way the manga treats its uh, women, although, I mean, w at least one of them is a cool badass chick, but she doesn't really get to do much other than to be a cool badass chick. Um, but, like, I don't know. It's a little odd when you're flipping through what is otherwise a very well-realized action series, and then suddenly it just breaks for a bunch of fan service jokes that feel totally out of left field. I know it will bother some people. I know it won't bother other people. I'm just letting you know it's in there. If you like shonen action and you particularly want to see great fight scenes and great artistry and a unique voice, I definitely recommend Fire Force. If you loved Soul Eater, you will probably enjoy this. It doesn't have quite the same level of Mad Pimp style, but man, and the fire effects look fucking great. And he's still doing the thing where elements have faces. And where sometimes an explosion turns into a giant skull. If I can find that, I'll show it to you. Because I fucking love that. Yeah, here we go. Stuff like that. <laughs> which I just love. So, yeah. Check it out. It's good. I like it. And I will definitely be collecting the rest of these as they come out. Which should be frequently. Because, again, it's a weekly series. See you in the next one. Hello everybody and welcome to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that has completely exhausted its back catalog and is now being hastily filmed on a beautiful summer day in the north of America. I just read My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness, which was a, I believe originally a web comic, um, well at least parts of it are, um, were originally published online. And it grew really popular there. This was translated into English by fans just a couple months ago, and I was hearing a lot about it. Um, and then Seven Seas went and published it. Seven Seas, man. They've been doing lots of really interesting stuff lately. They've had lots of releases that I haven't been super happy with because of stuff like the Yuri manga they published that has too many bolded words in it that I complained about in previous videos, or stuff that's just releasing extremely slowly. Then they've been doing other releases that are totally excellent, like the Galco one, and this one, which looks fantastic, has really just like nice, thick, beautiful pages um, that really let the pink in the uh, artwork pop off and everything. It looks great and feels great. Um, I got to read this because a friend let me borrow it and uh, yeah I haven't actually bought this myself but I am I'm, I'm tempted to because it's pretty good. Um, this story is an autobiographical story about a 28, 28 year old woman who has just basically never had sex, has as, it, as they put it no confidence, no direction and never had sex. And um, it's about her basically trying to get her life together. So the way this flows is essentially it starts from when she graduates high school and tells the story of her crippling depression from then through the next 10 years and how she starts to get out of it via her experience at a love hotel and how like she kind of realizes that all of the things that are wrong in her life are based around like this inability to like herself, to love herself, to try to do right by herself, and how she had spent so long ignoring sex and anything sexual because it conflicted with the image of the person she was trying to be, which is someone who would appease her parents, that um, she had just not even given any thought to it. So this, the, the first, like, bulk of this, really all of this, is just a, like, recounting of the mental state of this girl over 10 years of her life and it's presented in a very quick and snappy and funny kind of way where like even though like most of what's being said is incredibly depressing it's her just describing you know cut it like 
uh, her first time in bed, she's thinking about how she's got a bald spot on her head because she plucked her hairs out too much um, from anxiety, how she's got cuts all up and down her wrists from cutting herself. Um, she details her eating disorders, which went both ways. She was emaciated for a while, then became a binge eater, and like <clears throat> just detailing all these different incredibly dark things that happened to her over the course of the 10 years after leaving high school. But it's all presented in like a snappy kind of fun way. Um, it reminds me a bit of Watamote in the way that it draws like her frazzled, disheveled appearance, but less um, cruel to herself than Watamote is, whereas that manga really presents her as like a terrible person. This girl is just hurting badly, but um, you know, there's an element of I don't know, uh, it, it's very sincere, and obviously it's about herself, so, um, you know, she, it, it, it's, it's almost, I wouldn't say a fun read, because it is heavy, and it can be difficult, and I think that it's stuff that almost everybody's gonna relate to, especially if you're the, if you're the kind of person who sees this cover and thinks, I want to read that, you'll probably relate to a lot of this story, because there's a good chance you've grappled with some form of depression or loneliness or just a, a state of being of not completely understanding yourself, not being able to come to terms with yourself, you might still be in those places. And I'll tell you that like, what I was concerned about when I first uh, started reading this book was that it was so heavy on just like basically someone detailing their mental problems that I was like this is just sad and I don't want to read this that was my first impression when I uh, read the first chapter online because like um, it reminds me of reading like tumblr comics where a lot of tumblr comics will just be like a person describing like how shit things are for them and uh, and and then crying about it essentially and this manga it definitely uses the artwork to avoid the feeling of wallowing. It uses lots of these very cute and fun facial expressions. Something landed in my hair. Um, lots of like, uh, just just highly expressive artwork that and, and these fun little diagrams where she'll be trying to explain like how the mental process works of why she's convincing herself that she's depressed or how she's convincing herself to like eat too much and she'll draw a fun little diagram of it that's, um, let me find a good uh, example of that as I continue talking. Um, or just stuff like this, like she comes to her mom like holding stable uh, like job and stable life and like here mom look I did it and then you know uh, faces rejection because she doesn't have a a, uh, a uh, full-time income and like there's just lots of fun stuff like that that really conveys the exact emotions and everything of uh, you know how these things are making her feel which is funny because the main thrust of her problems in this manga is an inability to communicate that she has difficulty like explaining herself to people or just talking to people at all even though the artwork in this is extremely uh, communicative like she is ex like highly capable of explaining herself if she has time and you know puts it into the right context which is of artistry and um, that's probably one of the most relatable parts of this to me as someone who in fact there's a part in here where she talks about how the um, like once her manga made it online like she like this volume is compiled like she had already written the story of her going to the um, going to uh, a, uh, a lesbian escort service and posted it online and so when she's talking to publishers about like fleshing out that story and making a full volume out of it she talks about how it was easier to talk to those people because they had already read her story and so she knows that they know something about her like there, there's this deeper understanding and therefore it's easier to communicate with those people and that was the most relatable aspect of this whole book for me as someone who posts stuff online which is that like you know offline I still have a lot of difficulty interacting with people in like the day-to-day -day. like if I'm just out somewhere and someone walks up to me and asks me a question I have a real difficult time like finding what I'm supposed to connect with that person about like how am I supposed to open a conversation with the with a person who knows nothing about me whereas anybody who's seen any of my videos it's like a snap easy in because I know they've seen me 
like they've seen my real self already. You know, they know more than just what is pre on like on display by looking at me. They know of uh, a deeper, more intimate side, and therefore it's easier to just like go, yeah, okay, you already basically know me. Let's roll from there. You know, especially if you've seen a lot of my videos, then I don't even have to like you know, the first thing I say to you, I can already be on a, a higher level of conversation because I know you've, you've heard me talk about basically everything going on with me. So, you know, I totally got that. And um, a lot of the sexual stuff in here I totally get as well, like how she thinks about sexuality and stuff. There's a, a long part about how basically she has this, like, um, fetishization of her own mother in a way like that she like just wants to hug her or something or just like wants someone who basically is her mom to hug her like that's her ideal mate is like and she she at one point reads that men just want um a mom who they can have sex with and she like relates to that super hard and i thought that was funny because i've also read that statement and i've also related to it hard because i also just kind of look for women who remind me of my mom in some way or just like uh you know i've always wanted a girlfriend who's just someone motherly like someone who i can rest my head on at night you know and like that's essentially what she's also looking for so that was extremely relatable for me and i mean like if you've ever like you might not have dealt with the specific things that she deals with in this but if you've dealt with any kind of depression you will probably relate to like you'll be able to understand this story especially if you've known people with these problems like the eating disorders and the cutting and she explains that like why they happen really well like the reason that she would cause herself physical pain is that it's easy to understand physical pain you know why it happened like what caused it like whereas you, with your mental pain you can't really grasp it because you don't know why you're feeling that way like you can't figure out what's causing me to be sad um, like what's causing this to hurt but if you hurt yourself you know exactly why you're in pain so yeah I thought that was really interesting and um, overall I just uh, I thought it was a cool story it 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 is it's very like just descriptive it's just kind of going through her life and it, describing exactly like the things that happen to her so it doesn't have like um, particularly memorable like characters and narrative to it. In fact, the the arc of the story is just basically about getting through the depression. And even then, like while she realizes lots of things about herself, the reason she realizes those things has a lot to do with luck and just like happening to take that course in life. Like her manga gets popular on the internet, and that helps her to like recognize things that she should change about herself and like how like just putting on a different kind of performance from the one she has been will change her mindset so you know this, this has uh, essentially a happy ending and I think that for some people this manga might help them to deal with like their own depression and stuff but it, in a lot of ways it might not because uh, you know you have to have these realizations as well and just hearing someone else explain it probably won't do that for you like I feel like um, <clears throat> lots of people have read self-help books or they've read other people's stories and that you know doesn't give them the push to get through it <clears throat> but I think the most important message that this manga has is simply the fact that throughout the early part of it the main character the 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 author um, Nagata Kabi um, she doesn't understand that she could stop feeling the way she feels like she just thinks that she is doomed to feel that way like I'm broken and there's nothing I can do I am just like I'm just fundamentally different from everybody else um, and it's just kind of based in ignorance it's based in not knowing the things that she could change not knowing the ability to change exists fucking train only manga review show with a constant threat of train noise and I think that's true of a lot of people. I think a lot of people who are depressed don't know that there is a way... Mother fucking trains. Fuck you. Fuck you, train. A lot of people who are depressed don't know that they can get out of it. They think that it's just them, you know, that, like, that, that they are just fundamentally broken and um, they haven't found the way out, but that, 
you know, it's possible you're just thinking about things wrong, or that, like, there is some way that if you changed your mind, you'd be able to find a, a solution, and that's what happens to her essentially in here, is, like, this eventual realization that, wait, I am not just, like, I'm not just this way because I'm different from everybody else. I'm just doing something wrong. I'm just thinking of something wrong, or I haven't put the pieces together yet, and once I do, I can start, you know, towards a more normal life, or at least happiness, and, like, contentedness, and understanding myself, and maybe being able to eventually have an enjoyable sexual encounter, which the book ends with her... Uh, as a bonus chapter for the published version going back to an escort service and still not exactly having a complete experience with it but being hopeful that next time maybe it'll work so um, yeah I recommend this book it's a good time um, it's not as depressing in the end as it seems like it is at first and uh, maybe it'll help you come to terms with some things going on in your own life uh, personally I am you know, as far as my life goes, I'm more towards not only the end of the story, but perhaps a few chapters past it in terms of getting my life together and getting out of a, out of any kind of depression like this. So, you know, um, for me, this feels like reminiscent of things I've experienced more so than like currently how I'm feeling. But you might find yourself at any stage throughout this book. And if you find yourself in the early stages, I certainly hope you make it to the later ones. Um, and that's all for this week. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Hello everybody, welcome once again to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that remembered to turn on the microphone this week. Today I'm going to be talking about The Girl from the Other Side. This is a new series that Seven Seas is publishing that I picked up pretty much on the strength of this cover and the overall aesthetic alone. I saw this sort of dark, gothy looking monster with this adorable little girl, flipped through, saw some, uh, some pretty nice looking artwork, and I thought, yeah, I'll give it a shot. And granted, when I opened this thing, I, I kind of knew exactly what I was in for, and I knew exactly how this would disappoint me. <laughs> like, I knew, I knew that I wasn't going to be hugely in love with this, but that, uh, that, that, uh, that it would fulfill the same niche as a bunch of other things I've seen, which is to say, uh, these, there's a lot of these stories that are sort of these beautifully drawn, very slow paced, tonal, uh, art pieces that, uh, that feature some kind of combining of the dark and gothic feel with the cutesy and fun feel, like a mixture of slice of life and this overall foreboding that's happening in the distance somewhere. To compare it to a show that most people have probably seen, I would say like Over the Garden Wall, though that show is a lot more comedy focused than something like this. Like that feeling of this is like a cutesy sort of uh, kids on an adventure, but drawn with this very rustic, art style and with this sense of something darker happening in the background. Though when I picked this up, the first thing it made me think of was Shoulder a Coffin Kuro. Uh, I guess I'll do a different video about that sometime. And um, and a little bit of The Ancient Magus's Bride, which I haven't really read, but the fact that the it's a gigantic goat-headed uh, like, <laughs> uh, magic man with a tiny girl. I mean, granted, the girl in uh, Ancient Magus's Bride is not that small, but... So basically, this is a, yeah, it's sort of a supernatural mystery in a fantasy setting where there's, we're, we're, we're introduced to this little girl who's with this, uh, with this big, uh, scary man and they're out in the forest and, uh, he's just kind of taking care of her. They're living together and, um, for whatever reason, she cannot touch him because he's suffering some kind of curse, which trans, which, uh, is tr transmitted by, via touch. And, um, they're, they're, they're out in a shack in the middle of the woods, uh, and, and it seems like everyone in all the towns and everything nearby is, is dead or gone. And meanwhile, there is, we, we learn eventually of a mythos that there's this sort of city, a walled off city. There's, there's people who live in, inside the walls and outside the walls, and the outsiders are 
these the cursed people and so um you know the people inside the wall are kind of trying to keep them away uh though we don't understand much about the curse or anything i'm trying to describe the plot but it's difficult because so much of it is intentionally mysterious which is kind of what i again like when i pick up something like this i'm expecting a very slow moving plot that ekes out little bits of information as it goes and, uh, and, you know, and tries to, to, to sort of swallow you slowly in this darker tone. Um, but I will say that this moves a little bit faster than I was expecting, in that each chapter kind of ends with a cliffhanger. There's usually some kind of, like, dramatic reveal towards the back end. Uh, some plot events do happen in Volume 1, and it feels like it might be going somewhere by the end. Um, so... Yeah, it's it's almost odd to to read something that's that for the most part is kind of slow meandering slice of life, but that always ends on some kind of dramatic cliffhanger. So it definitely has that that a little bit of spice to it compared to a lot of stories of this nature. But in a way that also kind of weakens it because it's not that strong of a tone piece, I think. I mean, it kind of is what it is. If you're the kind of person who you look at this and it seems like something you'd enjoy, you want to see, like, uh, a stoic man who, who who's trying to just take care of this little girl and he's not entirely sure how to go about it, especially because he can't touch her. She's just a bright, cheery little girl who's uh, who's just perfectly, perfectly adorable and happy and, uh, you know, she's... She's a kid. She, she Most of her mistakes are out of the fact that she's a child. And she does make some mistakes. Uh, but, you know, it's whatever. I feel like you can tell what this is going to be just by looking at it. Like, you, you could probably take a glance at this. And if you're the kind of person who would see this art and go, I have to read that, then you should. Uh, but if you're like me and you take a look at this and you think, well... I know this is going to be disappointing, but I'm going to buy it anyways. Uh, then maybe don't, because it's it's exactly what you're thinking it's going to be. Um, I mean, I can't say I'd pay for another volume of this. Like, I could, I'm kind of curious about where it's going to go, but like, I don't care that much about the characters. Like, I've seen this kind of relationship done before. I've seen this kind of setting done before. You know, I've seen this dark toned. Uh, fairy tale kind of thing, which of course, you know, the book goes with, oh, once upon a time, oh, it's a dark fairy tale, and I'm like, yeah, what, I, I guess it's not even really a dark fairy tale, it's just a fairy tale, but like, um, you know, a classically styled one, but like, nothing about it stands out to me so much, I mean, the artwork is really good, but it's not like, you know, so good that it's worth the price of admission alone, which incidentally is $13 for uh, a pretty short book, you know, pretty small and um, quick read, not a whole lot of dialogue in it. So, yeah, I guess I don't, I, I only recommend this to someone who, who would look at it and immediately know it was going to be your thing. Otherwise, eh, forget about it. That's it for this episode. I'll pick up in the next one. I've, I keep you. You may notice that my uh, manga stash just keeps growing as these episodes go by. So, <laughs> you know, I've got plenty more uh, where this came from. Welcome back to Manga Mondays, the show where you can sometimes see what the next manga is going to be on the shelf behind me or the previous one. Who knows? This week we're doing Disappearance Diary by Hideo Azuma. Another one that I picked up at Hammer Girl because I saw it and had never seen it before, had no idea what it was, and it looked totally different and interesting. Very old school art style on the front, and then the quote on the back was what really got my attention. It says... This manga has a positive outlook on life, and so it has been made with as much realism removed as possible, which really cracked me up. And uh, then I saw that it was a grand prize winner at the 9th Japan Media Arts Festival in 2005, despite the super old school artwork, which, I mean, it is a very old school style manga, very, um, you know, the, the panels are all very geometric and clean, the artwork looks like it was drawn way the hell long ago and that's because this guy Hideo Azuma was big in the 70s and early 80s he was he's a very old school manga creator who mostly did gag manga and he tells a kind of like condensed story of his history as a manga artist in this volume because it's sort of a a memoir of certain parts of his life 
Now, this manga, I don't know, I almost don't know where to start with this, because it's very weird. This is one of the weirdest manga I've ever read. Not in terms of, like, weird shit happening, but just, like, what it is. Because this man, Hideo Azuma, in the 90s, just kind of lost his mind. Basically, throughout his youth, he took on way too many projects. He would do, like, ten manga at once. He was, like, just a part of all these different publications. He was overworking himself like crazy out of, like, I don't know, a weird sense of pride. So... At some point, he breaks, and in the, like, early 90s, I think it's either the late 80s or early 90s, one day he goes, you know what, uh, I can't take it anymore, I quit, and he runs away from home. This is a married man, I don't remember if he has kids, I don't remember if he ever mentions kids if he does, but this is a, a man who just leaves home and decides to be homeless. He's just like, I'm fucking done. So he goes and is homeless for a while, like a couple of months. And then they eventually, his wife puts out a, you know, has a missing persons report out for him. So eventually he gets caught and he gets dragged back home. And then a while later, like a couple years later, he just does it again. This time he skips to another town and takes up a job as a pipe fitter for like, like half a year. He just disappears and goes, makes a new life for himself as a pipe fitter. And uh, eventually gets caught and comes back home. Then, uh, sometime after that, he becomes a hardcore alcoholic. And at this point, he becomes an alcoholic to the point that he's like literally drinking all day, every day. His liver's being destroyed. He has to be sent to a, um, a, a hospital that's like a joint mental and physical care hospital. Because he has the mental disease of alcoholism and the physical disease of dying from it. So, um, there's three parts to this manga. One chronicling each of his disappearances, and one about his time as an alcoholic. Now, what's per what makes this manga so weird is the outlook that it has, and the way it presents these three time periods. Because, as it says in the back, it has been presented with as much realism removed because it has a positive outlook on life. Which doesn't necessarily come through. It really feels like he just picked random details to focus on. Like, none of it is untrue. Like, it's obviously all true, but he hasn't dived into the most fucked up parts of what happened to him. And it's all presented in a very brisk manner. Like, none of this was that big of a deal, even though it very obviously was. And the other thing is that it's presented like a gag manga. It's presented like a comedy, but it's not funny. Like, it doesn't crack jokes. It doesn't, like, try to be humorous. It just straight-facedly portrays what this guy was going through and, like... The humor is just in the fact that he is so fucked. Like, the only thing funny about it is, wow, haha, -ha, I can't believe you did those things. But, like, it's not really funny because you know it's real. So, if anything, it's more abjectly horrifying. But at the same time, it, again, it doesn't try to be horrifying. It's just very straightforward. It's just like, here's what I did. To the point that it's kind of boring for a lot of it. Like, the first part about him being homeless is literally him just, like, recounting what he would do in a day. It's like he'd wake up, he'd go scavenge for food, smoke cigarette butts that were laying around. He talks about some of the, like, you know, life hacks and stuff he used, which are impressive. Like, the amount of stuff this guy comes up with to live homeless is, is quite interesting. And, I mean, he makes it seem not so bad, even though it obviously is worse than he's making it out to be. But, like, he figures it out. He figures out how to live homeless for months on end, you know, and, uh, like, just sleeping in, like, a trash bag in the mountains outside of an apartment complex for months. And, uh, but, like, it literally is just him exploring his every day. There's no deeper message. There's no, like, there's no, like, events. There's no, like, oh, this moment something really weird happened. It's just, like, um, I woke up. Here's what I ate that day. Here's how I set up my camp. And then the next day, he does basically the same shit. And it just kind of goes on and on until the part where he finally gets picked up by the police and um, has some weird interactions with the police before he finally gets sent home. So it's like this whole section of the book right here is just this guy telling you what he did day to day as a homeless guy. 
So it's simultaneously really fascinating and totally uninteresting. And I don't know how to like reconcile those two things. And in addition to the stories being told in here, you've also got like both an interview that's on the inner sleeve jackets, a secret interview, as well as an interview in the back that he did with like another manga artist. Both of which lend a lot more insight into, like, what was actually going on, why he left, like, what his family's reaction was. Like, basically a lot of the reality that he deliberately left out is brought up in the interviews. So if you want to know, like, more of the truth of the situation, you just read those and it kind of fills in the blanks um, to give you the complete picture of this story, which is just a, an odd thing. So then the second half part of the book is, like, he spends all this time as a pipe fitter. Like, first he's homeless for a little while, and he's telling, like, his, his new homeless story in a different location. And then it's, like, a long stretch of him working as a pipe fitter. And, again, he's just kind of detailing his everyday life, like, telling you about the people he worked with, telling you what, you know, what he was doing as a pipe fitter, like, giving really intimate details about what a pipe fitter does. So simultaneously, once again, like, there's no story... So it's not engaging, but at the same time, it's like just knowing that he did this, like just knowing that this guy had this life is the interesting part. Then towards the end of that part, it suddenly jumps into him just giving a retrospective on his career. And that's probably the most interesting segment because it's showing like the different ways that he had to alter his content for it to be saleable, the different ways he worked with editors, like how he was overworking himself, that part gets really stressful. Because up until that point, it's just like everyday life. This is where it becomes a lot more text dense for the rest of the volume and much more like in, like in-depth descriptions of what was going on because he's condensing a lot more time. And, um, you know, the part about his history definitely feels like you under you kind of get a sense of how this led up to him becoming a homeless guy, though he's still just, you know, you throughout this whole thing, you never truly understand, like, what is this guy's fucking deal? Like, why did he do this other than just sheer insanity, you know, an inability to cope with whatever his life had become? Um, and then the alcoholic part is sort of similar to the pipe fitting part where it's about him going to an alcoholics hospital and just dealing with the other people who are there, telling like little stories and vignettes about them. Um, and that part is where it gets really kind of disturbing because like he's like legit on deathbed like half the time. You know, this is a dude whose liver is failing and he's puking up blood every other page and like... And he's middle-aged at this point, so his, like, early on he's drawing himself with hair, and by this point he's got, like, just little frizzes of where hair would be, you know? So, you're watching this man age and destroy himself. And it's, yeah, it's, like, again, a weird combination of disturbing, but not really, and interesting, but not really. It's just knowing about it. Like, knowing that this dude did this and thinking about, like, what would bring me to the same place. Because I'm always interested in, like, artistic weirdos. Because I see myself as an artistic weirdo. And I also see myself as somebody who kind of goes off in a different direction that's maybe not the most socially acceptable. I've fantasized many times about running away and being homeless. I've fantasized about how I would live in this lifestyle. I have fantasized about what would happen if I became an al alcoholic, you know, which for some reason some people think I am, even though I barely fucking drink. This, if you don't understand what alcoholism really is like this made me realize even more than i already did like i think of an alcoholic as someone who needs to drink every day like you have to drink every day this the alcoholic that he was is i wake up and start drinking and i don't stop and he hallucinates like his withdrawals he just, like, starts hallucinating shit. He's, like, having fucking weird fever dreams. He just ends up lost, blacking out in random places, puking in his sleep. That's alcoholism. That's the dangerous alcoholism, you know, that ends you up in a fucking rehab hospital on fucking welfare. So, yeah, like, this paints an image of alcoholism that is truly, like, terrifying and really makes you realize, like, how far gone that is to actually be that. Um... But yeah, it, it's again, like, I can see how he ended up this way to an extent, and 
I have to hope I'm not that guy. Like, I don't think I'm like this guy. I don't think I'd ever go this far, you know? Like, I think I value comfort too much to ever let myself work to the point of being homeless. Like, even though I think I'm as crafty as he is and could do it probably as well, um, I don't think I'd ever let myself go that far. So in a way, this is a nice barometer of being like, well, I'll never be this crazy. At least there's that. At least I'll never be as crazy as Hideo Azuma, who, by the way, was like one of the inventors of Lollicon. Like, he was one of the first big lolly artists and doujinshi authors. So that's interesting as well, you know. Married man, too. And she's uh, she did like his... She inked his backgrounds and stuff. Like, his wife is his assistant, too, which is interesting. She even worked on this, even though, like, she had to... She's the one who had to experience the uh, the other side of the coin of this, which is the, my husband is disappearing and leaving me alone um, for, <laughs> for months on end. It's fucking weird. And it's especially weird reading the interviews where these people have, like they have a lot of respect for him and they're kind of just like, so why'd you do this? And he's like, I don't know. Like I'm fucking, I don't know. I'm just weird. And they're like, yeah, man. I mean, but I think like, like the guy who interviews him at the end, like really thinks of this book as a masterpiece. And I, I, in so far as this is a book only this man could have written because not only is it a very unique experience, but it's presented in a very unique way. Um, like, in that sense, I'm glad I read it. Like, it's definitely something I'll never read again, and it's completely unique. But w was I entertained? Was I interested? Waxing and waning? Like, <sighs> you know, I mean, this book is $23. I don't think it's got $23 worth of entertainment value, but I think it's interesting, and I'm glad to know about it. I wouldn't really recommend this. Like, I feel like you may have gotten enough out of me describing it for like, unless you, unless you're like really interested, like you really need to know what this thing's like that I'm talking about, then go ahead and seek it out, read it online or something. But like, otherwise, if, if you're only like passingly interested, then you probably don't need to read it. I've already explained enough of it to you, but yeah, fascinating book, but not necessarily a good one. Um, but I'll keep it around, because, man, it's a memory to have, for sure. And I'll see you next week. Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show with a newly rekindled interest in Yuri, which is why today we'll be talking about Kindred Spirits on the Roof. This is a manga that is a compilation of two different volumes, which are both tie-ins to a hit Yuri game that I had never heard of when I picked up this volume. I picked it up because after having read Bloom Into You, I was sort of had a renewed interest in Yuri, which is something that I've been a long time fan of. And um, I saw this and how big and cool it looked. And I thought, let's let's give it a shot. It looks pretty adorable. So Kindred Spirits on the Roof is actually a Yuri visual novel. It is an erotic visual novel, although mostly it's just story-driven and just kind of has sex scenes towards the end of the storylines. That is completely available in the U.S. Manga Gamer sells it. It's on Steam, and it's got four drama CDs. I didn't know any of that, but I found out after reading this. And this is sort of a spin-off tie-in thing, where these stories are totally original, but they feature most of the characters from the game as side characters in the stories. So basically you've got two different parts, two halves of this. The first one is this this quaint little love story about a girl who um, who she has a childhood friend that she has uh, always been very close with. And the childhood friend at the start of the story tells her that she's in love with her. And she runs away. She doesn't know how to deal with these feelings. So most of the story is just about her and these other two girls who are major characters from the visual novel who are preparing for the school festival and they're going to be putting on a Romeo and Juliet play. And she's just kind of hanging out with them, finding out that each of them is in a Yuri relationship of their own and gaining their advice and camaraderie to figure out how to deal with this this issue, this rift that's opened up between her and her friend because of the fact that her friend is in love with her. Now, both friends 
just kind of they don't want to hurt one another and that's kind of the problem that you know the one girl's running away because she isn't sure how to deal with these feelings without it uh, damaging their friendship these two girls by the way is who I'm talking about this this girl ran away from this girl's advance and so um yeah, it's mostly just like a really cutesy little romance story that's focused on the slice of life elements of all these cutie pies hanging out and doing whatever. This girl, by the way, is the main character of the game. Now, the funny thing about this story is that as I was reading it, at first I'm like, okay, this is uh, this is fine. Like, the characters are just endearing enough that I could get through the story. I mean, it's overall pretty generic. There's nothing about it that really stands out or is super memorable. But as it goes along, I started to get this sense, like, you know, all I knew about the game was that it existed based on the back of the book. And as I'm reading it, I'm getting the sense of, oh, these characters are all from the game. Like, there's a lot of characters who just start showing up who you have no idea why they're relevant or who they are. Um, and they'll just kind of pass through the story randomly. And so, like, obviously this is meant to be, like, fan service. Like, this manga is meant for people who already love the game to read this side story, see some of their favorite characters appear in another context, and watch them help these two girls hook up. Because what the actual story of the game is, and this is never explained in this book, in fact, these, these two characters who are integral to the game's narrative never actually appear in the book, they're just uh, in the, the supplementary art. The plot of the game is that it takes place in an all-girls school, and these two girls uh, are ghosts who are haunting the school, because each of them was a lesbian who died without ever actually getting to hook up with any girls. They each died at different times. I think one died 70 years ago and the other 30 years ago. But as ghosts, they fell in love. So the two of them are a couple as ghosts. And they think that the reason they can't pass on yet is that they've never been able to go all the way with their relationship. So they try to get this girl to cause other Yuri hookups throughout the school, um, like, to, to help other girls get with the girls that they have crushes on, and then have sex, and then the ghosts can, like, learn how to have sex, I guess, and eventually pass on. It's a, it's a strange story, but the idea of it is to create a quote-unquote Yuritopia. And I think that that phrase is integral, and uh, it's one that I'm going to start using all the time to describe a certain genre of Yuri that I think this falls into, which is the, there are no men in the universe and every girl in the story is gay, is the genre that I will call Yuritopia. Because it takes place in an all-girls school, it's kind of a given that every girl is going to end up with another girl. You never see a male character or have mention of one ever in this story. They don't exist. It's a Yuritopia. So, basically, the course of this first book is just about all these other girls kind of trying to hook up the two main ones. And um, once you know how the game works, that makes a lot more sense. But again, the story, it's its fairly generic. I mean, it's got really cutesy artwork. I, love the des I do really love the designs. I would say that the art is not incredible. Like... There's not an amazing flow between panels or anything. There's not a whole ton of expressiveness in the faces. It's They're all good looking, but they're kind of interchangeable. Like, you could go to any page and you're pretty much going to see the same thing. In fact... At the beginning, I kept getting confused. I kept getting characters mixed up because they all look kind of similar, even though they all have really different hairstyles. Like their personalities were not distinct enough that I could always tell them apart. So sometimes when I was, you know, if I went a whole day between like chapter one and chapter two, I'd come back and then realize that I had, I had confused two characters and had to like reread the first chapter in order to understand it. So, yeah, I mean, it's a cute little story, it's fine, but it's nothing special. Then we get to the second half, which I actually like a lot more. And this one has uh, a different artist with much more expressive art, much more liveliness, much more unique designs, although they still can get a little bit difficult to tell apart because there's a couple of girls with similar hairstyles and I <laughs> would sometimes get confused. But nonetheless, this one... It also has a much more interesting storyline, which is that it's about this girl who is at the, um, 
this ceremony where all of the clubs are like going up on stage and giving a small demonstration of what their club is about so that they can try to entice new members. And these two girls from the quiz club get up there and they're just so close. They're so friendly, as the girl likes to put it, that she decides to join the club so she can watch them because she just loves watching friendly girls. She's just like a Yuri fan, essentially. So she joins this quiz club in order to watch these two friendly girls, and it just so happens that another girl also joins the quiz club, and it turns out that she's done so for the same reason. So it's basically about these two girls bonding over their mutual love of watching other girls bonding. Um, it's really fun and adorable and, again, has great facial expressions, much better flow. Like, the illustrative art isn't as pretty and cute. Like, you know, you look at these girls and you're like, wow, she's adorable. But you look at these girls and they've just got, they've just got more personality. They've just got more life to them. They've got more, uh, expressions. So, you know, I would say that the artwork in the second half is better in terms of being better manga, even if it doesn't make for as pretty illustrative art as, like, what you see on the cover and in these, uh, these little inserts. Like, you know, the full-color stuff looks fucking great on these little inside panels and shit. But, you know, the second half has it, has the, has the actual manga quality to it. So, yeah, the second one is, I mean, again, it's just kind of a small, endearing love story. There's nothing all that, like, deep or meaningful to it. But because the second half has such a unique premise that it's about these girls watching these other girls and then, like, sort of getting involved in their hookup, um, I think it just worked a lot better. And it's funny and charming. And I really liked the characters. They were definitely more memorable. Like, the the girls from the first chapter, the first book... Like, the two main ones were pretty generic. The girls surrounding them who are all from the games have, like, sparks of intrigue where I was like, okay, I wouldn't mind knowing her story, but it's not told in this. So I did actually buy the game. I'm curious about it. Maybe I'll talk about it in the future if I get around to playing it or the drama CDs because, like... I like this world. I like the tone of this story. I like the idea of it. I like the Yuritopia atmosphere and everything. It's just that I don't think that the first story was really, like, memorable. And the second one, well, memorable is not, like, you know, uh, something I'm going to be talking about for years. I don't regret this purchase at all. This was a, it's a fine manga, and I'm very glad it's a one thing that I don't have to buy another volume of this, you know? It's just an open and shut case. Now, I will say that why the fuck is this thing so huge? Like, I mean, it's kind of comfortable to have, you know, like, the pages like this, and the art looks good, big, so I don't want to complain too hard, but it's just, look at, look, look at this whole shelf. All these books are, like, the same height, the same breadth, they all flush nicely on a shelf together, right? But then, you've got this, which, like, is uh, the same size as this one right here, which is sticking out like a, a centimeter off my shelf, and it's taller than everything in the world. This is another Seven Seas Yuri manga, by the way, that I haven't read yet. So, like, for some reason, Seven Seas has started publishing these these giant books, and, like, nothing they do is ever standardized. Look at this. You can see here that the two Seven Seas books are shorter than all the other ones on this shelf, all these standard-sized manga that they're next to. For some reason, they're smaller. Then you've got some bullshit, like... They're older stuff, like, look, the Boogie Pop novels, right? They're shorter than the other novels on the shelf. But then they released this one. That's just a, f that's a fucking... Why? Why? Why would you do this? It doesn't match the rest of the fucking series at all. Seven Cs. Why is there no standardization amongst your releases? I don't understand. Like, there will be... Like, like, these two Yuri ones line up, but then if you were to go get, like, one of their other Yuri series, like Girlfriends or, uh, um, fucking, uh, Strawberry Panic, like, those don't, they're not the same size. Those are, like, standard manga sized, like anything else. I just don't get it. What is the fucking standard they're using? Now, I'll also say that, um... I was worried after Bloom Into You, which, by the way, again, smaller than all the other stuff on the shelf, um... That one I complained about how it had the constant emphasis, the constant bolded words. And it seems like using emphasis is something they're doing in all their Yuri manga. Like, it's like I flipped through a bunch of them at the store, and I was really concerned about buying any of them because of it. But it was not nearly as bad in this case. Like, there is emphasis. 
uh, you know, f- somewhat frequently, but it was never annoying. It never distracted me. Maybe they just did a better job of which words they emphasized because Bloom into You, it was insufferable. But um, this one was fine. So hopefully that will continue to be true as I read more of their Yuri manga. But anyways, if you are a Yuri fan, if you like the idea of the Yuritopia, this is a fine story. It's cute. It's fun. The second book is really uh, endearing. And maybe play the visual novel if that's uh, your thing. It's like $35, though, so, you know, your mileage may vary on how much that's worth. Uh, And that's it for this episode. I'll see you in the next one. Hey everybody, it's Manga Mondays, the only manga review show where it's currently April 23rd, and it's actually been quite a while since I recorded one of these, but you won't know the difference because the recording schedule is so far ahead of itself. So today we're going to be talking about Murcielago. This was a manga that I picked up because aside from having a, a girl with dead fish eyes with dark circles under them on the cover which I'm a big fan of, and just sort of edgy presentation. It was also shrink-wrapped, which caught my attention because that usually means an 18-plus thing, which means it probably had some incredible violence or nudity. And reading the back, it describes that mass murderer Kuroko Komori has two passions in life, taking lives and pleasuring ladies. And I went, well, (laughs) I'm done. I'm sold. So this is about a lesbian serial killer who gets... um, She's, she, she's captured, she's in prison, she's going to be killed on death row, but then they give her a job to go capture other dangerous psychotic criminals, or kill them, as uh, the case usually ends up being. So, yeah, her job is just to go around and stop extremely dangerous criminals, and it presents this in the most over-the-top fashion possible like here's the first guy she stops a former wrestler who's jacked up on some kind of crazy drugs and goes around like literally tearing people clean in half and just like uh stomping people in here we go here's a good ex- here's a great image of him just tearing through civilians very gory manga and it's funny too because there is there are like hardcore sex scenes or at least there's one early on um, hmm, how much of this can I show? It's a great scene where the main, the main character is just plowing this chick, like, really rough, and shoves, her, her phone starts ringing, uh, and it's on vibrate, so she shoves it in the girl's vag. Um, this is very immature. This whole thing reads exactly like something that I would have come up with when I was, like, 15, like, Which is why I bought it, because it totally just, there's, you know, it's like a lesbian supervillain, and she's teamed up with this adorable little moe girl, um, I say little, but she's got, you know, she's a, she's a pretty, she's a pretty girl, but she teams up with this cute little girl who's a driver who just, like, drives insanely, she can, like, literally drive off of buildings and shit, and, like, maneuver her car in all these insane ways, um, and they, they just go around trying to stop criminals now the thing is that what carries this is of course the the aesthetic persona of this character that's a term i made up a long time ago to describe when a character like what they're about is the idea of them you know like if you think this sounds like a cool character that i've described she's everything you're hoping for she's psychotic she's uh enjoys killing people, she's always got that face, um, she's often just turns her head sideways, like, when she talks for no reason, um, she loves women, she's basically a dick to everybody except for any pretty girl, who she, um, she actually has, like, a habit of turning girls gay, like, she goes around seeking out, uh, women that she can, um, you know, like, like, they'll often say that they're not used to being with women, but then she'll, she'll make them come around, because she's just that good of a lover, you know, um, and I'm noticing, because it bothered me throughout this, that the times where it does show her having sex, there were no nipples, which I thought was weird, because this is a manga with, like, insane gore, uh, and violence, like, way over the top violence, it's got hard, like, like, rough sex that's fully depicted, just except for the actual extremities, 
until the last chapter that's in here, which is the pilot chat, or or it's like a never mind, the bonus chapter for this issue actually does show nipples. Maybe they just couldn't show them in the magazine that it was published in. Even here, it's pretty minimal though. Maybe the guy just didn't want to draw them. Maybe he thinks it's funnier if uh, if you can't see anything. So yeah, um, you could call this a Yuri, I guess. But the thing about it is that, like, other than how much fun this character is and getting to see cool violence and sex, this thing's dumb as hell. And, I mean, it's obviously supposed to be dumb. Like, it's extremely tongue-in-cheek. It's always got a really light-hearted tone. Like, like, like a goofy, wacky, almost like Excel Saga level of, like, upbeat, happy tone despite all this crazy stuff that's happening. I mean, I wouldn't outright call it a comedy which maybe is part of the problem. It's not that funny. Um, and while the things that, like, the, the feats that they pull off are insane and, and, and you know, hilarious and awesome in their own right, uh, just the, the individual storylines are dumb. It's just like, here's a wrestler, go fight him. But they always try to work in, like, uh, Kuroko will in-depth analyze why the killer will act a certain way and she'll like go through all these explanations of like what he's trying to accomplish and how she's going to stop him for those reasons and it, it's all just like you know intro psych level uh it's dumb it's it's just an excuse to try to make her sound cool and smart but it's not using like real psychological principles and everyone's so fucking whacked out and over the top that how could they be and she's also like totally unstoppable she's like way beyond the impossible levels of like she can predict uh, like she can dodge bullets you know like like from snipers from thousands of yards away like she is just impossibly overpowered so, most of the series is just about kind of watching this girl do her thing. Watching her flirt with other girls and kill people. Which is fine. It's fun in its own... It's, it's fun for those elements. But I also don't think the artwork is impressive enough to, like, make it something that you want to read just for the cool moments. Like, there's pretty decent character designs. I like this girl. Um, and... It's got, like, you can competently understand what's happening during the action, at least most of the time. Sometimes it's a little bit more questionable. Like, I'm not entirely sure what's happening here. You can kind of follow it if you stare at it for long enough. But, like, you know, it doesn't have those big, impressive action moments the way something like Fire Force does. So I don't know if I'd read it necessarily as an action thing, or as a comedy thing, or as a Yuri thing, because there's not that much lesbian sex in it. Uh, so, yeah, I can't say that I'm, like, rushing to go buy the second volume of this. I had fun with it. I'm glad it exists. I like the character. I just feel like the the story's not very strong. And the second half of this book, it gets into, like, an arc where, um, like, all these killers are brought to this mansion. And they're all going to be, like, they have to go through all these traps and stuff because there's, like, a crazy old man who just wants to, like, eliminate all these murderers. And that arc does not conclude before the end of this book, so I guess it's going to go on. And I just thought it was not interesting at all. Like, the first part where they're just fighting the giant jacked-up wrestler is pretty entertaining because it's, it goes through all these insane, um, you know, feats and stuff. But then after that point, the other scenarios that the author comes up with to put them in, just not nearly as cool, not nearly as interesting, so it kind of felt like this was losing steam by the end of the first book, and I don't know if it picks up steam later, if I heard that it was great, I might give it another look, or if it developed, like, a plot that wasn't completely stupid, but, uh, yeah, that's it for now. Fun times. If you like this kind of thing even more than I do, like, if you're a real gore hound or you just want to watch this, like, if this character sounds like she'd be way up your alley, give it a shot. At least, you know, you don't have to spend money on it, probably. You'll probably read it online, so, you know, go ahead. And I'll see you next week. Welcome once again to Manga Mondays. First time I filmed 
two of these in a row in a while, but I blew through this pretty quickly. This is Kisses and White Lily for My Dearest Girl, a Yuri manga that I obviously bought because it's Yuri. Um, this and Murcielago, incidentally, are from Yen Press, who had not previously done any Yuri, but I've heard that these both sold really well, and therefore they're going to do more. So... You know, my bookshelf's just going to keep filling with more and more Yuri as the days go on. But this is much more of a standard Yuritopia story. It's an all-girls school, all the girls are lesbians, and the author is very excited to show us as many lesbian couples as possible. Like, in between chapters, there's these little one-page shorts where it'll just explain some other couple who was, like, on the sidelines during the main event of the story, which is kind of funny. But this one is about... This girl who's like a straight-A student, she's obsessed with being number one, but she is upstaged by this girl who is just a natural genius at absolutely everything. She can do anything with no effort, she doesn't give a fuck, she sleeps through class but still gets straight A's, is still the number one student. She's just an absolute, you know, cartoon-level genius. So this girl is, of course, jealous and bitter about it, um, but... In observing this girl, she decides, like, she, she basically wants to beat her. Like, she's determined to beat her. This girl falls in love with her because of that. I shouldn't say this girl so much because anyone who doesn't watch these and doesn't see me pointing at the, the manga, this gets really confusing. I know because I did it with Bloom Into You and I could not follow it when I was listening to it. Um, so we'll refer to them as Genius and Straight A's. So Genius falls in love with Straight A's because of the fact that straight A's won't give up on trying to beat her. Because throughout her life, everyone just kind of ends up being distant from her because she's so much better than them that they just kind of give up. Like, they don't want to even try to beat her or they just find her unapproachable. So the fact that straight A's is willing to put up a fight makes Genius immediately fall in love. And she's very straightforward about it. She's very like, get in your face and start kissing ya right off the bat. And Straight A's immediately realizes that she probably has feelings for Genius too, but she won't admit it. She's being a tsundere um, all throughout like a, you know, and we're talking like modern tsundere, like flipping back and forth, an indecisive obviously has feelings for her and kind of admits it sometimes, but then won't admit it other times. So, at the beginning, this is just kind of entertaining. Uh, the artwork's alright. Kind of middle of the road. Nothing all that special about it. Sometimes the panel layouts were a little confusing. There were moments where I had to take a second to, like, process what was going on in the page. Especially because, um, there's a tendency to introduce characters, um, like... Like, important side characters at first just kind of seem like they're random classmates, and then eventually you realize that they are, in fact, important. But yeah, so at first it's mostly about the relationship between these two. But then Straight A's also has a cousin that she shares a room with who is on the track team, and we start exploring her relationship with the leader of the track team as well, and they're like a more already solidified couple, and, yeah, like, halfway through this book, it just kind of becomes about that other couple. And, like, I mean, they're related to what's going on with these two, but, it, in fact, here's the other couple right here. It just kind of becomes about these two halfway through. So, um, you know, it's really like we've got two different intertwined stories about two different relationships um, between these sets of girls, while all these other relationships are kind of happening on these little one-page stories along the way. So this is pretty cute, and it was enjoyable. Um, I like that the relationships each have, like, a gimmick to them, but I feel like they could get exhausted pretty quickly. Like, the relationship between these two started moving so fast in the beginning that I feel like the author kind of pumped the brakes on it. Like, it just kind of halts progress. Like, it's moving really fast at first, and then it just kind of stops... And then we start focusing on the other characters, and then there's, like, one more chapter in here where we, we make a little a little leap forward with the main two. So it feels like it may be, like, the author realized that there wasn't that much to go on with this, that this was kind of a thin premise, and uh, it was being jumped through at too high of a speed. So, yeah, I don't know, like, 
how long this manga is. I don't know how many books it's supposed to be in total, but, like, I cannot imagine it lasting too much longer than this. Like, if this is more than two or three volumes, I'll be shocked. And, uh, and I have no idea how they'd stretch it out unless they just keep introducing new couples. Kind of reminds me a lot of, uh, the, the Yuritopia one, Kindred Spirits on the Roof. Like, that, it's tonally almost exactly the same. And it's excitedness to just show us as many lesbian couples as possible is very much in the same spirit. So, this is another one that... It's not exceptional. It's not something that I felt like I need to continue. It's just more Yuri. And I mean, I've got plenty of Yuri at this point. Like, I'm going to get sick of this kind of story pretty quickly. And like, Bloom into You had much more interesting character. Like, the dynamic here reminds me of that in that it's these two girls kind of exploring their feelings and getting closer. And each one has kind of a gimmick in the relationship. But that one was more interesting than this one. Um, albeit less cutesy, you know, Kindred Spirits told a more complete story in just a short package, I didn't have to buy more than one volume, like, that's the problem here, is that, like, I read this first volume, but the idea of buying another one to continue the story is just, it's not worth it when there's so much other Yuri that I could be reading, like, um, there might be a market saturation creeping up on us with this genre very quickly, because, I've been going to Barnes & Noble, like, every couple of days for months now, and just, like, looking at all the new Volume 1s that come out and, and buying them, and, like, a significant portion of what I've managed to pick up has been Yuri, uh, and there's plenty I haven't even been buying. I've been avoiding some of the other ones that either had the obnoxious, bolded text like Bloom Into You had, uh, or were just, like, a million Milk Mori Naga things, so... And I haven't read the one I've, I've already bought yet. So yeah, like, I just feel like we're going to hit a saturation point with this. And this one doesn't stand out enough that I think it could surf on that ocean. Like, this would be my, you know, if I f keep buying Bloom Into You and finish it, and then I finish all those Milk Morinagas, and I kind of run out of all the other Yuris, maybe I'll get around to continuing this one. But it just does not... Um, break the mold of the genre. But still, if you're into Yuri, if you'll just consume all of it, if you like the Yuri-topia stories where it's just every girl's in a relationship, give it a shot. Read it online. Um, maybe I'll finish it there, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, not a super strong recommendation. Anyways, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next week. Hey everybody, welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that doesn't even have any manga in the backdrop because I'm in the middle of uh, moving, but today I'm going to be talking about Astro Boy, the first giant omnibus volume. So you've probably heard of Astro Boy. It's one of the oldest manga in existence. It is was, was the first TV anime ever. Um, the adaptation of it, which was also directed by Osamu Tezuka, who drew the manga, the godfather of all manga and anime, the guy who drew, like, a thousand stories in his life, um, incredibly. Lots and lots of shorts, some longer series, best known for Astro Boy, Blackjack, Princess Knight, um, Kimba the White Lion, and myriad others. And, uh, yes, this is one of his... This was like the one that got him famous. This is his first big one. It's a children's manga about a robot boy who uh, has seven special powers. He can shoot machine guns out of his ass. He's got rocket boots. He's got super hearing. I, I don't remember all of his powers. But um, he just kind of goes on action adventures in a, in a future world where robots are everywhere. Most of the stories are about robots. They're about the nature of being a robot. And um, other than that, they're pretty all over the place. Some of them will be like a political story. Some of them will be like a social issue kind of thing. They all have some kind of like like political, socio-political backdrop to them. In spite of being children's stories, which are fairly simplistic, like they are often... Um, just rollicking adventures with lots of action that move very, very fast and jump from thing to thing to thing. These stories will go through, like, so many different, like, 
elements on their way to the end because it's just constantly introducing new shit. Um, lots of really experimental and playful paneling and stuff. Lots of meta, lots of breaking the fourth wall. It's like Osamu Tezuka had every idea in the world about manga, and he explored all of it in the course of doing Astro Boy. Um, and what's interesting about this particular omnibus collection is that these stories are not in order. This is a collection of Astro Boy stories from all over the timeline of the series, um, and they're organized sort of by Tezuka, and like each chapter will have an intro page or a couple of pages where he literally writes himself into the story and like explains what this chapter is about and like some of the context surrounding it and like his thoughts on it and stuff like that. Um, or sometimes he's even just like interacting with the characters in the story or like the, those intro pages will just segue into the story itself. Um, it's kind of fascinating. But this really feels like the unhinged creativity of this guy. Like, he would just come up with stuff and put it in the book, you know. And it's interesting the way that it manages to simultaneously, leave, like, just be a fun, breezy action story for kids while also clearly having all these, like, relatively heavy-handed sociopolitical messages in it. And um, I think what I find most interesting about this book is that is its use of robot violence. Because there is a lot of violence in Astro Boy in terms of, a of robots breaking each other apart. You know, robots destroying one another. And what I think is interesting about it is that it, it obviously, like, got past censorship because they were robots. Like, you never see a human die. It's always robots destroying each other. And yet, like, the th the main themes of this book, this is an extremely pro-robot story. Like, it's always about how humans are the bad guys. Robots would be good if not for the fact that humans made them bad. You know, like, so robots are always sympathetic. Even if they're being used for evil purposes, they are ultimately sympathetic. And so, it's really intriguing that the robots are like these deep, realized characters well, not necessarily deep, but they're realized characters, and they, you know, they're treated like people. Like, a lot of the stories are about robot rights and how there's, like, a robot rights movement. There's one story that's about a robot president who gets elected, and he's trying to protect robot laws. Or like, you know, there's various stories where, like, an anti-robot law is going to be passed, and, and they have to do something to stop it. So this story is constantly insistent that robots are essentially people, and yet it will just you know, have them get destroyed at the drop of a hat. Like, good robots, good sympathetic robots will get destroyed. And so it's interesting how he's kind of able to write, you know, a a sort of dark and um, effective, like emotionally effective story. And, I mean, granted, it never gets, like, dark, dark. Like, Astro Boy is never going to make you fucking... Uh, deeply upset or something like that. You know, most of the characters uh, who who do get destroyed are only maybe around for a certain, like, for one arc, and it never gets, like, sappy or dramatic, and yet it, it just is kind of surprising that you're like, yeah, there's, like, real characters who, who constantly get destroyed in this manga, and I can tell it's done with self-awareness, you know? He's sort of poking fun at the fact that it's okay for them to get destroyed because they're robots. We perceive it that way, even though he's constantly insisting that that is not the case, that robots have rights and should be treated as people. Um, so, yeah, th these stories, they definitely range in intrigue, quality, and length greatly. There's like three or four really long stories in here that make up like the bulk of this uh, book, and then probably four or five, maybe even six shorter ones that are just like one chapter. And those ones tend to be less interesting. Usually they're just about exploring like one key idea. Um, and they all are like just super breakneck and abrupt. Like, scenes will just fucking end. Chapters will just fucking end. Like, you'll be reading a long-ass story, and it'll wrap up in one page. Like, the bad guy gets destroyed, and they're like, everything's cool now, and then that's the end of the, ch uh, the chapter, you know, or the story. Even though there's other parts where there'll be, like, a protracted battle scene across several pages, but then the resolution is one page long. So it definitely prioritizes action. Um, there's one long section where it's about, like, magicians, and they keep fucking around with uh, the panels and stuff where, like, like characters will literally, like, peel panels away and hide under them. I'm trying to see if I can find that page. Yeah, here we go. 
like um, right here. These characters are literally pulling the panel away so they can hide paintings under it. It's definitely got that like, um, you know, that 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 one Daffy Duck Looney Tune, where the one where the where the artist is like uh, deconstructing the, the the fucking images as they're happening. It's it's got a lot of that kind of vibe to it. And just lots of weird meta jokes and characters just like making offhand comments about really broad ideas or like just throwing in random shit, like random jokes that like literally they will say on the page like this image is just a joke and is not canon to this story. Like it's it's totally bizarre reading through it that like it like Tezuka really did not cut anything out. He was just going all in on every idea he had. Um, by far the most engaging story in here is the one where there's just a giant fuck-off robot gets created, and he's told to go destroy the seven strongest robots on Earth. And it's this really long story about this big fucking robot who, as it, the story goes on, becomes an actually really developed character, um, and he has this interesting relationship with Astro Boy where... Um, because Astro Boy keeps, like, saving him and he's kind of honorable, then he ends up becoming, like, kind of a good guy, even though he's going around destroying all these really virtuous great robots. So there's this, this total, like, um, you know, like, you, on the, on the one hand, you're like, fuck this guy, because he's, like, murdering all these, uh, you know, great robots, but at the same time, he's only doing it because he's being told to and he doesn't want to, and, uh, you know, in the end, he kind of comes around to being a good guy, so it's, you know, it puts it in your head like, oh, do I, uh, do I like, do I like this guy or not? Um, which apparently a lot of people were upset when, uh, when he does get destroyed at the end, because Tezuka says so at the start of the, at the start of that, um, story with his little narration bit. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. I mean, ultimately, it, it does feel like a kid's story, you know, it does... It's mostly about whipping through action after action scene, and while it can be entertaining with how inventive the ideas are, like, this book is fucking huge, it took me a while to read this, and I was definitely, like, exhausted with it by the end. Like, even though I really liked that, the, the giant robot story, um, that was by far the most interesting, like, the, the couple of shorts that followed after it, I was just like, okay, I don't, I don't need to read all of Astro Boy, you know, like, I would encourage just looking up, like, what the best Astro Boy stories are and maybe reading a few of those. Because it's it's fairly entertaining. I just don't think it... I, it's more... I bought this because it's Astro Boy. You know, I wanted to read the canon literature of manga. Like, this is one of the first... one Like, the first one to become famous. You know, Osamu Tezuka is the father of manga. I just kind of wanted to know Astro Boy. But I don't feel like I need to buy a second omnibus because I've read a shitload of Astro Boy at this point. This thing is 700 fucking pages. Um, so, like... I feel like I've got a grasp on the character and most of the side characters and like all the, the sort of culturally important aspects of Astro Boy, um, you know. But if there's maybe some other stories that are particularly famous, I might check those out too. So anyway, yeah. Um, would I recommend Astro Boy? Again, like I said, read, look up the best stories. Like not even all the ones in just this omnibus are all that great. You know, a couple of them are pretty interesting. The strongest robot in the world one's really good. Um, the 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 origin story is pretty good and, and pretty necessary, but um, uh, you know it's worth reading if you're someone who's interested in the history of manga and want to see what it was like inside the mind of a of a genius. Who this? I mean, the thing about Tezuka's stuff is it really does hold up to time. Like even though you can tell this is older because of a lot of like cultural references or just the paneling style being uh you know fairly straightforward. Um, it nonetheless, like, it holds up. Like, the stories don't feel dated. They, 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 probably because the pacing is so fucking fast. Like, normally when I think of older stories, I expect a slower pace, and that is not even slightly the case here. This is breakneck. So, um, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, you know, read it. Get your cultural heritage of manga. Welcome back to Manga Mondays, the show that I should probably mention at some point is now a Monday and Thursday show. But I didn't bother changing the name at all. Um, I'm still uh, in transition about to move, and I just read Secret of the Princess by Milk Morinaga, which is a Yuri story. Um, I picked this up a while ago, and I finally got around to it. 
um, amidst all the other Yuri I've been reading. I wanted to get back into Milk Morinaga stories, but I figured I'd pick a shorter one to get started with. This is just a one-volume story. It's com it's complete. It's about these two girls who, uh, I mean, you can tell from the cover what's going to happen. So, it's sort of a, not quite a Yuri-topia story, but it is an all-girls school Yuri story where, um... We've got this girl who wants to be a princess. We'll call her princess girl and, and her prince girl just for the sake of ease. This girl wants to be a princess. She wants to grow up to get married to some to some guy and just live the rest of her life as a happy bride because that's what her mom's raised her. Her mom has raised her very traditional and very girly. She's like, you have to be cute. You have to be a princess. You got to get a guy as soon as you leave high school and immediately you'll be set for life. And she's like... I'm totally down. She's like, that sounds great. Uh, my mom seems really happy with her life. I'm going to do what she did. So she's planning that. And then she happens to witness this girl, who's like a, uh, a, a sort of athletic sports club, you know, um, heartthrob, princely girl who all the girls at school like. She, watch, she happens to witness her accidentally break a priceless vase belonging to the principal. And so this girl's like, don't tell anybody, please. And she's like, how about, I won't tell anybody, if you will date me for practice. She wants to practice, because this girl's sort of manly, she's like, oh, I'm going to practice dating with her. And she's like, hey, I have no friends because everyone's afraid of me because they think I'm too cool for them to talk to. So I want to have a friend to hang out with. So they start dating. Both of them think of it as just a, you know, just a fake thing. They're just doing it for the hell of it. But of course, naturally, as it goes, they develop feelings for each other, eventually fall in love. I mean, you know, you know that's going to happen. That's obvious. What I thought was interesting about this story is the fact that it's sort of playing with that idea of girls who like hook up with each other to practice dating which was like a th like a thing that that happened in Japan like like historically that was kind of a thing and that's what like when people talk about HBK Euphonium and how that show oh it was never supposed to be Yuri it was just the girls are kind of like they're just intimate they're just close and this manga is almost like making fun of that concept by having the characters try to do that and then end up actually falling in love um you know like they, this girl is just like a super traditional girly girl who thinks she's going to end up with a guy and then gradually realizes actually I really like this girl you know and uh and the same thing happens with her so you know, there's some interpersonal drama with the other kids in the class, you know, other girls get mad at her because they all like the prince, and, um, you know, there's, it, it's got some, some light melodrama, but, uh, and, and kind of a slightly over-the-top ending. I wasn't sure, the ending was a little bit much with the way that the, uh, the sort of big, you know, confession finally happens, but man, they do hook up in the end. They become a real weary couple. They're, uh, they even move in together. Uh, so that's really nice. I'm, I'm spoiling the whole fucking thing, but I feel like with Yuri fans, they want to know this stuff up front. It's just the experience of getting to witness it that's, that's, uh, that's gratifying. It's just like, yeah, um, I know what I'm getting into. I know what the story's gonna be the second I looked at the fucking cover. I just want to experience seeing it happen. And it's, it's pretty cute and fun. I mean, it's real short. Uh, they only really, like, hook up at the very end, but... Because last time I was talking about Yuri on my uh, Yuri cast, um, which incidentally was recorded ages ago, and then I read like a thousand Yuri manga, both before and after, which it, we're, all, we're all in this goddamn Manga Mondays. This is why I sped up Manga Mondays, because I was reading so much Yuri, and it was getting confusing because I kept talking about it publicly, but like all the stuff I was reading... Um, I wasn't, you know, like the videos weren't out about it, and I was like, oh god, this is this is a pain in the ass. I got to speed up the production cycle of this. So, um, so yeah, like I, uh, why was I saying that? Why did I bring that up? Why was that important? Oh yeah, someone was commenting to me about girlfriends. I had said that was a great place to start for Yuri, and they were like, oh, but it takes so long for the relationship to get started. Which I thought was an odd claim, because uh, as long as it does get started, that's what matters. Girlfriends is only five volumes. It can't possibly take long when it's only five volumes long. You can read it in, a, in one sitting. Um, and then he had linked some other Yuri manga he recommended, and in one of them, the girls were, like, fucking in chapter one. And I was like, okay, I get what this guy's, you know, what, he, what he's talking about. 
but that manga was really short, and I didn't really feel like I got to know the characters, you know? I like this this kind of story because you, you feel... It's, it's all about, like, earning it. Like, you, you fall for each character. You're like, okay, I like what this girl's about. I like what this girl's about. I see how they complement each other. And then as the story goes along, you're kind of like, man, I, I kind of want these two to be together, you know? Oh, they seem like they complete each other. They seem like they, they do, they, you know, oh, man, I can see the writing on the wall here. And then it finally happens, and you're like, yeah, yeah. You get the payoff of it. It, 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 it all works out, and you're like, cool. That's nice, you know, and it doesn't fuck around for too long. There's not, like, a bunch of, like, there's a there's a little hint of, like, love triangle and stuff, but it's not taken that seriously. It's just kind of a background. It's really just about these two, and the other characters are kind of, like, tangentially related. It's just, like, how those characters cause these two to explore their feelings, you know. It doesn't, like, veer off into a tangent from what you know is going to happen. Um, but it is still pretty short, so I won't say it's, like, particularly memorable, and it's, I mean, it's really standard style of story. You've got the girly girl and the, the masculine one, you know. Although, another thing I like about this is that as Princess Girl, like, falls for Prince, she starts to regard her more as a woman. Like, she starts to think, you know, maybe she's not my prince, she is my princess. Like, you know, she is, like, I like her not because I think of her as a guy, but because she's a woman that I love. And I, I like, I appreciated that. That they didn't try to make her, like, just a guy, you know, even though she's, uh, she's not very feminine. But, um, yeah, it's pretty cute. I enjoyed it. I don't know how much I recommend it. I don't know if I'd buy it. It's $14. It's a bit much. But I had a good time. And I definitely want to read more Milk Morinaga stories because she's great. Um, and she gives a whole thing in the, at the back end about how she literally actually went to an all-girls school and, uh, and, like, this story is based on, like, her experiences there. So that's interesting. All right, that's it for that one. Shorter one. Shorter manga. You know, not a lot to say. Bye. Welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that you are watching right this moment. I'm going to tell you about this new, uh, pretty popular, I think, manga. I'd heard of this before it came out stateside, and they seem to be pushing it with the marketing. Delicious in Dungeon, which I actually enjoyed more than I expected to, and was surprised by what kind of manga this is. Because this is a cooking manga. It's, a, it's about um, a group of adventurers in a like generic video game dungeon world. The way the world's set up reminds me a lot of Is It Wrong to Pick Up Girls in a Dungeon, which is like the actual generic shitty uh, RPG-based show that this is not, um, that I was scared this could be. But um, it's similar in that it takes place in what is clearly a video game world, but it seems to be real to the people in it like there's a dungeon everyone goes to the dungeon to try to explore to make money and bring back to the economy people seem to be able to die and come back it's not entirely clear how the rules work on that because death seems to be something they don't want to do but they have all experienced um so yeah it takes place like in a video game as though the game were real and so We've got uh, our stable of main characters here, this guy and this cute elf girl and this little thief dude who at the beginning are fighting a dragon and the knight's sister gets eaten by the dragon. She gets swallowed by it and um, so the manga is basically about them wanting to go back into the dungeon after they wiped to try and rescue the sister. But the reason they had wiped against the dragon is because they didn't have enough food. Everyone was too hungry, they couldn't fight. And so this time, they're trying to go back in, but they don't have enough money to buy food. They don't have enough time to go and prepare food and, like, stock up their items. So they have to go in and just eat the monsters in the dungeon. Which is apparently something very strange in this world. Not a lot of people do it. It's, like, seen as taboo. People are grossed out by the idea. But this dude, our main character, is obsessed with eating monsters. Because he has a fascination with monsters themselves. He loves everything about them. But most especially, he wants to eat them. Like, out of his love for monsters came a desire to eat monsters. So as the three of them start venturing into this dungeon, and they're planning to eat their first monster, and they're figuring out how to do it, they meet this dwarf guy who is like a master monster cooker. Like, he's really passionate about it. He's been in the dungeon for ten years, cooking and eating monsters, and he's really excited to see some young people who are interested in 
doing it as well, so he joins their team. And, um, yeah, the first few chapters follow a pretty, like, kind of a formulaic thing where we've got, like, a monster will show up, the night dude will be like, oh, I really want to try to eat this monster, and, um, the elf girl's like, please god no. And then the dwarf guy explains how they can cook the monster, they end up defeating the monster, cooking it, and eating it. And a lot of the goofy, the comedy aspect is just based on the elf girl not wanting to eat the monster. She really, really doesn't want to do it, but every time she does, she ends up enjoying it, of course. And, um, you know, the the, uh, the dwarf and the knight are obsessed with this idea of, of being able to eat them. Now, what makes this unexpectedly interesting is how seriously it takes the cooking element of it. This is primarily a cooking manga. While there is a lot of action in them, like, fighting the monsters and defeating them, um, most of that action is more, like, technical and tactical than it is, like, about flashy action scenes. It's really about, like, explaining how the monster works, how you can exploit the monster's weaknesses in order to defeat it, and then explaining in great detail how these monsters are cooked. And mind you, this picks generic fantasy for a very good reason, because these are all monsters we're all familiar with. You know, they'll be cooking a, a chimera or a, a mandrake or something. It's like something we've all fought in a video game before, and now we're learning how they would be cooked. And it, like, you know, it shows the dishes with, like... I gotta show you an example of, um... Once the dish is cooked... It'll tell you, like, the nutritional value of it and exactly what ingredients go in and what order. Here we go. Like, you know, they've made a huge scorpion um, dish and, like, it explains everything that goes into it. And so, you know, it's just literally an instructional guide on how to make food out of monsters, which is totally useless when, like, it, it, there are no monsters. There's no, like, this is not helpful to learn how to cook anything real, and yet it goes into extensive detail on the cooking process and, like, explains how it all works. Um, but just as interesting as the cooking itself, which can be very entertaining sometimes, just, like, seeing how a monster would translate to food, um... Perhaps the most interesting part is when they're figuring out how to defeat some of the monsters and explaining, like, how they work. There's lots of, like, biological details. There'll be, like, a graph of a monster's anatomy. Like, just everything explored. Um, and as it goes along, I feel like it, it gets stronger. This particular volume, it kind of hits a point after the first three chapters where I was like, okay, I get it. The elf girl doesn't like the food, and they're going to make her eat it. You know, like, they really um, hammer on that for a while. And it kind of feels one note. But then they start mixing it up by focusing um, a chapter on the thief character, which is interesting because it teaches them how to use traps for cooking, like dungeon traps, how to activate them in such a way that they can help you to cook. Um, and then there's a two-chapter arc about living armor and just basically getting to the heart of what it actually is, like how the armor is moving, what's causing it, and whether or not there is a possible way to eat living armor. It's a pretty fun series. Like, honestly, I really enjoyed it. Um, it's it's very charming. It's very slow-paced and, like, methodical. Like, this is more slice of life than action or adventure. The focus is really just on, like, explaining how the monsters work and cooking them and enjoying it. You know, like, there's, there's lots of scenes of characters just, like, eating monsters and having a good time. Um, and the action is always lighthearted. There's not a single ounce of seriousness in this thing. And, I mean, it has a lot of comedy moments, but I wouldn't go so far as to call it a comedy. I would call it, like, a slice-of-life comedy. It's like an Iyashike, almost. It's very relaxing and kind of cute and fun. Um, and the artwork is very versatile and great uh, when it needs to look intense and uh, action-packed it can lots of dynamic fights even when most of it is like characters standing around talking and looking cute and um you know there's lots of good facial expressions and reactions to the food uh so the art is everything it needs to be uh, the characters are surprisingly fun like the night guy seems like a generic knight at first but he's so like otaku about monsters he has like such a mania for it and it's interesting because it's all bubbling under the surface like he's never told anybody this stuff he's been hiding it from his friends and everything and like you just kind of gradually realize that at first it seems like he has a passing inch like he's like oh yeah you know i've always been interested in monsters and it makes me want to try to eat them but then as he you know will start explaining stuff about monsters you realize he has like a deep deep knowledge and he's done tons of research and he's been trying to eat them for a while and just not quite there yet you know and dwarf guy who's just very like straight-faced stoic 
dwarf, like, not stoic, that's not the word I want. He's always got the same expression. He's always got this same, like, googly-eyed, I can't really fucking make it focus, but, um, he's very, like, straightforward, and, uh, he just, like, wants to make, he's, he just really wants to eat monsters, and he'll, like, he's so obsessed with cooking them that he'll make the other guys do stuff to help him cook. You know, you've got Elf Girl, who's, Probably the least interesting character, but she's a lot of fun to watch react to what everyone else is doing. So yeah, like there's great chemistry between the characters. They're really fun. Um, I have nothing particularly negative to say about this other than that it starts off a little samey. Now, I will say then, because of that, I'm worried about the prospect of like buying another volume of this. I don't know how long this concept can stay interesting, but I did think it was getting better as it went. So... If it could stay as good as the later chapters, I would think, why not buy another volume? And it's a very nice looking release from Yen Press here. First time in a while that I've bought a fucking $15 Yen Press book and actually ended up enjoying the story and, uh, you know, thinking that the, the packaging looked as good as it does. So yeah, this is a cool manga. If you've been hearing about it and you've been curious... It's worth the read. It, you know, don't let the generic fantasy trappings scare you. It's using those for great purpose to be a very fun, um, EHK comedy cooking show. So yeah, that's it for this week. I'll see you next week. Welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show filmed randomly around the clock. Today I'm going to be talking about Land of the Lustrous, which is a manga that I'm just going to go ahead and immediately recommend because the fucking artwork is just so goddamn cool in this thing. This is a manga. Here, look at this. Look at this fucking. This is like like this is like a monster that these these girls are fighting. This is like this fucking artwork's insanity. Uh, it, it's just this is like the most elegant looking. Like everything about this is elegance. It's all about projecting the image of elegance. The character designs. The monsters that they fight, the characters look like like this. They're all these like a uh, insanely skinny androgynous. I think they're all referred to as girls in this, but like I don't know if that's if they're uh, maybe it doesn't. I don't even know. It's about a bunch of crystal gems, and hilariously, it uh, advertises itself as for fans of Steven Universe. Even though the literally only similarity to Steven Universe is the fact that it's about a bunch of crystal gems. <laughs> and that, like, uh, it's potentially lesbian? Th that's about it. Um, or maybe not, because the I don't know if the gems are supposed to be gendered in this. But any anyway, um, the story of this manga is that it takes place in, like, a post-apocalyptic world where... Like, thousands of years have passed, humans don't exist anymore, nor are they remembered. The only living creatures on Earth are these crystal gem beings. They're just, like, gems that are alive. They're immortal, they're uh, virtually indestructible insofar as they can be re-put together if they fall apart, because they're just made of crystals, and... Um, they are sort of ranked on hardness. Like, each one has a different level of hardness, which makes them better or worse at fighting. And there is some kind of species that lives on, like, the moon that sends down these weird fucking monsters that are trying to collect the crystal gems. Basically, they want them for their collections because the people who live on the moon just want to collect pretty things. So they're trying to capture these girls and add them to their collection. And the girls are fighting back with, like, swords and fucking crazy shit. Uh, or just, like, their, their bodies... All kinds of stuff. This thing, like, the artwork in this is so, like, interpretive that sometimes I'm not entirely sure, like, what is literally happening. Which is funny because the actual story and dialogue is very straightforward. The main character is Phosphophyllite, and she is, she is, like, the lowest hardness. She's shit at everything. Basically, every other crystal gem has some kind of job. Some of them are watchers, some of them are fighters. Some of them are doctors or this and that, you know, they've all got jobs that are fairly militaristic. It's, it's you know, it's an action series. All the characters are action heroines. They're led by this um, monk dude who they call Sensei, and he basically is the leader of this, this troop. But um, Foss doesn't have a job. She's tried to do every different thing that's available, and she sucks at all of it. So Sensei tells her to try to create a natural history of the world. That's the job he's giving her 
because it'll just keep her out of the way, essentially. And she doesn't want to do it, and basically this entire volume is Foes bitching about how much she doesn't want to do this job and everyone else shitting on her for being useless. I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty repetitive. Like, the dialogue is 100% either people shitting on Foes or her complaining, and like, she doesn't really progress at all as a character in this volume. It's mostly about her getting shit on. However, there's this one gem called Cinnabar, who is sort of cursed in that, like, everything she touches dies or becomes useless, including gems. If she touches a gem, they have to scrape that part of uh, the gem off, and it cannot be reattached. So Cinnabar, um, basically because no one wants to be around her, they've put her on night duty, and she nothing ever happens at night. The enemy never attacks at night, so she just wanders the nights alone, and it's just a lonely, broken girl. And when Foes tries to come to her to ask for information about the world... Then uh, she realizes how lonely she is, and she's like, I promise I'm going to help you. Of course, Cinnabar doesn't believe her, and is completely standoffish about it, and Foes is now like, how do I help this girl? So, like, obviously it's going to be about those two girls becoming friends, uh, you know, Foes trying to help Cinnabar. Um, there's definitely room for a big emotional arc here. Again, I think this volume is pretty fucking repetitive, and, like, I wasn't super engrossed in the story, but the fucking artwork is just so badass, like... Sometimes it takes a second to process. Sometimes I'm not entirely sure what's going on. But, like, just the world and characters. I, I don't even know what I want to show because I don't want to spoil too much. This is definitely... Look at this. Look at this shot. Just look at the composition of this. Of foes just staring into the water and this, this huge... It's just so fucking nice looking. And I'm willing to read more of it, like, for sure. Just so I can see more of this fucking dazzling artwork. Like... Again, it it's the epitome of elegance. It really reminds me of Five Star Stories, uh, if any of you have ever heard of that um, old Mecha series, or like maybe a little bit of Yoshitaka Amino art. Like it's got that kind of that very wispy, thin, elegant feel. I keep saying elegant, but like that's the only word that sticks in my mind. Like the this is uh, if if the world of the Crystal Gems from Steven Universe consisted only of Pearl. That's what this manga would be. Like, this is, like, what I think Pearl thinks uh, gems are and what they're, <laughs> what they're supposed to be. Um, yeah, I mean, the manga is overall, in spite of the artwork being so gorgeous and everything, the story and dialogue is fairly goofy. Like, the characters aren't self-serious or anything, um, except for the ones who are, but, like, it kind of makes fun of them for being that way. Like... Most of the dialogue is more on the funny, light-hearted side. So, you know, while it has moments where it can get a little bit more emotional, it's definitely not, like, a heavy gravity thing. Like, the artwork is way more obtuse than the actual story is. Which I was, you know, worried almost going into this, that the story was going to be, like, not comprehensible. But, no, it's pretty straightforward. Just the art's crazy. And so, um, yeah, I enjoyed it. I had a good time. Like, just, just... What is happening? What is this? This is so fucking cool. So, yeah, I recommend Land of the Luminous, or Lustrous, Land of the Lustrous. If it seems like, if, if this art has entranced you, go check it out. Like, the art's that good the whole time. Um, and, you know, Foes is a relatable character. I think there's some people who will probably like this story more than I do. I only got sick of it because it's so repetitive and because... Um, you also, it's not the easiest to tell all the characters apart, at least for a long while. Like, you really gotta spend time with them before you can tell who's who, since they all look exactly the fucking same, aside from their hair. And, like, you know, in this color shot, it's, you know, they've all got different colored hair. That would make it easy, but when you're reading the damn thing, they've all just got different shades of gray... So it's not uh, not as easy. And a lot of them just kind of flitter through. Like, there's a ton of crystal gems. And only a few of them are, like, major characters. So it can be difficult to keep track of them all. But that aside, still good. Still recommend it. Still going to buy more for the art alone. See you next week! Welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show which is once again finally getting ahead of itself in schedule. Today we'll be talking about Girls Last Tour by Tsukumizu. This is a manga I picked up because I had been recommended this by a couple of people before it even came out in the US, so when it finally dropped I was kind of excited to check it out because it's about two cute girls uh, adventuring through a post-apocalyptic wasteland. 
this sort of thing. And I really like the way their faces are drawn. I like this sort of vacant, uh, wide face, almost like a Yukuri Shite Tene face, if you know what that is. But, like, maybe a little Hitamari sketch. It's definitely some wide face shit. And flipping through, it seemed like it's just an adventure about these two girls uh, who are seemingly the last people left in this world. And uh, that's basically what it is. Now, overall, I wasn't very impressed with this manga. I do think that the artwork is pretty nice. I like the character designs. I like the idea of the setting. And I would kind of describe this as blame, but but like a uh, Inuyasha K version of Blame. Like, it takes place in a very similar kind of world where it's not so much that it's just post-apocalyptic. Um, it also is post-apocalyptic for some kind of future society where there seemingly is just an industrial sprawl that goes on forever in all directions. Like, the main characters seem to be on, like, a surface world, but then they kind of go up another layer, and there's just, like, another world on top of that one. So, yeah, very similar to Blame in that regard, and in how it's just a sparse open wilderness that these characters are traveling through. But whereas Blame is punctuated constantly by highly intense action scenes and incredible violence, um, this manga is more about just these girls having little moments together. But, um, honestly, they're not that interesting of characters. We've got the tall blonde girl who's utterly stupid. Like, that's her thing, is that she's pretty much brain dead. All she thinks about is food. Um, she's a great marksman. She's really strong. But, like, her main thing is that she's hungry all the time. She doesn't think very deeply about things. Then we got the other girl who's the smart one. She can read. She keeps a diary. Uh, mostly plays straight man to the other girl. And... She's not that interesting. Neither one of them is that interesting. Their interactions, um, they don't have like a ton of chemistry together, per se. They're just kind of there. It really just feels like we're stuck with these two girls. I mean, they have some moments where they're cute together. You know? That's nice. There's, there's, uh, there's some moments where the scenery looks really good. These are from Chapter 1. But, like, none of it is unique enough. and None of it is striking enough or creative enough that it really grabs my attention. I will say it started to pick up a little bit towards the back end of the volume when they meet another human and uh, we learn a little bit more about the world because up until that point it really just feels like they're wandering in post-apocalypse and sort of wondering why are we here? What was going on? Uh, I don't know. We're just trying to survive. And you know some of their gimmicks for how they survive are I guess kind of neat but eh. Not really. So when they finally meet another person, uh, the, sh the manga starts to introduce some existentialism where the characters are like wondering about what is the meaning of living in a world like this where there doesn't seem to be anything there. There's no real purpose other than to keep alive. And, you know, the smarter girl starts wondering why bother. Um, to which they meet a character who has a purpose and that he's a map maker. And uh, there's a couple kind of interesting visual moments or like questions about the world that might draw you in a little bit more but personally again I wasn't really feeling this it kind of just made me want to go read blame instead and um or like you know another series about cute girls in a post-apocalyptic setting like I don't know Kurogane communication or something like there's just there's plenty of stories that have this vibe of like combining this sort of slow slice of life -y, contemplative thing with a post-apocalypse setting. I mean, even uh, Yokohama Shopping Log could be considered essentially the same thing, granted with instead of an industrial post-apocalypse, it's a very, um, you know, more about like a vast fields and landscape shots and stuff like that. But this is nowhere near as creative as, you know, the bits of Yokohama Shopping Log that I've read. So I would say... If you look at this and you immediately think, I want that, and the prospect of there being really not much more to it than what you are seeing does not bother you, then go ahead and check it out. Like, if what I've described seems like you'd probably enjoy it anyways, give it a look. But, like, there's not more depth to this than what is apparent on the surface. So... Uh, maybe there is in later books. I would know. I'm probably not going to pick up another volume of this because I wasn't that into it. Um, stick around next week for a manga I actually did like. Yeah!
Welcome once again to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that consistently has more Yuri on it than any other manga review show on the internet. I dare you to challenge that one. Uh, and we're going to talk about After Hours, a Yuri manga that I was really quickly way into. In fact, I just like burned through this volume. Helps that it's, it's pretty fucking thin, but... I get, went through it pretty fast because I was immediately charmed by it. This is a story about these two girls, um, one of whom is 30 and the other who is 24, which has a lot to do with why I enjoyed this because we've got some very adult characters here. Um, it opens with the main character, this blonde girl, going to a club with a friend who quickly abandons her to go out with some guy. And she's not really into the club life. She's not really feeling it. But then this girl comes over, this one, and is, like, just hanging out with her, being kind of flirty and fun, and she just really likes this girl immediately. So they end up going back to her place, and they fuck in Chapter 1. It's fucking great. Uh, and the two of them just kind of start hanging out, and they just seem to click exceedingly well. They really like each other, and, like, their personalities seem to complement each other, it's not entirely clear what she sees in her, but it's very obvious what she sees in her. So, uh, yeah, they hit it off really well. And the, uh, the, the black-haired girl's a DJ. She actually works for the club. And basically she starts getting blonde girl involved in her club activity. <laughs> I didn't think about that phrase before I said it. <laughs> what that usually means when I'm talking about manga, but no, they're going to a club as in a, a nightclub. Um, and she basically tricks Blonde Girl into being a VJ at the club, which she, of course, ends up enjoying a lot. Now, Blonde Girl is basically a an unemployed, um, you know, college... I don't know if she was a dropout. She went to college, but she dropped out of whatever job she was doing. She was, like, in a computer, some kind of computer science work. And uh, she wasn't for her, so she dropped out, and she's just kind of floating through life. DJ Girl, meanwhile, seems to be at least fairly successful for the time being. She's part of this clique, and she's kind of assimilating Blonde Girl into it. And so we mostly see from Blonde Girl's perspective as she gets swept up in this charismatic other girl's uh, life and like ends up becoming a part of her clique, sort of. And, uh, yeah, it's very fast-paced. I mean, I, as I said, they hook up in fucking Chapter 1, and the direction it seems to be heading in is that Blonde Girl is trying to uh, end up moving in with Black Haired Girl, is what she's hoping to do. And as it goes on, we find out some more about their, you know, their histories and what's going on in their lives, and there's definitely a lot of places where conflict can arise between these two. Um, we can, there's a strong possibility Black Haired Girl will get Blonde Haired Girl into something that she might not be comfortable with, or... That Blondie here, who uh, has a secret about her own living situation that is uh, pretty unresolved, is uh, is going to blow up in their faces, possibly. But what interests me the most about this is just the age difference between the characters. It's about a 30-year-old and a 24-year-old, which is a very interesting age difference, because those six years comprise a time between when you are fresh out of college and not sure what you're going to do with your life, to up to... Um, you know, probably having figured things out a little bit. And uh, it's interesting to see those two characters in a relationship, especially because it just reminds me a lot of me and my girlfriend, because I'm 26 and she's 22. She's fresh out of college, well, finishing up college and not sure where she's going from there. I'm in a weird artistic job that I've been roping her into playing a part in and, uh, you know, have my own clique of friends who I do things with. So... Let's just say I was seeing a lot of shades of my relationship in here hooked up really quickly and strangely worked well together to the point of trying to move in extremely fast. This this felt weirdly reflective for me, you know, um, which is especially cool to see in a Yuri manga because, you know, well, if, if, if I'm going to read a romance, it might as well be girls. Like, it doesn't have to be a guy for me to relate to it, so, you know. Um, also, she happens to be a huge music fan with a giant record collection. The artwork's pretty cute. There's, um, there's nudity, but not, you know, like, they never show nipples, but, like, they will show the girls naked. They just don't have nipples, which I'm okay with. I don't need there to be, I don't need there to be nipples for me to appreciate the nudity. I'm just glad that the characters are naked around each other. I appreciate that, you know? 
I just, I'm okay with the implication of fucking. I don't, it doesn't have to be porn. I just want to know that my characters fuck. That's all I want. I just want my characters to fuck and to have, to, to be sexually open and be willing to be naked around each other. Um, so yeah, this is some interesting shit. Uh, I like the dynamic between the characters. I like the really fast pace. It slows down a little towards the back end of the volume as it starts to, like, sort of start hinting at things that are going on in the characters' lives as opposed to just rattling through, like, what's going on as we go. I don't know how long this series is. I suspect it's not too long just because it moves so quickly. I would hope they don't drag it out, like, too much. But I would like to get more into these characters. Like, at first, I was mostly enamored with, like, the facts of what was happening and it's only as it goes on that the characters sort of become more fleshed out and the relationship takes on a little bit more nuance and I'd like to see that uh, continue going forward and to see what kind of troubles might spring up in their relationship but um overall this is really cute really fun and I really like it and I'll definitely be buying volume two and I definitely recommend it if you're a Yuri fan um, it's a bit on the short side but it's only 10 bucks which is like the cheapest that manga is now so that's cool uh, yeah, give it a read if you're looking for some new Yuri with adult characters, goddammit. Hey everybody, welcome once again to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that is about to recommend to you probably the best manga that I've talked about on this show to date, which is Satoshi Kon's Opus. This was an unfinished manga by Satoshi Kon, one of the greatest anime filmmakers, uh, filmmakers period, of all time, known for directing Perfect Blue, Tokyo Godfathers, Millennium Actress, and Paprika, as well as the TV series Paranoia Agent, before his untimely death at like 46 uh, in the late 2000s, which was a pretty upsetting turn of events. But um, in spite of the fact that I have known Satoshi Kon's name for most of the time I've been into anime. He's one of the first filmmakers I ever, like, first directors I learned the name of. You know, he's up with Hayao Miyazaki, um, like, and, like, Hideaki Anno. It's, like, one of the legends that, uh, that, I, that I'd known about since my youth. And in spite of that, and in spite of the fact that after he died, there were all these, like, write-ups about his career, people going through all of his films. Somehow, I had no idea that he was a manga artist before he was a director, until his stuff just started showing up on store shelves in the years following his death. Um, starting with Opus here. Uh, yeah, and so I had known that Satoshi Kon was famous for the fact that his storyboards on his films were like legit manga. Like he would have extremely detailed storyboards that looked like they were like the finished movie just in his own drawings. Um, which, when you read his manga, will not be surprising, because his artwork is fucking fantastic. His characters look as complete and realistic as they do in his films. Like, if you know Satoshi Kon's style as a filmmaker, his manga is the exact same style. The same kind of character designs, the same feel, and the same themes that he would explore in a lot of his work. Um, so, like, his manga is basically just his films before they were films. Um, it's as experimental with the medium, with, like, the, the same kinds of deeply psychological themes, themes of, like, breaking down how a narrative works, how, like, different elements can be moved into each other. Like, everything that's genius about his films is also genius about his manga. My phone is, like... My camera's doing like a weird stuttering, like it's fucking freaking out. I'm gonna reset the clip. Okay, I don't know why the camera's being weird, but if the audio and video seem desynced at parts, that's because the camera's being weird. Anyways, <clears throat> Opus here is a metafictional story about a guy who is drawing a manga and he uh, about psychic detectives. It's like a very this, this came out in the early 90s, and it feels very of its time of, like, what adult contemporary stories was, uh, were. Like, especially more, like, TV drama kind of shit. Um, but, like, you can tell that there's some influence from, like, Akira in here, which, I mean, uh, Satoshi Kon worked with Katsuhiro Otomo a few times on different projects. And, um, like, the way that this story portrays psychics is very much in the vein of Akira, but... Um, this, he's writing this manga about psychics uh, fighting in this, like, grand battle, 
and ultimately one of the main characters is supposed to die while taking out the main villain and that's the story he has planned but he ends up um because the main this main character who's going to die is such a powerful psychic he basically becomes aware of the fact that this is going to happen and drags the author into the story um basically trapping him and then takes the drawing like takes the drawing of the final page and absconds with it and so this becomes a story about the author inside of his own story trying to find this psychic kid get his page back and figure out how to complete this story and upon being confronted with all of his characters and sort of like you know getting to know them and they find out finding out that he's god um this interplay where some of them people are getting dragged in and out of stories and like all this crazy fucking trippy shit's happening in the process of all this he starts to change his opinion towards the story and is trying to figure out how to change the ending because he no longer wants to kill the main character he can't figure out how to end the story so it's basically this crazy ass psychological thrill ride of bouncing in and out of stories of just crazy weird metafictional ideas breaking the fabric of the story and of reality um it goes very far like it doesn't it, it does has no restraint when it comes to this this idea like it does not try to remain like contained within the realms of something kind of reasonable it goes all out on exploring the idea of like breaking a story and and meta and shit like that and it's fucking intense and awesome it's really fucking awesome it's so fucking good um the characters are really entertaining, the different imaginative ways that scenes are handled. Like, for instance, um, a way of sort of going off the grid of the story is that the characters real uh, sort of figure out that anywhere they haven't actually been is not a real place. Because the author has only created the backgrounds that, like, exist within the story. He's, he has not fleshed out the world beyond that. So if they try to, like, leave and go somewhere that's not portrayed in the story, it's not real anymore. Very similar to Dark City. If you've ever seen the movie Dark City, this uh, has a lot in common with that film. Um, both structurally and stylistically, and in terms of, like, the, the meta aspect of it. But, like... Um, again, going much further, much, much faster. Like, this thing just barrels through insane concepts. And in the meantime of telling this story about this author trying to, you know, infiltrating his own story, we also are learning the story that he's writing in the process, which is itself a pretty engaging cop drama psychic story. Like, it seems like... The manga itself would already have been good. Like, if Satoshi Kon had just written this psychic action manga, it would have been a popular psychic action manga. But instead, he's contorted it to just be this inner story within this meta-narrative about a guy trying to write the story itself. Um, which all culminates in the fact that, again, this is unfinished. And because I had known this book was unfinished, I was afraid of buying it for a while. Like, this has been out for a good, solid couple of years, I think. But, um, I was always afraid to pick it up because I had heard it was, like, an unfinished manga. And I, I wasn't sure if it was just going to, like, you know, be like, oh, I'm kind of interested and now it's over. But the thing is, I heard, I overheard people talking about this manga at, like, Crunchyroll Expo or something. I heard some people talking about it, discussing it, and they were telling me about, like, how the fact that it has no ending is kind of thematically relevant because it's about a guy trying to figure out how to end his story. Um, so once I knew that, I picked it up because I was intrigued then. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's fucking cool as shit. But the way it ends, it definitely is, like... Like, it did not intend to suddenly end. This manga was put on the back burner because Satoshi Kon started working on Perfect Blue. He became an anime guy, and I mean, I think he was already slowing down with this. Like, I got the impression he was not putting out a chapter every month, you know? Like, he, he was slowing down because he started working in anime. He was an animator on... Um, Rojin Z, which came out in 1991, he, um, you know, worked on Magnetic Rose, wrote the script for that, he, he worked on a bunch of anime in the early 90s, and eventually ended up becoming the director of Perfect Blue, um, which came out in, I think, 97, 
Um, so, you know, he was, he, he started working on that film and basically didn't have time for the manga. And in the meanwhile, the manga got canceled. And so there's a special bonus chapter in this volume that was apparently found in Satoshi Khan's office after he died. Like they found out that he had written a sort of final chapter of the story, um, that was meant to be like like I guess he was working on it but he never finished this final chapter a lot of it's not inked I can't tell how much of it is intentional because the moment where it stops being inked is where it breaks into another meta level where it's about Satoshi Khan himself explaining why the story couldn't be finished and how he could have finished it in three more chapters but he didn't have the chance because the magazine got cancelled and like it's just him, like, it's another layer of meta on top of all of it. And in spite of the fact that, like, yeah, the story that you're invested in throughout this basically goes incomplete. And I'm kind of okay with that because, again, it is kind of thematically um, relevant. And I have no idea how this could have ended because the farther it goes, the more it just, like, breaks itself. Like, it keeps getting more and more meta and shattering the world further and further to the point that where it was at the end was so confusing that I was like, how can this get wrapped up? And I mean, I'm willing to believe he could have wrapped it up in three more chapters, but and it, it, it's kind of a shame we'll never see that version of the story. But having this version is also kind of interesting. Having a story about a guy not being able to finish his story, which is itself unfinished because the author got busy with other shit and had to go make movies and stuff. So, yeah, it's it's fascinating in that regard, for sure. But, like, what is here is a really compelling story that, again, I think is as powerful as anything Satoshi Khan has made, um, and he's made a bunch of phenomenal films. This one, honestly, this manga almost resonates with me a little bit stronger than most of his films because it's about... Um, an artist and creation and that kind of stuff always gets to me. My favorite kind of fiction is metafiction and stuff about like creators doing stuff. You know, Bakuman's my favorite manga. Shiro Baku is one of my favorite anime. I, I just kind of, I, I like this kind of thing. So um, this very much appeals to me personally. Um, if you're a fan of metafiction and the like, you need to read this. It's one of the best ones that I've read, especially just because it's so stylistically cool. I mean, the fucking artwork is just so striking and badass all throughout. Um, God, parts like this, they're like fighting on the edges of pages and shit. And like you're, you kind of see, like, like I'm looking at this, I'm looking at the pages that they're fighting on, and you don't really learn this part of the story, uh, like the story within the story, until much later in the manga. There's just so many layers of what's going on here. It's fucking crazy. It's something only Satoshi Khan could have made. Um, you know, all of his stuff is basically like this. It's all, like, layers on layers of, like, mental fuckery. And, um, yeah, this one is a little bit more direct than most of his movies. I would say those ones kind of are more atmospheric. This one is more, like, breakneck and intense and, like, uh, and, and, a, and a thrill ride for sure. So, yeah, I highly recommend this book. Pick it up. If you're a fan of Satoshi Khan, you need to read this. If you are a fan of metafiction, you need to read this. Um, and if you're not bothered by reading a great manga that has no ending, which, in fairness, is like 90% of great manga anyways, I recommend picking it up. Um, that's it for this week. See you next week. Welcome back to Manga Mondays once again, the only manga review show that has to be recorded way the hell in advance because sometimes you get these big thick ones and it takes way longer to read, you know, it takes twice as many dumps to get through. Anyways, I'm going to be talking about The Drops of God Volume 1, an omnibus release from Vertical that I had never heard of. I picked this up because there's an anime store in my town called Hammer Girl Anime that has probably the biggest manga selection I've ever seen in person. And they had a bunch of shit I'd just never seen before and I was really curious about, so I went for it. And this one is about wine sommeliers. I think that's how you pronounce it. Psalms? I'll just call them Psalms. It's about wine Psalms. And uh, I was just really curious about it. They only had 
volume one of this and then volume one of like a second series of it, I guess. I don't know if it just like stopped and started again later, if there's a new character or a new plot or something. Um, but this seems like it's not super far into a manga that was designed to go on for a while. So I don't know if they're part of the same series or what. But in any case, this was an interesting read because it's about wine tasting. It's about a main character who his father was a very famous sommelier um, and critic who, uh, is, who, who dies and leaves behind a fortune worth of wine. And the main character, his son, hates wine. He grew up hating Psalms, hating everything about it, because his dad made him do all kinds of weird bullshit as a kid, trying to, like, train him to be a, a wine uh, critic. Which he doesn't really understand that fact. Like, he doesn't know that's why his dad made him do all this stuff. He just really hates wine and hates his dad. But now that his dad's dead, his dad wrote in his will that he wants him to compete with the this guy who's, like, this young Psalm who's like the most famous one in the world right now. And the two of them have to compete for his property and his wine and everything and, uh, and, uh, try to, you know, try to seek out these like 13 legendary wines or some shit. There's a lot going on with the plot, but the main thrust of it is the main character discovering wine, realizing that he's basically a wine prodigy because of all this shit that his dad taught him when he was a kid, and he just has a very, a sort of different outlook on wine, and a different understanding and appreciation for it, and he very quickly falls in love with it once he starts drinking it. Um, and he's teamed up with our sort of everyman main girl, um, depicted here in a beautiful uh, interpretation of wine. We'll get to that in a second. She's a young aspiring Psalm who works at a fancy Italian restaurant and uh, basically the two of them team up on a whirlwind adventure of wine tasting. Now what's particularly surprising about this manga is that it's very fast paced, very fun and engaging and it's structured, it's kind of similar to something like Food Wars. Like this feels like a shonen sports manga in a way, or like a shonen cooking manga. Even though the characters are all adults and wine is obviously an adult drink, it's more subdued, it's more realistic in its character designs, you know. Um, I think a lot of it's going for kind of a Death Note flavor as well. Like the way that the two leads are sort of placed against each other. They're both these beautiful young men who have to compete um, and they have sort of opposite personalities. Our main guy is very straightforward and earnest. The other guy is like a machine of wine tasting who's who does like ridiculous amounts of stuff to like prepare himself to be the perfect wine taster. Um, so putting these two against each other is a very like light and L kind of um, dynamic. Granted that uh, our main character is much more of a nice guy than Light was. But in any case, you know, while it feels... The artwork and the subject matter is more mature. The The thrust of this is, like, extreme wine tasting. You know, it's like all these fucking goofy superpowers, essentially, with relationship to wine, where, like, the main guy is a, a master of decanting, and so, like, he'll pour... He pours a wine into a glass in such a way that alters the taste of the wine, and, like, it goes into so much detail. This is something that, you know, takes the the whole act of being a wine sommelier at complete face value like it's all real it's all exactly as like detailed as they say it is you know they can pick up they can detect the soil used in what year and like all these different flavors and hints and this is just like accepted as the reality of the wine you know <laughs> like this is not just um as uh, as like seen as cartoonish as it is in, in real life um which makes it pretty entertaining. And I mean, the metaphors get pretty out there where like the first time that the main character tries wine, it's because this dude uh, at a bar gives him a taste and he immediately visualizes uh, this. He immediately visualizes himself at a concert. Um, you may recognize the faces here because what he is actually visualizing is Queen, the band Queen. He is visualizing Bohemian Rhapsody in his head after taking a sip of this wine. And he doesn't even identify it at first, but in his conversation with the guy, he's like telling him, 
He's like, oh, I saw some 70s British rock band. And the guy's like, oh, it must have been Queen because that's the way that this wine tastes. And he's like, oh, of course it is Queen. And like, <laughs> that's what this is like. So it's a little fucking over the top. Um, but it's amazing the scenarios that it comes up with to like revolve wine around. Like they come up with some pretty clever shit for like how wine can be the crux of solving a romantic situation or saving someone's business or like just all these little side stories the main characters get involved with and it moves really fast. Like most of this book takes place in like two nights. Um and it's pretty fucking thick as you can see. It's basically it's it's two full volumes I think in this. And um yeah, I was just kind of shocked by how interesting they could make wine tasting without going so ridiculous that it's like I mean it's definitely implausible as fuck but it's it doesn't totally dip into the realm of the absurd you can still get like an adult to read this uh you know like so, like someone who's not a manga person could probably appreciate this um according to the Quotes on the back, It uh, Decanter Magazine called it arguably the most influential wine publication for the past 20 years. Um, this manga was apparently really big in, uh, where, Italy, somewhere? This was big in both, like, Japan and in some European countries who actually give a shit about wine. It took a long time to come out here. I will say of this printing that uh, I think this was an early vertical release, because vertical... These days, their books are very fancy and well put together. This one looks like shit. The typesetting is hideous. I don't know. It looks like it was done in GIMP. Like, <laughs> unironically, it looks like it was done in GIMP. But uh, the typesetting is really ugly. The typeface is really ugly. Translation's fine. But, like, and I mean, there's a lot of detail in the dialogue about wine. Like, it's all real wines, real history of wine. But again, every, like, legend, every, you know, um, almost superstitious aspect of wine is taken completely seriously. It's like, it's like if the mythos surrounding wine was all just absolutely real. Um, which is good. It's an entertaining read. And you can learn a lot about wine. And it made me want wine. This book is the reason, if you listened to Digi and May do Wario World, where I talked about getting really drunk on Italian wine at an Italian restaurant, it was because after reading this, I really wanted to, like, buy expensive wine. Not that it was, like, real expensive wine or anything, but, um, you know, the prices are fucking outrageous of the shit that they drink in this manga. Um, yeah, I mean, I learned a lot about wine culture reading this. Not that, like, I completely can take it all seriously the way that this manga does, but it's definitely entertaining, and if you like alcohol, as I do, and I love wine, then it's a good read. Pretty entertaining in its own right. I don't know if I would read the entire series. Like, by the end of the volume, I definitely felt like I'd gotten the point, I'd gotten most of what I was going to get out of this manga, and I don't know how easy it is to find. Like, if I saw volume two in a store, I might pick it up, just out of curiosity, I could see reading this at a, a really slow pace, you know, just picking up a volume every year or so and reading it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty good. So if it sounds like something you'd enjoy, especially if you know a lot about wine, definitely give this a read and I'm sure it'll be really entertaining. If not, if you're just looking for like a slightly more mature take on the shonen cooking manga formula, this is a good read. Um, and it's interesting because the main characters are not cooking. They're just identifying how great these wines are, which is kind of a unique take on it in itself. Um, it's definitely not quite like anything else I've ever read, even if it's tonally similar. So, yeah. Give it a shot if you find it and you're interested. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show where I don't know what the fuck I just read. <laughs> I just read, um... This manga called Velveteen and Mandala by Jiro Matsumoto. It's a one-volume story. This is one that I picked up once again because I was at the uh, Hammer Girl anime store, had never seen this before in any other place, and I was curious about it. And the cover art is fucking fantastic. We've got these really cool-looking distinctive character designs, this sort of, like, watercolor... Um, artistry the back which is then upside down features the other character in the foreground and we've got cute girls with guns which I'm way into um, then the description on the back 
which says, War looms over everyday life in the capital. Two girls who seek respite in the bucolic outskirts of Suginami Ward learn that a riverside where spirits reside is creeping with rotting anomalies. As the adults prove incapable, youth must take up arms. A sublime mixture of Hayao Miyazaki, Evangelion, and scatology. Out of all of that, the only word that matters is scatology. This is the weirdest fucking thing I've read in quite some time. It's one of the more fucked up manga I've read in quite some time. This was shrink-wrapped, which is part of why I bought it as well, because I was just really curious about uh, an 18-plus manga with such gorgeous art on the cover, and these comparisons, quite lofty, vertical. Um, it's nothing in any way like Hayao Miyazaki, but I understand why they'd, why they'd put that on there, because for some reason in the dialogue, Hayao Miyazaki films are referenced constantly. Um, and the similarity to Evangelion would at most be, if you took that scene where Asuka has been mind-raped and she's just sitting in a, in a bathtub naked in like a blown-out house, and you made a whole manga about that character, like that moment, that's this manga. So basically... The thing about this is it takes it takes about half of this book to even really get a sense of like what's happening because not only is the world that it takes place in really weird and confusing but both of the characters are mentally insane and so their perspective on what's happening is also totally fucking weird and broken so for the first few chapters it just feels like reading an acid trip it just feels like uh, you know, dreams within dreams, and I've got no idea what's going on, but the artwork is fucking gorgeous. I mean, you've got such... Here's a badass image of this girl with the fucking gas mask on and the fucking town burning behind her. We've got shit like... Just, just, there's, there's tons of phenomenal artwork of these two girls out by the riverside. Um, they sleep in a tank, and there's... There's, there's Velveteen and Mandala, the two girls. Velveteen's the blonde. She's the main character. Mandala's the, the black-haired girl. Velveteen is completely insane. She's run away from home and is living in a tank by the river, and she constantly has hallucinations. And she's very violent and angry and just kind of gross and, like, just a, a fucked-up person. And then Mandala is, like, literally mentally retarded. But, like, on a, like, a deep, deep tier, like, not cognizant of, like, she, everything that comes out of her mouth is just random shit. Like, she's just spouting nonsense, making weird faces, uh, repeating the words tape recorder over and over and over again for no apparent reason. She's completely, like, just not right in the head. And as the book goes on, we kind of sort of get a sense of why, but not entirely for each of these characters. We're not, we're not really sure what's led them to this point. We're not really sure why they're both so insane. But it makes it so it's difficult to tell what's real and what's not real in this narrative. Especially because, again, at, at, at times it seems like maybe this is set in our regular world. But then, at other times, it seems as though... There's a giant war going on and zombies everywhere and that this riverbed that she's next to is inhabited by people called deadizens who are just like dead people um, who they have to exterminate for whatever reason. I don't fucking know. I really don't know. Like, I can't parse what's what exactly is real and not real in this. And in the meantime, the events that are happening are just all weird, fucked up stuff. Like, these two girls just basically hang around in the riverbed, and at first they're just kind of, like, shooting BB guns at each other and playing around, and they find a dead body. They light a bunch of shit on fire. Um, there's another... There's, like, a guy who's, like, the leader of the riverbed, and he's just got, like, a, a shitty, junky house. He's always... He never wears pants. There's You see his dick and balls. Um, there's plenty of nudity in this. Plenty of nudity and extreme violence. Uh, that guy, and he's always making, him, all the characters are always making reference to Ghibli movies for no apparent reason. They're, they're just like quoting Ghibli movies or saying the names of Ghibli characters, particularly Miyazaki films. They just reference Miyazaki films out of nowhere all the time for no reason. Also, the uh, Mandala just keeps screaming Gundam at times. She'll just scream Gundam for no reason or Edeon. There's just lots of random references to like anime and shit. 
And um, and even to films, there's one part, there's one part where Mandala. It, it shows like the backstory of these two characters, how they met. Mandela's at school getting bullied by these other girls who are like sticking needles through her hands while fucking with her. And then Velveteen shows up and kind of saves her. And the girls go running off talking about how they're going to go rewatch Cannibal Holocaust. And I was like, what is this world? What is this? And if you've never heard of Cannibal Holocaust, it's one of the most gory and fucked up uh, like exploitation films of all time. Filmed with actual cannibals in, um, in uh, South America. And it was famous for the fact that they, the actors who play, who were killed in the movie were told to lay low after it came out so that it would seem real because it's filmed like a documentary. And um, this worked so well that the director was then, like, inquisition, like, he had to go to court over whether or not these actors actually died. Um, and did end up going to prison because they did actually murder animals in the process of making the film. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> fucked up stuff that a bunch of teenage girls are, like, giddy to go watch in this book. This is, this book is basically, if you took, like, Japanese Z cinema, like, the stuff, the guy who made Machine Girl, like, it feels like the kind of thing he would have made. Somewhere between that and, like, a Scion Sono film, like, or a Takashi Miike film. Like, if you are a fan of that kind of, like, really fucked up, weird Japanese cinema... This is very much in that vein. Like, that's what I would have compared this to. If I was writing this blurb on the back, I would have been like, you know, between a Takashi Miike and a Scion Sono film and a little machine girl, you'll get this. And as it goes, it just keeps getting more fucked because then there's zombies for some reason. There's lots of violence with those. And everything is like, the tone of this book is really weird because everything's kind of played as a joke, but at the same time, it's like not funny you know like it's not it's not played for like a, there's a few scenes that are played for laughs i'm just i just opened up to a page where the main girl is showing her pussy to the zombies to try to lure them over um so that happens there's a part in here where one of the main girls is raped by zombies while taking a shit so there's also a part where she shits and pukes at the same time um that all happens was this book what the fuck was this book like it never starts making sense it never starts feeling deep or something like there's a bunch of random meta references as well where they'll reference the author or like uh, just kind of break the fourth wall for some reason but it none of it seems to be a metaphor for anything it's just a bunch of fucking weird shit happening with gorgeous artwork like ludicrously good artwork really cool character designs um but just a bunch of just weird, raunchy, fucked up stuff going on. So, yeah, like, I mean, I would only recommend this to an audience who heard all that and goes, oh, I want to read that. Otherwise, you're just going to look at this and go, well, that was fucking weird. Now, what what strikes me the most about this, because this is a vertical release, and previously I've talked about vertical's release of uh, the gr A Girl on the Shore, which is also quite fucked. But A Girl on the Shore, um, I was talking about how with that manga, I felt like the reason it was able to get published here and uh, was because of the pretension that they released it with. Where it's a, it's a book about sex, and there's tons and tons of sex between underage characters in that book. Like, graphic sex scenes in that book. But um, they kind of get away with it because it has this deeper message. It's very aloof and like the sex is uh you know usually a negative experience and it's definitely got like an artistic statement to be made and they present it that way they present it as like oh this is a big artistic thing you know and that's how they kind of get away with it with this one i feel like they kind of did that but it's not actually that this time this is schlock like this is there's, there's nothing to this more than scatological insanity. This is just about two insane girls, like, fighting zombies on the riverbed, uh, getting raped and shitting themselves for, like, comedy? Or just, I don't know, I don't know what I'd call it. It definitely isn't, like, dark. It doesn't feel, like, even though the stuff happening is really fucked up, and, like, there's just lines where they just say fucked up shit for no reason, like... All of it's just done with kind of a, a wink and a nod, I guess. 
Like, it's just for, it's just for fucked up people. It's just if you want to read something fucked up, you know, which I know a lot of people who do. I know people who love that kind of cinema. This is that. If you like that shit, you're going to like this. But, but to present it as a sublime mixture of Hayao Miyazaki, Evangelion, and Scatology is just totally disingenuous to me. Nothing about this is like Hayao Miyazaki. They just reference his movies a whole lot, and the artwork's kind of pretty. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if Miyazaki was, like, an artistic influence on Jiro Matsumoto, because he can he draws very lush backgrounds, but his, his stuff's also very, like, um, sketchy and unkempt. It's not nearly as clean as Miyazaki's work. Evangelion, I don't know, it's psychological, so I guess it's an Evangelion thing. Like, this felt more to me like reading Tokyo Akazukin, you know? Like, this was fucked. This was fucked up. It was just fucked up, and that's all there is to it. So, you know, when I look at something like this, what I'm wondering is, like, why does this get to be on a normal store shelf and, like, Metamorphosis doesn't? Like, this is also a, 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 an incredibly fucked up porn story. I haven't actually read this yet, but uh, someone from Faku gave it to me for free at uh, Anime Expo. And I've, I've been told about it, where it's just, like, a really, like, raunchy, fucked up story about a girl, like getting raped by a bunch of dudes and ending up in the gutter, like, dead, or something like that. And, like, I feel like this is tonally similar. Like, the amount, the appeal of it is very similar. This is basically violent pornography. There's no, there's no deeper message here. There's no, like, thing to be gained. So I'm just wondering, and I'm not saying I have a problem with this being sold in stores. I'm just saying, why isn't that also? Like, if, if we can have just insane, violent, pornographic nonsense on store shelves, why does putting more focus on the sex suddenly it just, like, crosses a line somewhere? Oh, we can't sell that at, at, at a fucking regular store because now there's more, there's tits on more than half the pages. You know, like, I mean, there's, a, there's quite a bit of nudity in this. And, you know, a, 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 there's not that much sex. There's maybe, like, five panels worth of, like, sexual, sexual stuff happening. But... Like, uh, you know, what's the difference in intention here? I don't understand. But Vertical somehow keeps getting away with it. And, I mean, I guess I applaud them. I guess I applaud them for getting some fucking shit like this published. Because I don't know who the hell else could have done that or would have wanted to. Um, just keep packaging your shit in, like, a really pristine-looking book. You know, market it for adults. Tell us it's... A, a sublime mixture of Miyazaki, Evangelion, and Scatology. Maybe they're hoping to trick people into thinking this is really deep or something. But, like, I don't know, man. I don't get that sense. I get the sense this was made to be a fucking, to be a fucking thrill ride. Um, not really my thing. I mostly read all the way through it because I love the art. I really thought the character designs were nice. But, um, I'm not so much into, like, shock cinema uh i've seen a lot of it but i'm not a big fan so if you are check it out and i'll see you next week welcome back to manga mondays the only manga review show that's at least a little bit woke to toho i'm reviewing forbidden scrollery the conspicuously inconspicuous toho manga release that came out earlier this year guys toho is suddenly coming to america and it's doing it in the weirdest imaginable way. All of a sudden, all these Toho games are being released on, like, the PS3 and the Switch. Like, one of the main games that's actually out on the Switch is a Toho fighting game of some kind. But none of them are, like, mainline series games. And none of them are, like, massive productions. They're kind of just, like, low-rent, low-budget indie games that for some reason are being sold for frankly outrageous prices on all these consoles. If they were selling these for $10-$15 in the e-store or on Steam, I could see buying them, but like the $40 price tag. So on top of all these random offshoot video games getting brought over, they also are releasing one of the tie-in manga series, which 
is written by the guy who made the games, Zune. These are like official manga, but they don't exactly just tell the story of what's going on in Toho. I mean, in fairness, no part of Toho really does, so in a lot of ways, any entry point is as good as any other. The bulk of what you're gonna learn about Toho is gonna come from researching it. Playing any one game is not gonna be like a good crash course. You're just gonna have to kind of learn everything by consuming as much of it as you can and you know, reading lots of the fan work that sort of fills in the gaps of what isn't addressed in the original content. But anyways, as for this manga itself, it's a pretty fun time. It's about Marisa and Reimu, the two main characters of the Toho universe, sort of getting wrapped up in some random folkloric stories, like random yokai encounters uh, that are related to this girl, an original character from the manga, who uh, collects ancient texts, and some of these texts have begun coming to life and wreaking havoc on the lives of the characters. Like most of Toho, this has way more focus on lore than it does on storytelling or characterization. We aren't really told that much about Marisa or Reimu, we just kind of get the basic gist of their attitude, and we kind of understand what their jobs are, but not really. What the series instead goes super in-depth on is explaining yokai mysteries, explaining the history of each of these folkloric Japanese demons. Or just lingual jokes, lots and lots of lingual jokes, which translate surprisingly well. Also, the artwork is just really solid all the way through. It's very cutesy, but it captures the Toho level of like detail and costuming to an excellent degree. I would say this is a very like moe take on Toho, but I think that's pretty accurate to what Toho is. I don't think anyone would complain with this as the art for a Toho manga, and the original characters are adorable. There's just something really bizarre about seeing a Toho manga get released. The main reason I can imagine people wanting to read this is that they are fans of Toho, yet nowhere on the book does the word Toho come up. You can only find out what Toho is by reading a back of the book blurb about it, explaining what the fuck you just looked at. But it doesn't go into that much detail about anything. This definitely is not trying to indoctrinate you into the world of Toho, it's just trying to sell you a totally random manga from the Toho universe as if it were a standalone story that on your own, you may research and find the hidden depths of. Anyways, that's it for that one. Sorry I sound like shit, I'm just coming down from being sick, but uh, you know, more manga next week. Hey. Hey everybody, welcome once again to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that not only has access to my own manga collection, but the stuff that my girlfriend buys as well. In this case, Genkaku Picasso which uh, I picked up in the store because I'd never seen it before and was flipping through, and I saw this, like, kick-ass um, bondage art, so I immediately suggested it to her, and she picked it up on mostly that basis. But this is a um, a Shonen Jump. It's, it's released as part of the Shonen Jump um, imprint that was originally in Jump Square, which is a monthly version of Shonen Jump that usually has uh, manga with much more detailed artwork, longer chapters since it's monthly, and um, just generally like somewhat more interesting concepts than a lot of what runs in Shonen Jump. Usually these uh, have more detailed like worlds and um, more shit goes on in each chapter and stuff. I like Jump Square a lot. <laughs> that was a period where I, read, I was reading a bunch of shit from that. Stuff like Letter B and I think um, Blue Exorcist comes from there, um, other good stuff. Anyway, this comes from that, and it's about this kid, he's a boy, even though he's, a uh, very effeminate, and in this manga, everyone has, like, big, um, full lips, which is an interesting aspect of the art style, but basically this boy, uh, is always drawing in class, he's kind of a nerdy dude who everyone makes fun of, and they all call him Picasso, because his, uh, he, he, wrote his name the wrong way run one time and it sounded kind of like Picasso and everyone calls him that because he's drawing all the time even though he personally idolizes Leonardo da Vinci and he is drawing by the riverbed one day with the super cute girl in his class who he seems to think of as antagonistic but she like very clearly has a huge crush on him and the two of them randomly get killed in a helicopter crash while they're sitting at the riverside and 
the girl, like, the, the boy, he uh, seems to be fine, but it turns out that what really happened was while they were dying, the girl prayed really hard to God and Buddha. I guess both. Both are involved in the magic of this series. She prayed to God and Buddha to save him, and they agreed that they would save him, but only if um, he would spend his life helping people. And any time he doesn't help people for long enough, he starts rotting, starting from his arm. Um, and she becomes a little angel girl who sits in his shirt pa uh, pocket and, um, like, only he can see her. But she basically advises him and tries to keep him from rotting. So, how does he help people with the power of drawing pictures? Well, because of... Basically, his power allows him to see, like, an aura around people who are troubled. And or, like, sometimes if he runs into them, he'll, 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 he'll suddenly see an image of their heart and he can draw it. In his notebook. And then him and the angel girl can go into the drawing and interact with it. And basically they try to figure out what's wrong with this person and to heal their heart. Usually before they do something really stupid and, uh, and fuck up. And so they kind of have to try to use the artwork to interpret this character's life and figure out what's wrong with them. So it's, it's pretty interesting. And the fact that it's a, it's a really neat concept, um, the way that the hearts are drawn is probably the coolest part where, like, it's these, these really intricate interpretive images that personally remind me more of, like, a Salvador Dali painting than either Picasso or Da Vinci, but, um... Yeah, they're like these weird, trippy images that the characters will then go inside of and try to solve. Which, all of which I like. I think, at first I was a little disappointed that they didn't just look at the picture and try to interpret from that. Um, because it seems like they're just adding in this extra element just to like spice things up and keep it a little bit more exciting and being able to draw more trippy images as opposed to just everyday school life. And, um... That's also why I like it, because it does mix it up, and it's really cool when they go inside these, like, little miniature worlds inside the paintings. Though I do have some issues with it, which is that, um, while the, the angel girl at the beginning of the manga, she's, like, reading psychology textbooks and stuff, and, like, it's, imp or just books in general, and it's implied that she's really into psychology, so I was expecting the way this to go is that Picasso draws someone's heart, they go inside, and she helps him to, like, interpret the, you know, like, interpret the images and figure out the solution. But, really, they usually end up just kind of figuring it out because of the character's dialogue, or, like, they get way too many hints, basically. There's not a lot of actual interpretive reading going on. Um, usually they'll see something and they'll be like, what the fuck is happening in this picture? And then they'll learn something about the character and that will give them context into the picture and then they go, oh, okay, it's probably this. You know, like once we have that context, it's probably this. Um, so it doesn't really feel like there's much extrapolation out of the artwork itself. It's more like, uh, you know, like, the artist thought of a really cool way to draw um, a character's heart, but, like, there's not that detective work that I kind of would have liked. It's more just, like, we figure it out, and then we we see how the image changes uh, once they're done, which, all of which is interesting and neat. It's just not as strong as it could have been as a concept. And also, the other problem I have with it is that what the characters are, like, the results of what's wrong with them, like, their psychological hang-ups, don't always seem to coincide all that much with the psychological hang-ups themselves. For instance, the first chapter, um, the, the, the problem that they're trying to solve, uh, the main, the, the, the guy who they're trying to help, his father has, um... His father, he, he thinks his dad has a shitload of money. And his dad is refusing to pay for him to go to university. And he really wants to go to a university. And he sees it as his dad's just being a dick for no reason. His mom died a couple years ago. Um, he hasn't really spoken to his dad in the last couple years. But he just builds this resentment towards his dad because his dad won't pay for him to go to university. Even though he apparently has a shitload of money. And all of that is, is interpreted into the picture well. But what the result of this is, is that this kid is planning to push someone in front of the train to murder someone in order to piss off his father. 
Like, he doesn't care what it is. He just wants to kill someone so that his father will be upset. And that's his... That's, like... To, I don't see that as something that would happen. Like, it just seems like such an extreme that this kid's like, Oh, daddy won't pay for my college. I'm gonna kill someone. And, like, he doesn't... The thing is, he's a good kid. Like, he's not presented as, like, a spoiled, rotten brat. He's presented as this kid who's who's really hurt inside because his mom died, and he's had to, like, learn to take care of himself. He cooks and stuff and cleans the house, and, like, he's a good kid, but he's so mad about this one thing that he's going to go murder somebody. And I was just kind of like, uh, I don't see the correlation here. Like, why wasn't it something less insane. I don't know if it was just because, you know, it's chapter one and they're trying to have high stakes, so someone's life has to be on the line, but, you know, why wasn't he just planning to cut himself or even kill himself to piss off his dad? Like, I just can't see somebody killing somebody in this circumstance. And this wasn't the only time that it felt weird. Uh, chapter two, in fact, I think it was chapter two, is equally weird, where there's this beautiful girl in their class, and her picture is of, like, a dead bunny and a baby. And apparently, when she was a baby, she had this pet bunny who died because uh, they weren't giving it enough, like, her mom wasn't giving it water because they had been told not to give it water by the people selling it, which is actually some kind of ploy to keep your rabbits tiny. Um... But the, the, the girl, as a baby, had associated the rabbit's death with the vegetables they were feeding it. And so she has, for her whole life, without even realizing it, has a fear of vegetables because she just, like, has a negative association with them. And as a result, she's been, like, anemic as an adult. Like, she's always passing out randomly because she doesn't eat vegetables. Um... Like, what? <laughs> you know? And again, like, the artistic interpretation is cool... The way it's all presented is interesting. I love the concept. I mean, there's this this fucking rabbit full of holes that like creepily turns towards them. The artwork looks really good. But then it's just like the logical leap of why this is what they would experience psychologically is always a little bit what, you know? So overall, it's an interesting manga. It only has three volumes. Um, I don't know if that's because it got canceled or if it actually like concludes. This is the only one I've seen before, so I'd be interested in reading the rest. I don't know if I'd pay for it. Maybe she will if uh, she likes this. She hasn't read it yet. But, um, you know, uh, it's interesting, and I like the concept, and I could easily read a bunch of it. It feels a lot like reading, like, early Bleach or something, you know, like a more creative uh, version of the same kind of thing. It's sort of a monster of the week, help out random people kind of manga. And as that, it's fine. The characters are likable enough. Um, the character designs are really interesting just because they're not... They're, they're all, like... You know, they're all, like, very realistic-looking people but with fucking huge lips for some reason. But, um... I wouldn't say it's, like... I would, I would say the character design is the weakest point of the artwork, which is, like, you know, well-detailed but just not that memorable in the character design front. But the images that uh, are drawn by the character are very memorable. But... Yeah, I don't know. I'd be interested to read more, but I don't necessarily rec recommend it. I certainly wouldn't recommend it as a purchase. Maybe if you are giving it to someone younger. Like, I could easily see a younger me thinking this was really, really cool. Um, but, you know, ultimately it wouldn't be something that, like, stood out for me as, like, one of the shonen manga I would still go back to as an adult. It's cool, though. Um, so, you know, whatever. See you in the next one. Hey everybody, welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that occasionally covers something that looks like it might be relevant or popular in the near future. I'm talking about that time I got reincarnated as a slime. A manga which was uh, surprisingly relevant because by pure coincidence, I bought this manga on the same day that I bought Dragon Quest Builders, which is where, you know, slimes come from Dragon Quest, so yeah, anyway, irrelevant. This manga uh, is an adaptation of a light novel, which gave me a lot of hesitance in picking it up at first, because not only do I generally have a negative opinion of most light novels uh, these days, especially these, like, meta, going-to-another-world light novels, but also because generally manga based on other things tend to be shit. It's very rare that you get a manga that's based on a light novel 
that's as good as the light novel or as the anime adaptation, and it's rare that you get a you know a manga based on an anime that's any good uh, either. But I figured there's no way I'll ever read this light novel, and there's not an anime yet, and the book looks really nice. Like, I love the cover art, I love the blue wraparound aesthetic of it, it looks cool, it's a little thicker than normal, um, it just felt like such a, a well-treated release that I wanted to, I wanted to scope it out, and I, this seems like something that could easily become popular, you know, so I figured I'd, I'd have the up and up on the memes for once. But anyways... Most importantly, though, it's a fucking story about a guy who turns into a slime. The main character is a slime, which I thought was a cool enough idea that it'd be worth checking out. Um, so I picked it up. Now, uh, the best thing about this story is that, of course, the main character is a slime. Uh, it's about a 30-something-year-old businessman, a Japanese businessman, who gets stabbed in the street one day while protecting one of his co-workers... And he gets reincarnated in a fantasy world, like just a generic fantasy world, as a slime. Um, and he he comes to consciousness in a cave. He has no sight. He has no... He's just a slime. However, when he was in the process of dying, whatever force, uh, which is referred to as the sage, and it seems to have the voice of his computer, that's brought him into this world, um, gives him all these special powers. Like, he comes into this world with, like... Whatever he's thinking about as he's dying is essentially interpreted into giving him powers that work in this world. Um, and then when he wakes up in the cave, he meets a gigantic dragon. Because it turns out he's been awakened inside of a cave where, like, the big evil, you know, king of dragons has been entombed for the last 500 years. Um, and the dragon's bored because it's been trapped in this cave for a long time. So he decides to team up with the slime, and the slime consumes the dragon entirely, because that's one of his powers. He can just, like, consume things and then gain their powers. Now, what this setup has done is immediately done the light novel thing of giving us the most overpowered main character imaginable. Like, yeah, the joke is that he's a slime, which is the weakest monster in Dragon Quest, but, um, he's not. He's not a super weak monster. He's the strongest monster. Immediately. He comes to this world. Not only are the powers that he gets from the computer insanely powerful, because he gains, you know, he can eat anything, essentially, and gain its power, but then he also, the first thing he eats is, like, the most powerful dragon. So he's got, like, an insane amount of magical aura. Um, he's basically the king of all monsters at this point. So he leaves the cave, and the first uh, thing he does is he comes upon a goblin village, and he rescues, basically the goblin village is being attacked by these dire wolves. He rescues the goblin village from the dire wolves. They all pledge loyalty to him. And then um, they're seeking out a blacksmith. So he goes to this like this, this city and um, tracks down a dwarven blacksmith who's going to come back with them, essentially. That, that, that's the main thrust of what happens in the course of this uh, book. It doesn't get that far in the overarching narrative, um, near as I can tell. But, uh, yeah, the... The thing is that, again, like, we immediately are in a super, super overpowered hero who can solve all of this world's problems, even though he doesn't come from there. And granted, it's done in a somewhat unique way. I mean, I like that he's a, he's a fucking slime. He's a cute little slime. That's cool. Um, but in the opening pages, there's a cold open where they show this, uh, this cute blue-haired girl who it, it we literally like see the slime transforming into her in the opening pages it's foreshadowing for where the story is eventually going to go so at some point slime is not going to be a slime anymore it's going to be a cute girl and um it's actually interesting to, to realize why they put the this this flash forward in there because there, uh, the the, sh the most shocking thing about this book is that there are no cute girls for most of it that's the one thing I could kind of give it, was that even though we've got an insanely overpowered protagonist who comes to this world, he does not immediately have a heroine fawning over him or anything like that. And he's an older guy, so there's that at least. But of course it's doing the thing where he's aware of all the cliches of the world around him, so he's kind of like, you know, having an easy time making sense of it all because it's just a video game world. Um, uh, but, yeah, granted, like... 
there are female characters. There's like some female goblins. Towards the back end of the book, there's a part where they go to like a cabaret club, and we get um, probably my favorite image in this manga. So there, there's, it's not that there's no women drawn in it whatsoever, but a bulk of the manga, like the whole first chapter is mostly just this slime and this dragon. Um, and then, you know, he meets a bunch of goblins and stuff like that. Funnily enough, this is addressed in the afterword of the book. The author states that um, when they were converting it to manga, they had two big concerns. The first is that in the early part of um, him being a slime, he can't see, and he only slowly gains senses, which is represented... Uh, thusly, and their other problem was that there's no cute girls, so they weren't sure if it would actually sell. Um, and the only thing that gave them confidence that it might work is that they drew the slime kind of adorable. But they make, like, a real effort to advertise the fact that there will be cute girls later. Like, there's this whole little afterward part where it's the characters are celebrating the release of the book, but they're all like, oh, but there's no... There's, like, no uh, attractive characters, and they're foreshadowing, like, oh, but don't worry, there will be attractive characters soon. And I'm like, guys, calm, guys, the fact that there were no attractive characters was the most interesting thing about this manga. The fact that this was just about a slime and a bunch of monsters hanging out was the best thing it had going for it. It was the most different thing. It was the most interesting thing. I just wanted to watch a story about a slime talking to monsters. The, the foreshadowing that it's going to become some, like a light novel is exactly what turns me away from wanting to have another volume. Like, this girl on the cover is the legendary hero who, uh, who had... In sealed the dragon um, hundreds of years ago. We only really get mention of her. The dragon keeps talking about how beautiful she is. And uh, towards the end, we see her in a prophecy that uh, some girl has about the slime. So, like, she hasn't really made an appearance in the manga yet. And it's like, as soon as she does, she's going to be the heroine. Like, they've pretty much stated that in here. Like, it's like they're so afraid of doing something different that th that it's ruining itself by like, the, being different would be the only thing that I would want from this. But no, it has to be the same as everything else. So let's drag as many beautiful people into this story as we possibly can. But, um, you know, narratively, it's hard to get that invested because there's really no stakes. The slime is just so insanely OP. Um, you know, I can't actually tell where the camera is I'm supposed to be looking at. I'm on a new phone. Is this the camera? Is that, is that, okay, I think this is the camera. Yeah, I've been looking at the wrong place. I'm looking at where the camera is on the other camera. Anyway, um, yeah, it was hard to get that invested, and, like, the artwork is fine, but not very standout, you know? It just kind of looks like generic fantasy art. I mean, it's fine, but, uh, there's one moment in this that I did really enjoy, which is after um, Rimuru, the slime, takes over the, uh, like, he beats these dire wolves and he, he becomes the leader of the goblin village. And all the goblins are like these tiny little uh, shitty goblins uh, who are super weak. Afterwards, he decides to give them all names just because he thinks it would be more convenient, not realizing that giving a monster a name is a magical act that uses a shitload of magical energy and um, will evolve them. So he passes out from using so much magic, wakes up days later, and all of the goblins are, like, insanely buff, awesome, uh, like, masculine dudes or hot chicks, and, um, they're all, like, way more competent, competent and strong. The dire wolves are, like, fucking huge, epic badasses and stuff. That part I thought was funny and clever. It was a good use of the idea of this magical world, but that's really it. Like, everything else is pretty standard. He fights a bunch of stuff uses a bunch of powers, does a bunch of shit you're expecting him to do, um, and then it's over. And there is a lot of, like, bonus content, though. Like, there's this whole section in the back where it goes through, like, pages of just the dragon telling its version of events that happened in the book. Like, going through the entire book from the dragon's perspective. Because the dragon is just inside of Rimuru, and it doesn't talk throughout the series. It's just in there, um, observing because it was bored and it's just having fun watching this. And at first, I, I read the first bit of this, and at, at first I thought it was kind of funny, like, 
just seeing the dragon's like take on the opening scene. But then once I realized that the entire thing was literally just a dragon going through all the events and like summarizing them, I just kind of got bored of it. But I mean, it's interesting that they even put this in here. I've never seen something like this in a manga release before. Then there's like, you know, that bonus page I showed you before, the afterword, some bonus illustrations. Like they really put a lot of love into this particular release. Um, and the light novel itself is coming out in December, but honestly, it's just too much of a light novel adaptation. It's too close to exactly what I was afraid it would be. You know, I picked this up mostly because there was nothing else new at Barnes & Noble that I wanted, and, um, you know, I've been picking up some subsequent volumes of stuff here and there. Uh, I haven't really been, you know, I've, st I've still been wanting to do, like, new manga each week. Maybe eventually I'll start covering some, sh like, volume twos and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, there was nothing else. So I picked this up, and ultimately, it was exactly what I expected. I was kind of hoping it would be a little bit, I was hoping for something a little more fresh. But I didn't get that. I got what it looked like. And that's neither good nor bad. It's okay. It's average. If it sounds like something you will enjoy, you probably will. If it sounds like something you you look at and you go, eh, that sounds like another one of those. Yeah, you're basically right. It's another one of those. So, uh, yeah, that's all. See you next week. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that is finally, at long last, after like half a year, more than half, half of, something like half a year of Manga Mondays, I'm going to start talking about manga I already owned. So far, this show has always been about either manga I just purchased or ones I literally went out um, and bought during the course of the show. Um, you know, they were all new, usually stuff that had just been released. Um, occasionally, I would bring in something that was older, but, like, I'd never heard of it, like The Drops of God recently. Uh, but most of it's been newer stuff that's gone on sale in the time since I started the show. Uh, but... There hasn't been a lot of new releases that I've been interested in lately, resulting in me reading stuff like the slime manga, and so while I'm waiting for some more new releases, or to take a trip to a store other than Barnes & Noble, um, I figured I'd finally dive into my fucking collection and start reading shit that I've had sitting there the entire time. Um, which, it, it feels slightly weird for me, because I kind of see Manga Mondays as a bit of a buyer's guide. It seems like people somewhat use it that way. I think most people use it more as a what-should-I-go-watch-online guide, uh, or read online. But, like, some people do actually buy manga based on this show. So I kind of like to keep it in the realm of stuff that's easily available, um, and also which doesn't already have eight volumes out. And I'm just talking about volume one, because it's the only one I own. But, you know, whatever. We're going to get into it with Biomega. This is a manga from Tsutomu Nihei, who I have been a fan of for a very long time, and he's gotten much more popular in the last few years. He was originally known for the manga series Blame, which I believe is 10 volumes. It's about a guy wandering silently through a cyberpunk uh, world where he fucking shoots lots of monsters. And <laughs> it's really violent and mostly action with very little dialogue. You can charge through volumes of blame really fast. And it had kind of a cult following. But um the next thing of his to get released here, Biomega, I never really heard anybody talk about this manga. And it feels like it kind of got leapt over because his next thing, Knights of Sidonia, got popular because it had an anime adaptation. Um, and then Blame got adapted into a movie by, uh, um, you know, Polygon recently. I believe Netflix may have even sponsored that movie. Um, so, you know, there's been, there's been more attention to some of his other properties. And Biomega, it's kind of a shame this got skipped over, because in a lot of ways, it's like the coolest Tsutomu Nihei manga. Like, Blame has the I think a lot of what makes people love blame is the feeling of like isolation and this weird mysterious world that the series takes place in um but like the bulk of the series is a bunch of crazy action scenes big explosive uh you know altercations between a guy and a bunch of monsters and Biomega does the action scenes much better I think than blame um this is the manga equivalent of the movie Dread 3D if you like the movie Dread 3D, this is the manga version. Not story-wise, but content-wise, in terms of what you're seeing. Um, I would also compare it to Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, it's a manga that is light on dialogue, 
heavy on action, heavy on crazy, brick shitting, intense action that is just constantly happening. Every chapter, and the chapter's only 20 pages with almost no dialogue. So you can read a chapter in about 12 seconds, and um, it's just something crazy and awesome happening every page. Like, here's, look, we're like right at the start. This dude's driving a motorcycle, um, and there's these fucking zombies, and there's a girl, and it's like, oh shit, and he fucking hits the girl and fucking breaks her into pieces, and then the fucking zombies are attacking, and he blows up all their heads with his fucking crazy exploding gun bullets, and like, it's, there, you see how little dialogue there is here? This is just people killing each other, like, page after page, and it gets progressively more insane as it goes along until we get to the point by the end of volume one where a guy is using a high-powered sniper rifle to shoot like weapons of mass destruction out of the sky by the end of volume one <laughs> you know like that's some shit you see at the end of a movie uh, and it's happening at the end of act one of this thing um one of the major characters is a talking bear um no explanation given as to why there is a talking bear but uh our, our main characters are a dude, a dude, um, here's the talking bear with a gun. The main characters are a dude who comes into town, uh, into this, like, locked down city on a motorcycle. The motorcycle has an AI inside of it that he talks to, um, and they're here, it's a city full of, like, weird zombies, and they have to get this girl who's got, like, the virus, but she can't, but she has normal characteristics and she can't die. And they need to get her out of this city. Um, and everything else can go. <laughs> everything else can be destroyed, everyone else can be killed, and will. Um, but there's this talking bear who's protecting the girl. I don't know why. No one knows why. It doesn't matter. There's a talking bear. That's a thing in this world. Um... And then they're, they're basically competing with this rival organization who has all these fucking badass, like, robot monster dudes working for them. You can see them exchanging, uh, exchanging gunfire. Everyone looks cool as shit. Like, hold on, I want to find a good picture. Here we go. Here's the guy. Yeah, that's the enemy guys. And they're fucking... They look like they are from Bloodborne. Like, in fact, every, everybody in this looks like... This looks like a cyberpunk Bloodborne. Almost. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's just crazy. Oh shit, look at this. Hold on. Look at this fucking image. Hell yeah. I'm sp kind of spoiling this, but like, it's like that on every page. You know, like, it's just constantly, like, explosions or a cool cinematic shot or someone getting, like, fucking gruesomely gored and, uh, and then you just keep moving. Um, most of the manga that I review on this show takes me about, uh, like, three days to a week to read, depending on the size of the book. Maybe more than a week if it's really big, because I read almost exclusively on the toilet. Um, this was in my bathroom for, like, 24 hours. Like, I read this in the span of two or three poops, and it was done. Which is, incidentally, why I never bought a, another volume of this. So at the time this came out, this was on the Viz Signature line, which was their basically bigger, fancier, nicer printing, more adult stories book line, where each book was the whopping price of $12.99. Now, at the time, the average price of manga was $10, and I was a teenager, and I was like, no, I'm not paying $13 per volume, um, especially when I read this in 15 minutes, and, like... While everything that happens in it is badass, it doesn't have much gravity to it. And I think that's the problem with Biomega, and really with all of Tsutomu Nihei's work, is that it's kind of too fast for manga. Like, I think that each image in itself is really cool, but you're not going to linger on it for that long, because you can get, you get it, you look at it, you get the image, and you go, oh, cool, and then you go to the next image, and you go, oh, cool, but there's no time for it to sink in. And I feel like the way that his stories are told, the imagery that they have, is better suited to film. Like, if each of these images moved for a second, and had, you know, music or sound behind it, it would just have that much more impact. You've got these crazy action scenes, but you're, like, reading a sound effect that says, ba-boom, you know, as opposed to 
actually hearing an explosion when this stuff happens. So even though it looks like the most badass action scene of all time, it doesn't have the gratification you would get from actually watching Dread 3D or, you know, uh, Mad Max Fury Road. I think that, I think Tsutomu Nihei is as good at crafting images as the directors of those films, as anyone who, who worked on those. Like, look at this, look at this insanity there of them, him, him helping this bear onto his motorcycle while they're flying by the moonlight and then they're like this is the next page they're driving past the building that they've just burned on fire like imagine how cool this would be animated but like i don't want them to make an anime out of it because i know it's going to be cg because there's no way they can afford to make a 2d animated series or feature out of this like it's way too active it would have to be animated constantly every image is super detailed i wish it was a live action film look at how cool this fucking monster is there's no explanation for this this creature shows up for like one page just to like look cool like they're 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 he's trying to you know get to this girl and then he gets stopped by this weird fucking creature and it just looks at him menacingly and then goes away like every image is awesome but like it doesn't seep in it doesn't have time you know and to me the idea of like buying a you know, spending upwards of $100 on, like, basically one movie, like, th again, this, this, this is like 15 minutes of a film, um, if there was 10 volumes of it, you'd get a full feature, but, you know, it's not even as cool as it would be as a movie, and you just dropped $100 on one movie, you know, like, that's kind of the feel I get from it, so it's like, it's hard for me to justify it just because it's so weightless, it's a bunch of really cool images that do stick with me. Some of the images in there I remember from, you know, reading this in 15 minutes once six years ago. But I don't know. It, it doesn't have the weight. And I think that's why perhaps Blame is more celebrated because Blame gets into your bones a little bit more with the setting and with the, uh, the ideas of the narrative, even though most of it is exactly the same, just a bunch of crazy fights happening. Um, this one feels more like action movie, movie du jour in the plot. Like, the plot is not going to keep your attention. It is actually fairly interesting, um, because it jumps into just apocalyptic shit, like, right off the bat. Like, this volume starts off like, huh, the Earth's a little fucked, and by the end of the volume, the Earth is very fucked. And I guess if there's one thing that made me want to keep reading this, like, um, that I didn't remember from my first read, but I picked up on more this time, is just, like, how fucked things really are. Um, like, I kind of want to see what happens to the Earth in the next volume. If this conflict expands beyond the city that we're uh, driving around in this volume and becomes an entire global conflict, which I can easily see. I can even see it being a conflict across space, because parts of this uh, involve the planet Mars. So that might make it interesting. I am curious enough that I might buy another volume because now that A, I'm an adult with disposable income and B, $13 is the totally normal price of manga now. Uh, in fact, normally it's $14. If I can find these for the listed price, I might pick up another one. Uh, and, you know, I'll let you know how it goes. If I ever finally do a follow-up video where I start reading Volume 2s, I have, you might notice I've got, like, you know, oh, hey, Fire Force. I remember him covering the first two volumes of that, and uh, now he's got four. I wonder what he thinks of Volumes 3 and 4. I haven't read them. I, haven't, I have not kept up with any of the, the second volumes I've bought, but uh, maybe one day I will. Anyway, if you like high flying action you know whether you buy this or not you should absolutely give this a read if you want like again dread 3d in manga form uh that's all for this one catch you next week hey everybody welcome back to manga mondays the only manga review show that's doing something completely different today and uh reviewing two manga at the same time because lately i've been picking up a lot of these like random single volume stories that I don't end up having enough to say about to complete a whole video, but I think are interesting enough to note. Um, although one of them, Blood Last Vampire, I've actually owned for a long time, but uh, only read recently. So first I'm going to talk about King of Wolves. Just picked this up the other day. 
um, pretty much exclusively because of the two names on it, Buronson and Kentaro Miura. Buronson having been the writer of Fist of the North Star, and Kentaro Miura being the artist of Berserk. I had never heard of this. I didn't know the two of them worked together. This came out like slightly before Berserk. It's just a single volume story. They actually did a sequel, but it's never been translated. Um, and uh, it's kind of cool. It's about, um, it's, I mean, it's basically a hyper-masculine action series about a dude with a huge sword, um, carving his way through Mongols, in this case. But the plot is that, uh, the, our main character is a Kengo champion and, like, an archaeologist or a history professor or some shit. He, he does history and Kengo. It kind of blitzes through the, like, the backstory of uh, the character in the early part of this. He's got a really hot girlfriend who he bangs in, like, the first ten pages, which is pretty awesome, quite honestly. Uh, Kentaro Miura can draw some really beautiful women and some really sweet love scenes. I mean, if you've read Berserk... You know that the scene, like, in spite of the sheer amount of rape in Berserk, when Guts and Casca actually have their, like, sentimental love scene, it's quite beautiful. And uh, there's a scene like that in the early part of this, um, with this extremely cute girl, um, who I like a lot. Anyway, so th this is a very much a, like, sex and violence, masculine kind of manga, but, um, but it's not, it's not like overblown it's not quite the level of berserk of like guts and gore you know it's a little bit more subdued than berserk um but basically the main character is studying the silk road and he disappears on the silk road and his girlfriend goes to go look for him she finds a pendant that she had given him somewhere out there and then she gets sucked into a giant vortex in the sky and it sends her back in time to the Mongol Empire. Uh, she's immediately captured by, like, some of Genghis Khan's army men. And they're going to rape her. They prepare to. Um, she gets her shirt torn off and shit. But she does not manage to get raped. I, I will note this fact. <laughs> there is no rape in this book. Only attempted rape. But the girl, um... She is, you know, she's like, well, obviously, my dude probably got, like, sent here or whatever, or I don't know what happened, but I, I'm, you know, she's basically fucked. She's trapped. But, um, the, the guy who wants to rape her is, like, uh, you know, recognizing how strong-willed he is and wanting to get her to, like, want him, he takes her out to a gladiatorial arena, and he's like, I'm gonna make you watch all these, like, slaves kill each other. And, of course, her boyfriend, Kengo Boy, is one of the gladiators, and uh, he's been fighting all these people, but he won't kill anybody because he has modern morals and it doesn't believe in killing. He uses a katana that I guess he just happened to have on him when he got teleported back. He has like a massive katana, like you know, not quite guts level sword, but it's fucking huge. So, uh, let me see if I can find a picture of his fucking huge ass sword. Um, yeah, hold on. Here we go. The big splash cover page. Gigantic fuck-off katana. Um, so he he's there and he's fighting all these dudes and, like, basically they spot each other and they're both trying to figure out how they're going to get out of this situation. But, uh, you know, the main guy is such a great warrior that he kind of starts getting recruited by Genghis Khan and the there's a bunch of plot twists abound from that point forward. The biggest, most important plot twist that I'm going to reveal because it happens about halfway through the book and I don't think... I think it's the main point of interest of this book because otherwise it's just a bunch of dudes fighting each other and, like, you know, a pretty standard, like, um... Not revenge story. I guess a get-back-home story. Fight-your-way-back-home kind of story. Um... The most interesting plot twist is that Genghis Khan is actually Japanese because there's this... Let me look up what the name is. Like, basically, there was this um, infamous warrior from Japan who went missing. Um, Benkei Mus Mushashi Mushashibo. Benkei Musashibo, uh, who was apparently... Um, he's a, he's a popular figure of Japanese folklore, and according to legend, he disappeared 
in like a, a time frame that w like is right before Genghis Khan started his rule. So basically, the the concept of this book is that this famous Japanese folklore character um, fled Japan or was led away from Japan with his right hand man at one point and became Genghis Khan and took over, uh, you know, everything. So. You know, this is one of these... There's, I almost want to consider this a genre of Japan writing stories where they retroactively take credit for every major historical event. Because there's a lot of anime and manga that do this, where, like, uh, for instance, Therma Roma, which is doing it comedically, but it's where Rome's bathhouses were, via time travel, actually inspired by Japan's bathhouses. Um, this is similar. But, um... Yeah, it's it's a it's a pretty fun story. It's very simplistic, very straightforward. It's you know got gorgeous Kentaro Miura art, um, and I would even say that like it's structured better than Berserk usually is because Berserk kind of just like unfolds at its own pace over the course of as many volumes as it fucking wants. Um, Kentaro Miura is definitely more of a visualist than he is a storyteller, in spite of the fact that he's told some incredible stories with Berserk, but never at, in, like, a tight way. Like, Berserk has never been tight. It's, uh, just had lots of interesting ideas. Um, this story is much more tightly constructed, but the ideas are not that interesting. There is a, a plot twist at the end that I was able to guess, because when I was about... 70% of the way through this, I found out it had a sequel, and as soon as I knew that, I immediately guessed the ending, um, and was correct. But yeah, it's, uh, I mean, if you like this kind of thing, if you like historical warriors, if you like Genghis Khan, if you like, uh, the Ben K guy, or, like, just the idea of this goofy-ass history rewrite, um, and also, like, cool samurai dudes fighting each other. This might be worth picking up. It's not super brutal. Like, there's definitely a lot of violence, but it's not like... There's not a lot of blood spray and gore the way that there is in Berserk, usually. Um, so, yeah. Mostly worthwhile just to, you know, acknowledge the collaboration of those two artists and see Kentaro Miura at an early stage in his career, back when he was more about doing hyper-masculine badass shit. Um... So anyway, the other book is Blood the Last Vampire, which is also a book I picked up mostly because of who wrote it, Benkyo Tamaoki. Benkyo Tamaoki created one of my favorite manga of all time, which is uh, uh, Tokyo Akazukin. Tokyo Akazukin is the most fucked up thing that's ever been made. It's about Little Red Riding Hood, who's this little lolly girl who wants Mr. Wolf to come eat her. So she fucks tons of random dudes, and if any of them isn't Mr. Wolf, she violently murders them. Um, with her immortal, crazy body that can do anything. Like, she can, she can, like, open her body in half and eat people. It's like the most weird, trippy, gory, violent, sexual, fucked up thing ever. With this really cool art style that draws dark circles under everybody's eyes, which... The few of you who have actually seen um, my art will know that that's how I draw as well. Um, so I've been a fan of Tamaoki Benko ever since reading Tokyo Kazukin. Which, by the way, the, the actual plot of that manga, totally incomprehensible. But it's really fun. And um, other than that, he's mostly done erotic art. He's done, like, all kinds of porn, often fetish stuff. Um, and apparently some of it's been brought to America, according to the blurb in this. But, like... He's, you know, he's he's known as an erotic artist and for drawing trippy weird shit, but back in 2002, he did a manga for Blood the Last Vampire, not long after the original film. Now, Blood the Last Vampire was one of my first anime, um, so I kind of have a soft spot for it, in spite of the fact that it's a franchise whose existence I don't understand at all. Because no one entry in it is either particularly popular or particularly good. They're all kind of mediocre. But somehow there's a shitload of it, and I don't really get why. And this is no different. Um, while I love Tamaoki Benko's style in general, like, I love images like this, where he draws these, like, Saya as just this very, like, uh, you know, tired looking, angry girl who uh, beats people up. And there's also lots of nudity and um, sexual violence in this manga which is all 
pr pretty cool, honestly. <laughs> and uh, it, it's it's horror themed. It's about like vampires and and like it definitely plays up the sexual element of vampires quite a bit. There's almost not much I can show you out of this because there's so many tits. Like the villain is almost exclusively shown naked. Here we go. Here's a great picture. Like here's where the artwork looks fantastic when he's just doing like a one-off page of Saya looking really nice. However, most of the artwork is janky as fuck. Like, just on average, like, the characters kind of look like shit, and the movement uh, always looks like shit, you know? Um, it's just a weirdly inconsistent uh, manga. Like, most of it looks bad, and occasionally it looks okay. And, like, as much as I love the character designs and the general art style like most of it looks bad and it also takes a long time to pick up and a lot of the dialogue is really weirdly stilted and I almost thought it was the translation just because it was so consistently bad but then like the last couple chapters make way more sense and like Tamoki Benkyo's uh, dialogue has is stilted in the other shit I've read from him as well. Like he's not very good at like making a coherent narrative in the dialogue. Um, there's just like lots of weird phrasing he chooses, or like phrasing that that is more image based than informative almost. Like I don't know how to describe it, but it feels weird. Um, and the story of this is a pretty fucking straightforward horror story. You've got this teenage girl who's dissatisfied with her life or her parent everyone rags on her like basically everyone at school everyone in her family they all shit on her incessantly and she's got rumors about her all the time and she just basically wants to escape and there's this beautiful girl who she's in love with and wants to take her away um that girl of course being a vampire who's leading a, a gang of corruptorins which are the, like the the demon vampire things that that saya fights um, and she's just basically using this girl and everyone else to, to kill people and gain more food. Meanwhile, Saya, who is the vampire slayer, is ha having a very contentious relationship with her handlers and the government people she works with. Um, which is kind of an interesting take I've never seen in another iteration of Blood. Like, in the movie, it's, she's just a warrior. Like, she just works for them and kills corruptorans. In this, uh, they treat her pretty shittily, and she kind of seems to want no part in it, and is, like, almost deliberately doing her job badly because she's sick of working for these people. Um, which all comes to head in the final chapter, which is the only part that is actually in any way interesting, because Saya and... The villain are, like, they're basically identical, and apparently they're both, like, they're both, like, clones from the same DNA of an original vampire, and the the other one tells Saya to eat her so they can become one mind, and she does, and leaves the government. So, like, this ends with her, like, on the run as a psychotic vampire, um, which is a cool way of ending it, but, like, I, I spoiled that for you because this is not worth reading, um, even if you generally like Bloodless Vampire and Tamaoki Benkyo, like, th there's, there's some action scenes that are kind of okay, and some edgy moments, there's some lesbian sex, um, with lots of biting, there's some gore, but, like, all of it's just okay at best, there's nothing in here that's gonna, like, be a huge draw if you're a fan of, like, the genres or anything like that. Like, again, the only thing I really thought was at all interesting was alternate Saya asking Saya to eat her and become a hive mind with her. And, you know, I like I like this brand of edgy, violent shit. I generally like vampires when they're portrayed in more of an edgy, sexual, violent way. Um, but still, it's not that interesting. It's as good as, like, most of the Blood franchise, which is to say not very... Um, like, I'd say Blood Plus is probably the best version, and even that's, like, a 50-episode show that could have been 26 episodes easily. Uh, and it, I think that Blood Plus takes some inspiration from this, like, the way that Saya and the other girl are handled is kind of done in that show as well, but, like, I don't know. Anyway, do I recommend either of these? Like, Blood, only if you're, like like me, weirdly invested in the franchise, which I don't know anyone else who is. Like, I have a, a strange fascination with it just because it was one of my first anime, like, you know, over 15 years ago. And, um, 
and I bought this because it was Tamaoki Benkyo. Like, it's worth it to own it for me just because none of his other shit's available in English. If Tokyo Akazukin was, I'd buy that, but, you know, I got this instead. Uh, this one, I would say, you know, all the stuff I said about it already. Like, if you like the, the genres I specified, check it out. Or if you're just a huge Kentaro Miura fan, you want to see everything he's done. But, um... Neither one is a, star, a sterling recommendation, which is why I threw them both into one video, and I might do this with the next video too, because I have a couple more random weird one-offs that I've bought. So, stay tuned for that, I'll see you next week. Welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show filmed 25 minutes before it's supposed to come out. Today I'm going to be talking about Doro He Doro, which is a manga from Q Hayashida interesting name. This one is very much a like Mad Max-esque uh, post-apocalyptic wasteland kind of series about a bunch of these people who live in this like shithole town that is constantly being invaded by sorcerers from another dimension and these sorcerers come to the city and they just test out their magic on random people usually morphing them into some kind of mutant our main character is an enormous alligator head man who uh, chops people up mostly murder sorcerers for fucking around with the people in the pit uh, you know, him and this, uh, the girl that he travels with are very, very powerful, and they basically just make, like, a, practically a sport out of murdering the random, uh, people who come down into the pit. But there's mysteries abound, as the reptile man does not know how he became the way he is, he's trying to seek the person who did this to him, he's also trying to just, like, figure out if there's a way to revert back to his normal self, and there is a man inside of him, like, in the back of his throat you can see a face of another man, and he doesn't know if that's the the original version of himself he doesn't know if that's the the uh, spellcaster he can't really remember anything so he's looking for answers and meanwhile the spellcasters are sort of enacting a plot to you know kill him because they're worried about losing so many of their guys so uh, this is sort of a it's sort of got an interesting story and mystery developing in the background but for the most part this plays out like a sort of darkly comedic slice of life series set in like a post-apocalyptic wasteland like while there is a plot developing in the background it's got a very laid-back atmosphere and vibe a lot of time is spent with the characters just sort of being themselves and sort of fleshing them out as regular people as opposed to just like their place in the narrative and stuff like that which makes them fairly interesting which is surprising because it's also like a, a pretty gory and violent series. Like, this is definitely the kind of manga where people will die just like that, you know, after getting cut to pieces. But it's usually funny about it and usually like kind of just a goofy time. I mean, I hate to spoil the surprise. If you're already interested in this manga, go read it. But literally the first page is like a dude's head in a reptile man's mouth. So immediately this is like shocking and crazy but also fucking hilarious and i would say that's generally the tone of the entire manga i'm also interested by the fact that q hayashida is apparently a woman and i can't think of many times that i've seen like an incredibly like violent post-apocalypse everyone's wearing like leather and masks kind of manga written by a woman i don't know if that really means anything to anybody i don't know if her being a woman has to do with why it's got such a unique flavor but it definitely doesn't feel like any other post-apocalyptic thing that I've seen, in spite of the fact that it's got, uh, dudes with, like, a fucking literal heart for a mask, like, murdering each other. It's pretty fucking cool. I'm definitely interested in continuing Doro He Doro. This has a shitload of volumes, though. I don't know if I'll ever end up reading the whole thing unless I turn to just reading it online, because there's, like, 21 volumes. They're not easy to come by, necessarily, and they're a little bit on the more expensive side. This one was only $12.99, which is a normal price for manga now. Back when this first came out, the Viz Signature series was considered more expensive. I don't know uh, if they continued to increase the price while they were releasing these over time or what. But in any case, I'm really glad I finally tracked down Volume 1 of this. I found it at like some random store in Boston, and I was excited because I never see Volume 1 around. I know you could probably just buy it online, but that ain't the way I buy manga! But this is definitely even more fun than I expected it to be. So if you like the sound of this if you like the way i've described the atmosphere absolutely give this a read you'll probably love it i mean you could probably tell from the artwork alone if it's going to be your kind of thing um so if if you liked the artwork i showed you go ahead and give this a read it's pretty fucking dope pretty dank 
and uh, I'll see you next week. Hey everybody, welcome once again to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that only half intended to become fixated on single volume stories. Today, not love, but delicious food make me so happy. I actually didn't realize this was a one volume story when I bought it. I thought it was going to be, um, I really thought this was going to be more of a normal manga about like a foodie, like some kind of Jose manga that was, like, obviously actually about love, considering that it's brought up in the title at all. It's not. This is a food manga. Um, and it's also an autobiography. It's a story about this manga author, um, Fumi Yoshinaga, who is an award-winning, uh, yaoi manga artist. She wrote Antique Bakery and Oku, which I had heard of both of those, so I know they're fairly popular yaoi manga. Um, but this is just a story about her life as a hardcore gourmet. She is someone who constantly eats out at really quite fancy restaurants um, and takes other people with her. So each chapter of this is pretty short. I want to say the chapter's only like 10 pages long, but it'll be that she takes another one of her coworkers or friends or somebody else she's involved with out to eat and discuss the food with them, fanboy over it, and then there's sort of a like each chapter will usually like establish the context of why they're going out to eat, then describe the meal in detail and then offer some more context afterwards. Now, I bought this for the obvious reason that I'm a big foodie. I love food quite a lot. I love eating out. Um, but the food is my least favorite aspect of this book. In fact, this is borderline travel literature because all the restaurants are real. And she describes, like, real meals that you can buy at those restaurants. She even gives pricing um, and, like, maps at the end of each chapter. Like, uh... Hold on. Every, at the end of every chapter, there'll be a page that, like, shows you where the restaurant is, uh, like, gives you all of its info, and, like, she explains about how much it costs to eat there. Now, it's possible that the conversion rates were very different when this was written, because this came out in 2005 in Japan, um, but she eats at some pretty expensive restaurants. Like, I want to say the cheapest ones she goes to are, like... 2,500 yen a meal, which by today's conversion rate is like $25. Um, I don't know if that's what it was at the time. Maybe it was closer to like $18 or something, because this was, you know, I remember back when the dollar was worth a lot more than the yen. I don't know what it was in 2005, though. Um, but I'm someone who goes to a lot of restaurants, and I am well willing to pay like $10 to $20 for a meal, but like... She will go much farther above and beyond that, but it's also because she eats a lot more. She'll go there and eat, like, fucking half the menu every time she goes. Um, which, by the way, one of my favorite things about this is that she presents herself as overweight. And, like, here's how she presents herself usually at the start of a chapter. Um, and then once she has her hair and makeup done, she's a completely different person, essentially. And, um... Like, here's her in the same chapter, like, all done up and, and, and pretty. Um, funnily enough, she never looks like she does on the cover here. Like, everyone else looks exactly the same on the cover as they do in the book, um, but she never presents herself that way. She usually presents herself as, like, um, you know, an out-of-shape, almost 40-year-old um, manga artist. It's actually, like, really inconsistent how she portrays herself, like, depending on what style she's supposed to be going for, she'll look totally different. Um, but, uh, and then the other major characters, like, her assistants and, like, publishers or just, like, friends who she hangs out with. <laughs> here's a great, <laughs> here's a great beginning of the chapter image, um, from one of the later chapters. But, yeah. Um, the most interesting part of this is actually all the side characters and her relationships with them, such as her assistant, this guy up top, who she lives with, and the two of them have been working together for a really long time, and they're close, like, family, but they've never had a romantic involvement. Um, you know, like, he's kind of a terrible assistant, but he's, like, 
good at sort of keeping her life together because she's like, you know, a fucking manga artist slob. Um, and uh, they have an interesting relationship. My favorite page in the entire story is a part where she gets drunk and comes home and passes out. And she had been, like, on a... I don't know if she was on a date, but she was, like, really dressed up nice. Like, she'd gone all out on trying to make herself look good. So she passes out on the floor, and he's looking down at her, and he's like, man, she actually looks really good right now. Like, I'm actually feeling some type of way. And then he goes, maybe I should go rub one out. And then he <laughs> goes off and comes back and looks down at her and goes... I'm amazed at how much I don't care anymore. <laughs> and it's by far my favorite page in the entire book. Moments like that make this a fun read. But the middle section of any chapter is just literally describing all of the food in grossly extensive detail. Like, they'll sit down at the table and there'll just be pages of characters taking a bite of the food and then describing, like, oh, the peanut whatever really rolls off of the, the stuff. Like, it melts into each other so perfectly and, oh, I can taste the sorbet on the whatever. Like, just so much of it. And, like, none of these are dishes I've ever had before. Like... They go to a, a huge variety of restaurants, like the first one they go to is like an Italian restaurant, there's French cuisine, there's a bunch of Japanese places of different varieties, there's all kinds of shit, but like, I can't really get an image in my head of what the food looks or tastes like just based on them like, ranting descriptions and drawing pictures, cause like, I've never had any of this food, so it's kind of unrelatable for me. Like, I go into those parts and I'm just like... It sure would be nice if I could eat that stuff, but, like, wh first of all, you can't find most of this shit in America. Like, especially all the Japanese restaurants they go to. At one point, they went to an eel restaurant. Like, a restaurant that's mostly focused on eel, which I was extremely jealous of, because I'm a huge eel guy. Uh, as people will know if you follow my Let's Play show, I'm way into eel, but, you know, that's not a thing here. It's really hard to come across eel in most American cities. And, like, this is a whole restaurant for eel. So, like, much as I'd love to eat there, reading them describe the eel in such exhaustive detail, I was just like, yeah, okay, I get it. I'll bring this with me if I go to Japan, I assure you. But again, like, the lifestyle she leads... It's funny because it's similar to me. Like, I eat out almost every day, but I'm just not willing to go to the same price points that she is because, like, I don't probably make as much money as she does as a relatively popular manga author, you know, with, with weekly series and shit. So, like, in many ways, this felt like what I see my life becoming. Like, if I made maybe... 30% more than I do now, this is what my life's gonna turn into, is me going to, like, ritzy restaurants all the time. And, I mean, the, you know, the food porn drawing-wise is okay. Um, the artwork is pretty, like, I don't know, I like the way she draws characters and expressions and stuff, but it's pretty simple. Like, it's very text-dense. It took me a long time to read this. Like, it took me, I want to say, like, five or six days to get through this thing, which is more than usual for this show, just because there is so much fucking text on the pages. Like, the, even though a chapter is only ten pages long, it takes as long to read, if not longer, than a normal manga chapter. And so there's a shitload of chapters in here. Um, and it got to a point where I started just skipping the food descriptions. Like, I would just skim past those. Because the other stuff's kind of interesting. Like, sometimes her relationships with people are cool. I like the way that she describes people and sort of encapsulates what they're all about in, like, very quick fashion. I'll show you what I mean with a character, um, this girl. Um, th this is a girl who she refers to as, um, <laughs> she refers to as Amesha, or American Car. Um, because she's, her fuel efficiency is extremely bad. She can eat and eat and eat and never get fat. So she's an American car. <laughs> and she's in a constant state of ennui. And that's all explained on just this page. And you get, like, a great sense of the character and their relationship. Um, and they're both, like, huge food. Like, they, she goes out with her and they're both, like, um... 
they eat too much and they kind of get like weird like responses from waitresses based on how much they order and so they're trying to like they go to like this restaurant known for extreme portions like hoping that you know they'll be able to order just one dish and it'll be enough but then it ends up not being enough like the the waitress had kind of convinced them not to get extra and then at the end they obviously want extra so it's like you know there's funny human drama in here but goddamn, sitting through the sheer walls of texts was just a bit too much. So I'm torn about this. I would say that if you are a huge foodie and you like actually go to nice restaurants, this might be worth reading. Or if you just enjoy hearing descriptions of food more than I do, um, it's fairly entertaining just as like a Jose manga. And uh, definitely as a travel guide. Like, if you're in Japan and you're looking to throw down at some restaurants, like in, I'm guessing, Tokyo, wherever the hell this takes place, um, I should probably find that out. But uh, but even then, it might not even be act Like, it might not be helpful anymore because this was written in 2005. So, like, the weirdest thing about this for me is I don't know why this was released. Like, I don't know why this was released in America when it's got so little relevance to in america like most of the food is stuff i've never tasted most of the restaurants are places i will never go um you know uh, maybe it was just released because her manga is popular here but like this has no real relevance to her manga there is one great uh part where there's a gay guy who she knows and she like apologizes to him for the fact that even though her manga are about gay couples they don't really represent gay culture and he's like look if i was he's like yeah i don't i don't care you know um it's a pretty it's a f interesting moment to see that that happen with a with a yaoi writer but um yeah overall it's it's all right I wouldn't, I wouldn't probably, I don't think most people would enjoy this, um, who are watching this show. If you are someone who would enjoy this, you know. You will know based on what I've said. So anyways, uh, that's all for this one. See you next Monday. Welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that occasionally tackles something really questionable so you don't have to. I read volume one of Daigo the Beast, Umehara fighting gamers a massive uh opening volume of the biography of daigo umehara depicted here with the goofiest hair in the fucking world uh, if you don't know who daigo umehara is he is widely considered to be the greatest fighting game player of all time he had the most consecutive tournament wins he was a big time street fighter 2 player had one of the most well probably the most famous um, moment in uh, gaming history uh, let me remember what the fuck it's called they, they mention it of course in here um, the uh, dramatic comeback from the brink or Haisui no Gyakuten which I'm pretty sure is the 13 consecutive counters in uh, Street Fighter 2 um, that is used to win a match which is if you haven't seen that clip it, it is indeed fucking incredible now when I saw this in the store <laughs> My first impression was to have a laugh that they have brought over the Daigo Umahara manga. Um, met then immediately followed by curiosity because Daigo is known for his stoicism. He's known for being a guy who like doesn't talk much and is kind of just a robot who plays video games. Um, he did write a book, a bestseller about his mentality towards like winning, essentially. So, you know, a, a, one of those books, like a motivational book, but, um, he's, he's like not known to be like an audacious personality or to have done many things besides play a lot of fucking fighting games. And, uh, my favorite quote about Daigo Umahara was, um, from, uh, Yahtzee Croshaw's Let's Drown Out series, a Let's Play series where him and his friend would play in a video game mindlessly while having conversations and uh, his friend had said his friend Gabriel said you know one time I was watching an interview with Daigo Umehara and they asked him what's his favorite color and he said brown and that's when I realized that he was a soulless automaton only built to fucking play fighting games and the funny thing about this book is it does not disagree with that notion 
my question picking this up was like how are they going to make the story of a guy getting really good at Street Fighter 2 and beating everybody in the world interesting the answer is that they don't they try and fail miserably um, this is one of the weirder manga I've read just by virtue of how stilted and awkward the fucking story is. That, like, the attempts to build a narrative through line into the career of Daigo fail so badly. And this manga is so bad at focusing on the right details or details that matter. It's so bad at explaining to you why a detail it's focusing on matters that honestly, I feel like this book is intended for people who already know everything about Daigo. Like, there are so many, like, events in this that don't seem to mean anything. That, like, in maybe if you know the whole history, you know that, like, this was a special, pivotal moment. But if so, it's not explained in the book. This book is very light on dialogue. A lot of it is pages that look like this, where it'll just be huge splashes of characters' expressions, which look doofy as fuck. That's the funny thing about this book. The artist is capable of drawing, like, very realistic characters and also uh, complete recreations of any, like, Capcom character. Like... The drawings of the Capcom characters look fucking fantastic, and they all look exactly like they do in the game. You know, they're, they're like, look at this shit. This looks really good, you know? But the expressions on the faces of characters, especially the realistic characters, are just, look, look, this is a whole page of just guys stoically looking at video games. And that's, like, most of the book. There are so many shots of, like, dude walking into arcade, looking around, seeing another guy, sitting down, they fight. And, like, no, no expressions at all. Or corny ones that there are. Almost all of the expressions that do get shown, aside from neutral, are people making, like, a snotty shithead face. Um, and it takes so long to get anywhere. This book... There's so little dialogue in it, and so little happens in it, that I powered through this in, like, half an hour. Like, I just wanted to know where the fuck it was going. Because it, it opens up with, like, narration, like, explaining what esports are, explaining fighting games, explaining the career of Daigo, and then it jumps into the story of this guy, Shinya Otsuki, uh, no, o Onuki. Shinya Onuki, who would later become a big rival to Daigo. And the bulk of this book is from his perspective, following his character. Daigo doesn't even speak until more than halfway through this thing. Like, he shows up plenty, never speaks. And every time he does speak, it's like for one line to say some, like, huge bomb. Like, like pretty much all of it's, like, stuff that has been confirmed that he has said, you know? Like... Both of them are consultants on this, by the way. Daigo was a was um, the editorial supervisor, and uh, Onuki also supervised it. Which is funny, because his character comes off as a total cunt. So the character we follow, Onuki, is basically a pseudo-normie um, high schooler. He was 15 at the start of the manga. And he loves going to arcades and playing fighting games, but he also hangs out with his friends, does karaoke, does like normal shit. And um, his arc, which takes a very long time to get moving, is about sort of moving, like taking fighting games more and more seriously. Because at first, he just destroys everybody. Um, he goes to a tournament, wins the Nationals in, um, in I think it was, uh, I don't remember what game he won the Nationals in, because it wasn't Vampire Slayer, because like, or Vampire Hunter Slayer? What is it called in J Japan? Because it's not referred to by what it's fucking... Um, it's not called Night Stalkers or whatever in here. It's called Vampire whatever. Um, anyways. They, uh... He, he wins a tournament. And, like... This is all presented very matter-of-factly. Like, we see him playing video games. We see him beating other people. We see him win a tournament. And he's kind of, like, upset that nobody there was that strong. But then, when he starts playing the vampire game, and he goes up against Daigo in a tournament, he gets his ass kicked. 
And his attitude about that is like, well, I wasn't trying that hard. You know, like, oh, it's meh, meh, meh. Like, he's, he's always a snooty brat about it. But then there's, like, chapter after chapter of every encounter of Daigo and Onuki having a match and then with the same result. That Onuki is like, oh, well, it would have been better if I, you know, meh, meh, meh. And, like, occasionally they'll stop to talk strategy, which is by far what I wanted to, to know about the most, is, like, tell me the history of the strategies. Tell me the history of, like, you know, what new techniques were brought out. And sometimes it does that, but, like, you know, it, it'll randomly have, like, three pages where they go really in-depth on, like, some tech that was used at the time. But then other times there's just no description. Like, we don't really know why the characters are uh, picking the characters that they're choosing in the games. Um, you know, we don't get a lot of depth on them training. What we do get is lots and lots of shots of just a guy playing a game. Like, tons and tons of drawings of dudes just standing at arcade cabinets playing a game. And sometimes it cuts into the game and shows us, like, the action. But it never gives us, like, a coherent action scene you know it'll just show like a big splash page of characters fighting which looks good but doesn't communicate anything there's no sense of stakes in a fight whenever there is a fight we don't like follow it all the way through we don't like see who's winning who's losing throughout the match usually it's just kind of you know in and out with one exception and it is by far the best moment in the volume which is when onuki and umehara uh have their their big throwdown on a national level where um where akuma he, he's charging up his final attack with akuma and then we get three consecutive two-page spreads one of him getting blasted through the screen the next of his akuma getting blasted by the other akuma and then finally a page of umehara having launched the attack by far the most high impact artwork in here and it's reserved for like this is this is the big moment it's it's the the battle that they were both taking completely seriously that they had both trained for you know that like was was a real like beginning of the next stage of Onuki's life that he's going to he's sort of grown and moved past his like constant um you know insistence that none of this really matters to him but uh, this is how long that takes. And this is how much of it is fucking guys sitting in front of computers. Now here's the weirdest part of this volume. As it's going along, it starts introducing us to this other character, this glasses-wearing nerdy guy who's, I guess, a part of Onuki's friend group, but we never see them interact with each other. And this dude is getting, like, basically at home, his his home life's kind of fucked because his dad really wants him to become, like, a famous businessman or whatever, or want, wants him to join, like, a huge company. Um, and he's sort of falling just short of that um, because, and his dad, of course, blames the fact that he goes to the arcade and plays video games and he's been trying to work on manga. And we get a lot of this guy. There's a lot of scenes of his dad beating up on him, of him having emotional turmoil, like being unsure about what to do in the situation, but it's never explained who he is. It is never explained why we keep cutting to this other guy. Again, this is a case where if you know the history of Daigo Umehara and, you know, and, and all of Street Fighter lore, then you probably know who this guy is, like, why he's relevant to the story, but it's never fucking explained, and it comes up all the time! The whole volume is laced with this dude and, like, his personal drama, which, in all honesty, is more interesting than the actual drama in the story, which is just one conceited asshole losing over and over again to a guy who it doesn't speak, you know? Um, and there's lots of scenes where it'll, like, show a bunch of people together who you can kind of infer are maybe other powerful Street Fighter players that, like, if I knew who they were, I would care, but they don't explain who they are. There's so many just weird pages of characters like looking at each other and and me not really understanding what it's supposed to mean. You know, like sometimes they're just 
they're they're giving each other faces. I'm trying to look for a good example of this, and I literally don't know what is being expressed because the facial expressions are so fucking doofy and weird. Um, here's a great example. Okay. Um, no, wait. I want I want something a few pages back. Like. This guy, this dude with glasses and a beard shows up, and he says, weak, man, and Daigo says, uh, yeah, well, um, and, like, I don't know what this exchange means. There's no context for this. This, this glasses guy, they never establish who he is. He seems, I, I think he might be friends with Umehara, because he's around him, and they trade words. But I, I have no fucking idea. Maybe he's another famous Street Fighter player who I would recognize if I knew who he was. Why is that not explained? Why is there, like, ten pages explaining literally the nature of esports and then none of the details I actually need to comprehend the fucking story? And it's, like, the thing is about this that it's fascinating. Like, it's such a failure to communicate that it drew me in on that basis more so than the actual story. Like, I, I did not care about Onuki or Umehara because I couldn't really track their progress as gamers, and so much of the story was just repetitively going back and forth between Onuki training more and then losing and then going, uh, I don't really care, but then I do care and he trains more and they, they fight and they fight and they fight and they fight and it's like, why didn't you just focus on the few big fights? Why wasn't this, this whole part of like all the same thing happening super condensed into just the highlights, just the moments where they change tech or he has to master a new character? Or he wins a tournament for once. You know, like, why give us so many details that are unnecessary? And why introduce this other character without ever explaining who he is? And then here's the weirdest part still, is that after this big this big final match that I showed you with the, the big super fucking three consecutive two-page spreads, um, where Daigo... Beats Onuki on the biggest stage yet, and Onuki is surprised to find that he thinks he will keep he keep he still cares about the game. It then just suddenly jumps back in time to give us the history of Umehara, how he got to the point that he was at here. So I guess they felt they had to open on the the rivalry because they think that's like the most interesting part. But the rivalry is totally uninteresting because Umehara never even acknowledges Onuki's existence and Onuki's a fucking brat and they're not interesting characters. Now suddenly, like, Umehara, who we didn't know anything about, like, all of a sudden now we're, like, diving into his backstory, we're diving into the backstory of Street Fighter and its popularity, like, how it picked up, who was playing, you know, like, how Umehara got good at the game. Seems like the stuff that it should have opened on. Why muddle the timeline? Which, by the way, it doesn't do a good job of, like, keeping track of. Like, we start when Onuki's 15, and then we just kind of go through all these tournaments, but it doesn't keep reminding us what year it is. And then suddenly it jumps back to 1994, and here's Umehara in 94, and I'm like, wait. We know that, that Onuki's story started in 96. Umehara started in 94. Where is the, like, where were we at the end? You know, how far did we just jump back? Why didn't we start from the earliest point in the story? It's so fucking weird, man. And it's published by Udon, who generally, like, all they publish is, like, Street Fighter crap and, like, the Kill La Kill manga. Like, that's all I know them for. Um, and it, I don't know how much of, like, the stilted weirdness of the dialogue is just because of the translation, or because they're trying to, like, be too literal to events. I just don't know. But, like, a bulk of it is just, like, you know, just, like, big page spreads. So, do not, do not buy this. Even if you love Street Fighter and you love Daigo, I can't imagine you'll get anything out of this. Like, 
you might at best see events which you recognize and be able to go, oh, that's that tournament, but it will not give you a satisfy. like, just go watch whatever footage is out there, like, that will be better than reading this, which offers really, like, nothing, except the scantest of insight into, like, what was going through each character's head, um, which is not much, because they're just fucking playing a fighting game, you know? I, it's, it's, like, it's just the kind of thing where I can imagine how this could have been done well. Like, I can imagine, like, you know, Bakuman turned a couple of guys writing a manga into, like, 20 volumes of high-octane entertainment. And these guys couldn't do that with a game that involves fighting, you know? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. It's weird, and I, I'm... I'm kind of glad I read it just for the sake of knowing about it and knowing how weird it is, but yeah, I would not recommend it to basically anybody except as a curiosity. <sighs> See you next week. Hello and welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that today is talking about not only probably my favorite manga that I've covered on this show so far, but maybe one of my favorite manga of all time. Um, Probably my outright favorite comedy manga that I've read, which is Shortcuts by Usamaru Furia. I had never heard of this. I picked it up just because I happened to see it at the local manga store and kind of blew my mind. This is actually from the same dude who wrote, um, no, it's not in there, uh, who wrote that manga, Genkaku Picasso. This is nothing like that one at all, but uh, it's a gag comedy manga about exploring the Kogal. The Kogal being the uh, the cold girl or cool girl, this um, this sort of construct of a Japanese high school aged girl who's really cool, who is shops in Shibuya, wears high knee socks. And, uh, and, you know, gossips about nothing, and it's just sort of a, sort of presented as, like, just a vapid teenage girl, however, is presented with much reverence in this book, and sort of the, the running joke, the running theme throughout this book is that Kogals are amazing, and everybody loves them, everybody wants to either be one or to fuck one, essentially. It's a very dark comedy. Um, every male in this is presented as a gigantic pervert who wants to fuck Kogals. Um, mostly old dudes. And each strip, basically it, it's in a page by page format where each page is one cut, usually using the same nine panel structure, though it does break structure here and there. I think this image is what got me to, um, to purchase this manga, not even realizing. Like, the last time I purchased a manga because it had a tied up cute girl in it was Kengaku Picasso, and I did not realize it was the same author. Like, I didn't even make this connection until just now. But, um, yeah, basically each page is an individual story, though some of them span multiple pages, some have recurring characters here and there, but most of them are just random one-shots of total insanity. This is one of the more creative manga I've ever read. The, the range of gag styles is massive. Sometimes they're extremely surreal, sometimes they're like sort of a social commentary or political commentary, sometimes they're just off the wall madness, sometimes they're just lazy, like dumb jokes that are just like a character face falls in poop or something, you know, like it really runs the whole gamut but it's very sexually explicit and here let me try to give you a great example of like a standard um, shortcut story oh here we go cut number three while well, we're still in the color pages this is great so um, this little girl makes a gigantic cock out of clay 
and her teacher comes over and says, what are you making? And she says, my dad. The teacher gets hot and bothered, and she's like, whoa, he's that huge? And she says, yep, this is life size. And she's like, huh, maybe I should go uh, talk to him after class. Oh, man, even if he's half that size, it would still be amazing. She shows up to the door. She's, like, fucking sweating and, like, breaking out into, into hives and shit. She shows up, and the dad just literally is shaped like a dick. It's his actual body. That's, like, a standard shortcuts joke. Though that one doesn't even really involve Kogals, uh, whereas most of them do. Um, some of them just break away into random stuff. But, yeah, uh, there's a few recurring characters, like this one girl who's who ends up being roped into becoming a part of a detective agency um, based on the fact that her panties flash sometimes. And so they give her the nickname Panty Flash, hoping that it will stick and therefore she will continue to flash her panties. And uh, she'll show up in other chapters. Sometimes they try to give her different names to like, like at one point they name her uh, Butt Flash, just trying to get her to stop wearing panties. And like all the guys in the detective agency are like drawn hyper realistically, like initial D characters. Um, my favorite recurring character is this this ultra cutesy little girl with giant eyes who is implied to be literally the daughter of Golgo 13. And she is has all the powers of Golgo 13, but everything she does is adorable and cutesy. But she is every bit the badass that Golgo 13 is. Um, yeah, she might be my favorite recurring character. There's just all kinds of madness going on here. Parts are references. Sometimes the structure breaks down entirely. Sometimes there's like advertisements for here this this page is um an ad for how old guys can turn into kogals like it's some kind of tonic that will let you transform into one and then there's a whole like four page storyline about a dad who turns into a kogal and like it's super awkward for the rest of the family um i think it ends up in like him and his son and wife all having, like, a three-way at the end. It's, uh, it's insanity. Here you've got a, a Kogal model kit, if you wanted something like that. There's just, there's all kinds of shit. Some of these, there are certain pages in here that, like, gave me pause. Like, I had to sit there, hold on, I'm trying to find this one. <laughs> Here's a great, uh, there's, like, a Kogal, uh, oh, it's a giant mountain-sized Kogal, um, <laughs> it's the world's largest Kogal. She's just like, oh, there's like a, there's like a bunch of people worshipping her as like an idol. Um, <laughs> okay, I think I, no, I can't find it. There's one, there was one strip in here. Here we go. It's, it's like, it's like a two page thing about these, these, um, these like feudal era Japanese women playing video games. Like they're supposed they're supposed to be kogals of feudal Japan, but um or even earlier I'm not sure which era this is I don't know my Japanese history well enough but um they're they they are playing <laughs> like PS1 games this manga came out in 1998 so they're playing like games that would be relevant at the time of this manga publishing except the games are played with humans like with servants and it's just like representing the games with servants while still telling like a narrative on top of that um it's just so this was such a baffling pair of pages that i had to read it like several times to fully grasp the the, the depth of the joke i was looking at um there's lots of random references and shit like that there's um here here's Here's a good one. This uh, this princess is talking to all these animals and boring them to tears. And um, afterwards they say, It's a miracle. Those savage beasts are bored to death. Listening to her drone on and on. The end. And then they say, Did you like it? And the movie poster is Princess Monotone. Princess Monotone. <laughs> also, the translation of this is really fucking good. They preserved a lot of the original Japanese so that it would... Like, this would be incomprehensible if you tried to, like, localize all of it. Um, it kind of takes it on good faith that you are already uh, uh, deep, deeply ingrained into Japanese culture if you want to understand this. Um, and there is a pretty detailed... Um, 
uh, you know, translator notes at the end of the volume that try to explain some of the more esoteric jokes, as well as an interview with the manga author, which was actually really fascinating because most manga authors do not give the best interviews. They usually give the same few answers. This guy has, like, way more to say about, like, the why and how of his stories coming to be than, than most. Um, I wanted to read a passage... From it because I found this one part really fucking interesting where he just kind of explains the mindset he's taken to uh, expression over time because he started out as a classical artist like he he he'd done manga before like growing up but like he went to college to study stuff like oil painting and dance and he did all these other kinds of uh, like more you know. Um, non-narrative expression and eventually realized that he wanted to move into narrative. I want to read this part. He says, I'd thought that the ability of expression lay in the ambiguity of the abstract, but lately I've come to feel that ambiguity can't be expressed to people and I want all of what I do to be understood by people. With dance or sculpture, the audience perceives part of what the artist attempts to express, but some parts of what the creator wants to express are perceived in different ways, depending on different individuals. This ambiguity might be one of the positive aspects of art, but in the process of creation, I couldn't help thinking, how can I express my thoughts directly as they are? What I put out doesn't get perceived as it is. One method would be, say, with a sculpture hanging on a wall, to hang the piece so that the line of sight of any observer is the same. This would result in the same angle of perception by everyone, but put into practice, everyone still perceives the piece in different ways. That's why even with manga, I don't really like abstract conclusions. I like to decide on a specific conclusion and have everyone understand that ending. And this is how things are done in the manga industry. Nobody goes through these complications. From the beginning, they try to create easily understandable and interesting stories with proper conclusions. Doing things this, doing things this way is normal, and it's only been about a year since I reached this state of mind. I really enjoyed that quote, and I relate to it pretty strongly as somebody who, when I was younger, like, all I wanted to do was to be, like, an artist in the sense of, like, writing writing movies or writing books and stuff like that, and eventually what I came to realize is that I just like people to understand exactly what I mean. That's why I ended up turning to more, like, analytical writing and journalistic writing, because I just want to, like, outright explain to people what I'm thinking and have them get it exactly, as opposed to, you know, a more esoteric thing that, like, people have to, um, you know, interpret and ascribe meaning to, um... If anything, I'm better at divining the meaning that people sort of tried to communicate in their art. And I think I'm a pretty, pretty decent at doing that. But um, yeah, this is a fucking great manga. I really loved it. Definitely one of my favorite comedy manga and one of my favorite manga of all time. There's only two volumes. They've both been released in English in the early 2000s. I don't think they're still in print, but you can get them on Amazon because I checked. I will have Amazon Associates links in the description. If you buy it using those links, I get a kickback of some kind. It doesn't cost anything extra. Um, people have been begging me to make Amazon Associates links for Manga Mondays. I did actually a couple weeks ago, but this is the first one that um, was recorded after that. <laughs> Since I record these way ahead of time. With the exception of today's episode, which was recorded the day it's coming out. Because um, I've been too busy reading anime magazines instead of manga. But anyways, yeah. Highly recommend this if you like if you like dark, raunchy adult comedy that is definitely not politically correct, um, but a lot, but it it is deliberately so. Um, here's a great two page one about a girl who goes to America and when she comes back she um, acts like an American cartoon character. <laughs> Oh my god, so much creativity in here, between all these different comics. Um, yeah, can't wait to read Volume 2. Check it out. Peace. Hey everybody, welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that created a gap in the broadcast, because I also have another show called Animag Weekly, and both of these shows are primarily put together while I'm taking a shit. So, Animag Weekly got into the... The, the Manga Monday is time, and <laughs> Manga Mondays fell behind schedule. So I'm going to make Animag Weekly a bi-weekly show from now on. It'll be Animag bi-weekly. Look forward to that. Anyways, uh, Devilman G. 
is the manga this week. I love Devilman. Devilman is a five volume manga created by Go Nagai in, I believe, the 70s. And Go Nagai, for anyone who doesn't know, is a very, very famous manga author. He's been around for fucking ever. He created like five franchises which have been run into the fucking ground over the last 40 years, such as Devilman. The original run of Devilman is just a five volume complete story about this uh, this high school kid who sort of becomes possessed by the soul of this arch demon um, called Amon, but uh, the, the fusion of the two of them is Devilman. And he has to fight a bunch of other demons who are possessing people's bodies. Eventually it leads to the end of the world. It's fucking insane, it's hyper-violent, it's grotesque, and it is darker than fuck. Because it literally does end with the actual end of the world. Um, in, like, ex extreme detail. Like, the whole last volume is basically everyone on Earth dying. Uh, spoilers for Devilman, but, like, that's the reason you should read it. That's why it's cool. So, going to guys series. I don't know what it is. I don't know if he just ran out of ideas at one point or just is like so obsessed with these ones that he keeps iterating on them. Um, or if it's just that they're so lucrative they can't be not made more of. But like pretty much all of Gona Guy's series like Mazinger and um, Cutie Honey will just keep getting new iterations over and over and over again. A lot of which Gona Guy himself works on. Um, you know, Devilman had several sequels, it had sequel manga, it had sequel anime, it had tons of different tie-in anime series. I mean, the original anime that came out not long after the manga is like a kid's show that has very little to do with the actual feel and tone of the Devilman manga. Um, and then later on, there's like insanely violent 90s OVAs that are like some of the most gruesome shit you can possibly watch. Um... But anyways, one of the more recent ones is Devilman G. This one's written by Go Nagai, but illustrated by Rui Takato, whom you probably don't know, but if you've ever heard of the manga Cynthia the Mission, which I've read, I think, a volume of like 10 years ago. Um, it's, a, it's a really solid action series about this cute little blonde girl who is like an assassin and kills people. And... Um, that's who does the art for this Devilman G. So I don't know how, like, I mean, it says story by Gonagai. I don't know how involved Gonagai was with the story, but essentially this is yet another Devilman retelling. It's five volumes like the original, but it is significantly different in, like, what the the base story is and the the sort of tone and feel of it. So... This time, it's the, the, Akira Fudo, who's the same main character as the original, uh, just kind of is, he's living with this girl who's, like, obsessed with the idea that she's a magician. I'm not sure if she's supposed to be the same girl as the girlfriend from the original. It's been a while since I've read the original Devilman. But, um, basically, this girl thinks she's some kind of, a uh, sorceress. And she's mostly doing it as, like, a meme. Like, she's just trying to be cool. But it turns out that she, uh, she, she's, there, it just so happens that demons are real, and they're coming up from hell en masse and eating people. So all these demons are showing up on Earth and just fucking utterly destroying people here. Let me show you. I don't know how much of this manga I can actually show on camera. Um, here's a scene where this, this really cool looking girl has just um devoured this man leaving his head i'm trying to block out her tits on the uh the next page over but uh it, it's there's demons and they're eating people um this girl becomes involved and she may or may not summon amon into the body of akira fudo and there's sort of a battle of wills going on between amon and akira where amon just wants to eat people and be crazy and be a demon um, but the funny thing about Amon is that he's basically a demon who kills other demons, and it's not really clear why or, like, what his allegiance is. Like, he's not a good guy. He views humans as food, um, but whereas most demons eat each other and, like, morph, like, that's kind of the thing that demons do is they combine with each other. They eat each other so they can gain their powers. Um, Amon does not do that. Amon, he's called Amon the Uneating. He will not eat... Uh, other demons, he just kills them. He's also known as Amon the Brave, but like he just, 
all he does is kill demons, and that's his, his bread and butter, and he's a total dick. Um, whereas Akira was a wimpy little wuss kid who now is acting like a badass. But because Akira still has some hold over the mind, um, Amon can't eat other people, and he has to protect the witch girl. So, yeah, basically, it's, it's a, it's just, that's, that's all you need to know about the premise. This is just insane turbo violence, the manga. It is one of the most violent things I've ever read. Um, on page, like, 10, there's a scene of one, there's a, this harpy woman, the one who I just showed you eating that guy on the bed, who, um, is torn in half by a gigantic turtle monster. And the, there's an image here, her head's been bitten off, her mouth is in, or her, her arm is in the mouth of this monster, and, and it's holding up her torso. It's just got the, the arm in her hand, and her torso is hanging there with all of its intestines hanging out. And meanwhile, uh, the bottom half of her body is being raped by the turtle man, as he says, human or demon, you gotta do them while eating them. You're tasty, such. <laughs> oh, and then her face is, like, screamed out of his back, and he has the faces of all the people he's eaten in his fucking turtle shell. So, yeah, it's insanely violent. You will see people get cut up into pieces, eyeballs flying everywhere, intestines everywhere, super gory, tons of, uh, tons of attempted rape, <laughs> occasional actual rape, um, tits everywhere. The weirdest thing about this... Um, older teen rating, 16 plus. How did this not get a mature rating? Like, it literally, the only things not displayed are dick and pussy. Other than that, like, this is the most violent, macabre thing imaginable. And there's shitloads of nudity. There's tons, there's tits all over the place. Like, I can barely show you anything. But, um, what fascinates me the most about this is that even though this is insanely violent, gortastic, uh, you know, schlock, the artwork is fucking adorable. So, for, the, for if you've ever watched Kill La Kill, and you know Go Nagai, then you know that a lot of the artwork in Kill La Kill is heavily Go Nagai influenced. Like, if you look at, like, Ragyo, or you look at Senketsu, like, they look like they belong in a Gonagai manga. And a lot of the other characters kind of do as well. The funny thing about this is that this looks exactly like Kill La Kill. And it is as expressive in the, faci the facial expressions and, like, the movements of characters. I mean, obviously it's not animated, but, like, the way that characters are portrayed is like a trigger anime. Like, just look at, like, all the different expressions these characters have. Let me try to find more more good stuff. Like, the girls are fucking adorable. And you'll see, like, super cute, super cute girls getting just torn to fucking shreds. Here, hold on. I've got a perfect example. We've got, um, like, here's one page. You got these little cuties standing around, you know, being adorable. And the very next page, one of them is getting cut in half vertically. Uh, right before the others are torn to shreds. Like, he, look, this is on the same page, you know? <laughs> like, they're super cutesy characters with really great, vibrant expressions and lively movement. And, like, it's very cartoony. Um, like, especially as it goes along, it just keeps getting more and more goofy and cartoony while also being insanely hyper-violent. And it's, it's n not quite like anything I've seen before. Like... It, in a way, it, it it does kind of feel like a trigger anime, like a Kill La Kill or, um, you know, a, a Panty and Stocking or something like that. But, like, it's way more intense than those ever are. Like, those never get to the level of, like, eyeballs popping out and, like, a demon raping another demon's body while it eats her. You know, <laughs> like, uh, oh, there was one part where this dude has, like, he's got all these girls, like, half trapped in walls and shit like he's in a room where there'll be like a girl's torso coming out of the wall and she's like melting into the wall and shit like there's so much of people just getting like eaten and and murdered like 
like, casually. Like, the demons, because they don't think anything of humans, so it'll just have them, like, casually ripping people apart and eating them and stuff. It's fucking, it's fucking intense, uh, but it's adorable. I really would love to see, like, Rui Takato do character designs for, like, a TV show or something, because, I mean, the, the character artwork in this is all fantastic, but, uh, you know. Just gotta be ready for the hyper-violence. And personally, I don't I don't entirely know how I feel about it. Like, I, even though I love the way the characters look, I don't want to get invested in them because I know everyone's going to get killed horribly. Like, it's it's not only is that evident in what I'm reading, but I also know it's Devilman, um, where uh, infamously, you know, some of the cute girl characters who you expected to make it through die the hardest, you know, so, like, I have no expectations of anyone living through all of Devilman G, uh, but overall, I'd say I enjoyed it, I would probably read the rest online before I went and bought any more of it, just so I don't end up spending, what was this, $13, you know, spending 70 bucks, uh, to potentially be uh, disappointed if it's not actually as good as Devilman. Like, this does, it definitely doesn't have the weight of the original Devilman. Like, original Devilman opens with, like, almost an entire chapter of just a mon in hell killing demons, and it's the coolest shit ever. And then when the characters, like, describe the, the background narrative of why this is happening, which is done in a lot of exposition dumps, to be fair, but it's pretty interesting. And that was kind of what drew me into Devilman, you know. And then the midsection's kind of whatever, but then there's this epic ending. Um, this one, not so much on the intrigue at the beginning. It's more like wacky hijinks and then insane brutal gore. But, uh, I don't know. I had fun with it. Check it out if you are a gore fiend. Uh, and that's it for this episode. See you next week. Welcome back, everybody, to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that I think is doing its first ever episode by request, because I was sent Solanine, the graphic novel by Inio Asano, uh, by a fan, Wada, who, uh, who's, who does the podcast about my content, the Digi Boys, um, and is also a big patron. Shout out to Wada from Sweden. Sent this book all the way from there. And, uh, you know, I've been meaning to read this for fucking eternity, because this was the first... Inio Asano book I heard of long before I'd ever heard his name. Um, when it came out stateside, I was always curious about it because I really like this cute girl on the cover in the beanie, and I wanted to know about it. And I had heard it was about music and coming of age, and those were things I was really into around the time that this came out, so I was excited about it, but I never got around to reading it, even though I had several big opportunities to do so. Since then, Inio Asano has sort of caught on as a phenomenon, um, in manga fan circles, Oyasumi Poon Poon has been a really big deal. People, it's, it's a lot of people's favorite manga. Um, and it just finished completely releasing Stateside, which, um, temp I want to read it, but God, it's fucking long and expensive. But, um, I previously read and reviewed A Girl on the Shore, which you can see right there. I thought it was pretty good. Um, so here's another graphic novel from him. And I think this was his first one, um, going by the afterword in the back. Now... I'm going to say right off the bat, I was not that into Solanine. I didn't resonate with it that strongly. I wasn't that interested in the story. And I think that has equal parts to do with the story itself and with me. And uh, it has to do with the fact that I was such a big fan of this genre and this type of story. And that I've read so much of it. I've read so many stories about basically the struggle of coming into adulthood as an early millennial. This is, uh, this is very much the story of someone who was entering their 20s in the 2000s. And if you've read other stories like that, of which there were a lot in the 2000s, I think perhaps because this was the first generation where there was, uh, you know, tons and tons of creativity going on. You know, everybody online being able to share their creative output. Just many more opportunities for young people to get into the industry and start making stuff. And since young people tend to, you know, at the time, were sort of suffering this arrested development as the world kind of moved in a direction where it takes longer and longer to really feel like an adult, longer and longer to get out of, you know, living in your parents' houses and stuff like that. There was just a lot of stories about the arrested development of early millennials, you know, people who are now in their, in their late 30s. Um, 
And uh, so I've read a lot of those and seen a lot of those. This is very much in the vein of like a mumblecore movie or something like that. You know, it's it's sort of a, a young adult melodrama. Um, and the problem is I've seen it done better or stories that just resonated with me more strongly. There's a lot you could compare in this to Scott Pilgrim, for instance. Scott Pilgrim being one of my favorite uh, things ever. And as I was reading this, I just kept thinking, like, uh, I'd rather be reading Scott Pilgrim, you know, and, and stuff like that. Like, there's just, there's too many other stories that have been this way. And moreover, I am not in this position anymore. So this is a story about a girl who's a 25-year-old who, uh, at the beginning of the, of the story, she quits her job. She's been working for just like a regular ass office job. She can't stand it. She thinks everybody's a pain in the ass and a bunch of fakes, and she just hates working there. Cause she's a little, she's a little, little bit of, little bit punk rock, you know. Not, not a lot, but just a little bit. She, she's not, not into society, not into people, you know. And she lives with her boyfriend, who she's been dating for six years. Um, he doesn't have a job currently, or he, he works part time for like a design firm, but you know, he's not really a breadwinner. And, um, so he's kind of, you know, loafing around her house, but she's okay with that. She likes taking care of him, seemingly. She does, she's not pressuring him to, to do anything particular, but she is trying to get him to, um, cause he's, he's in a band that's not really been practicing that much. You know, they're kind of, they're kind of at that stage in their career where they're realizing that they couldn't just like hit it off. They couldn't hit it big when they were young and now they're not really sure what they want to do. And she's trying to encourage him to keep going with this band because she sort of vicariously enjoys like watching him, you know, be passionate about something, but she doesn't really have that kind of passion. So most of the story is just kind of meandering through the daily lives of these characters as they, you know, try to grapple with being in their 20s and not knowing where they're going to go with their future. And uh, it's just, it's very direct. Like, characters kind of, like, a lot of their conversations are just about that situation. Like, they, they just literally are discussing not knowing what to do with their future. Very literally discussing, like, you know, their passions and interests and what they want to do and the, the confusion they feel towards their futures. And uh, where the story kind of doesn't work for me is in that it doesn't really flesh out these characters. We learn a lot about them living this this life, but like I never felt like I really cared about them themselves. It felt more like these characters were almost ciphers for the drama. Like they're ciphers for presenting the ideas of how these young people feel. Like they're they exist so we can have a story about how difficult it is to figure out how to become an adult as, you know, as an early millennial growing up in the 2000s. So, you know, I just individually didn't find myself connecting with these characters very much. And the way that this story is, it kind of feels like I would have resonated with this a lot more when I was younger. But now that I'm kind of like an older person who's who really didn't have to give up, you know, who, who actually did succeed at doing what I always wanted to do and sort of becoming an artist. Like, this is the kind of story that's written from the perspective of, like, being unsure about whether you will ever succeed as an artist. And, it, I mean, Inio Asano says in his afterword, um, I drew Solanine when I was about 24 years old. I had just graduated from college and was feeling a bit insecure about my ability to succeed as a manga artist and whether I would be able to continue to draw manga that were true to myself. In my anxiety and impatience, I felt that all I could do in my manga was try to get a true depiction of the times as experienced by my generation. And he goes on about it a little bit, but like, that's exactly what he did. And this is the kind of story that you almost wouldn't be able to write outside of that mindset. Because imagine if he had succeeded as a manga artist, I don't think he would be so quick to write a story about characters sort of giving up, or, or just the ambivalence that is felt at the end of the story where it's not really clear you know, what's going to happen to these characters in the future, but, like, there's never really given the sense that they will continue to be artists or will succeed at that. Um, so, you know, I feel like, for me, as somebody who's already been through this and sort of moved on and gotten past it, uh, I look at these characters and think, like, 
well, you're going to learn a lot when you grow up a couple more years, you know, like not to say that I don't understand and, and have experienced these emotions, but you know, it's sort of old hat to me. Like I, I know these feels, but I'm past them and they're not interesting to me anymore in a way that they once were. Um, you know, I feel like, and I feel like that's, that is both a testament to myself, but also to the story. Because if it had a cast of really well fleshed out characters who I really cared about, then it wouldn't matter what the themes of the story are, you know? I mean, I still watch fucking shitloads of high school anime, and I don't relate to being a high schooler anymore, but usually those are shows where I like the characters, or I like the romance between them, or something. You know, like, there's something that, that grabs my attention. And this book has elements of things I like. I did not dislike this book. I definitely liked the relationship between... Really, all the relationships were the most interesting part. Like, um, the relationship between the main characters... Uh, and the other bandmates, and, like, the, this one guy in the band, him and his girlfriend are pretty interesting characters. I also like wh when this book does sometimes get a little bit weird and off-kilter. There are parts where it just shows you really bizarre images or just gets funny. Like, it just kind of turns into, like, more of a comedy at times. But it doesn't commit to that. Like, it doesn't commit to being, like, a dark comedy. It doesn't commit to, um being weird all the time like the baseline story the emotional moments have the gravity that you would expect from them so you know it was something where every once in a while i'd see a little glimmer of something that i might like but um you know again to compare it to like scott pilgrim which like fully commits to being in this weird kind of alternate universe where all kinds of crazy fun stuff happens and you know in many ways that enhances the emotions of the characters because it it adds that extra layer of sort of abstraction that can give it extra meaning, you know, that this, this book is a little bit more direct. It's pretty in your face. And, uh, I don't know. It struck me as like very normy in a way. Like it, it's just stuff that I feel like any person this age in this generation would connect to and appreciate this. Like, you know, the first chapter is just a 25-year-old girl being like, I'm 25, I hate my job, I really don't like people around me, and I want to quit. And I'm like, literally any 25-year-old girl would probably feel exactly the same, you know? So, it's just, it, I don't know. It just feels a little bit too broad for my taste, is I guess what I'm saying. And I can't help but feel like it's a natural consequence of him being 24 when he wrote the story. Like... I'm 26 now, you know, I'm older than he was when he wrote this. I'm kind of, you know, not only past the emotions the characters are feeling, but past the emotions that he was feeling when he wrote the story. Um, you know, and not to say that, like, that's a linear thing that you'll experience with age. Like, two years is not that huge of a difference. But, like, in this case, it's the crucial two years between he was 24 and wasn't successful yet. I'm 26 and am successful at, you know, whatever artistic career I wanted to pursue. And that makes a huge difference in the way that you perceive the world and, you know, the kind of angst that you're dealing with. So, yeah, I, and I, from here on, I'm going to get into spoilers because I've pretty much said my piece about my general opinions of the book, but there's, there's some stuff I want to touch on. So if you want to read this, if you like Inio Asano, if, if honestly, if this sounds like a story that would interest you, go read it. You'll probably love it. Like this is a very beloved story. I'm not surprised that a lot of people connected with it. And I think there's a chance I would have if I'd read it a few years earlier. Um, but you know, like I also recommend you go read Scott Pilgrim because that's one of my favorite comics. Um, but anyway, getting into spoiler territory. So, the big plot twist of this book is that halfway through, the boyfriend dies. The boyfriend is, he's, he can't figure out what he wants to do with his life. He decides that he's going to try to get a job and do the band at the same time. But, like, it's very clear that he can't he can't quite wrap his mind around, like, being a normal guy. Like, he really hates the idea of living the normie life. He really wants to be a rock star. He really wants to be a musician who, like, just screams his passion out on the stage. And every little compromise away from that hurts him. And so, right after he makes the big decision to, like, get a regular job and try to do music on the side, knowing he's probably not going to be able to, really... Um, he goes on his bike and he's screaming and driving as fast as he can and he gets fucking 
plowed by a truck and dies. Now, the funniest thing to me about that is the fact that I literally came up with this exact same scene that I wanted to do in a movie. I had, for a long time, like many years, I've had this idea of making a, a young adult drama film in which the main character is with, or like a couple of main characters are on bikes together, and one of them is sort of the one who's like the more ambitious guy, and he's he's like giving a speech about all this stuff he wants to do in the future, and then there'd be, there'd be a shot of him riding his bike a little bit further out in front, and then he'd just get owned by a bus. And the rest of the film would completely change because this, the, you know, the central character has died and now everybody has to change the way they think about what their lives are. Literally happens in this book the exact way that I just described it, except he's on a motorbike and it, it's sort of implied that he was maybe trying to kill himself. It's kind of unclear. I, I can't confidently say that he wanted to die at that moment but that he did something reckless you know in a it, he was suicidal enough to do something reckless but it didn't really seem like he was trying to kill himself um it's at least halfway an accident but like it's the same fucking scene that i wanted to put into a story and the story i had in mind was just like this so yeah that was surreal reading something so close to like what i had imagined um, but the way that the story changes after that is kind of interesting, but then it doesn't really go far enough to, to ultimately end up being that impactful, which is that, uh, the girl kind of ends up taking up her, you know, the guy's guitar and joining the band. She decides to fill in his role in the band, um, after a conversation she has with his dad, where he sort of uh, sa says to her, like, that maybe her... Her part in his story was to, like, keep his memory alive or something to that effect. And basically, this just builds up to her um, learning how to play guitar. She goes with the band and they perform live. They perform the songs that she was, like, that she really loved from uh, from him. And uh, that's about it. Like, they, they play the live show and then it's implied that, like, they might keep doing the band, but there's no clear suggestion that they're going to succeed. There's no real suggestion that, like this is going to eventuate in a very clean way. It's just kind of like she joined the band and did some stuff, you know, in, uh, in memory of the guy. But um, I don't really know what it says about her as a character, honestly. Like, it didn't feel to me that we, that she developed a love for music and performing. It was more like she just wanted to do this so that she could preserve the memory of the guy. There's not a sense that she like got way into guitar playing and singing as a result. It's more like she just wanted to, you know, sort of find closure by performing at this show. Um, you know, in the end, it's very ambivalent about what she's going to be doing. She's starting up a new job, you know. It's just basically going back to life as normal now that this is off of her chest. So I didn't really feel like the whole her learning to play guitar and being in the band thing ultimately changed much about the characters or gave me more insight into them as people. It was just kind of a, just kind of a story, you know, just kind of a, a, a way of showing characters dealing with grief. There's some okay scenes in there, but there's also some stuff that's weird. Like, there's one part where she's, like, at the riverbed, um, like, you know, mind swirling with all this music and stuff, and she's got a guitar on her, and this little kid who looks just like her boyfriend who died comes up, and he's, like, uh, asking her what she's doing there. And he asks her to play guitar for him. So she plays for him. And he tells her, like, he's, he's really into it. And then her friend shows up and is like, hey, what's going on? Um, and she's, like, she's, like, half passed out or something like that. Or she's, she's just, like, in a haze. And then she's like, what happened to that little boy? And she's like, huh? There was no little boy here. And I, at that moment, I had to think, okay, how am I meant to read this moment because one of two things had to have happened here either the girl has lost her mind and is hallucinating that they this little boy is there who happens to look just like her her boyfriend who died or some weird spiritual shit is happening and his ghost showed up as a baby or 
some, I don't fucking know. Like, literally, what am I supposed to interpret out of that scene? It was a very strange thing because otherwise the story is pretty normal. Like, sometimes you see goofy, funny stuff, um, and sometimes it might even stretch reality ever so slightly. Usually not by much. But, like, it, it's a little exaggerated in moments, but most of it's, like, a pretty serious, uh, straightforward, like, story of life in Tokyo. So, what was going on there? And it's kind of, like, important, like, it's kind of, like, an important pep talk moment for her of, like, like a, like a sort of self-actualization happens there. Uh, am I meant to believe that she, like imagined that or like it was a metaphor because like she seems to think that that kid was actually there like she believes that that really happened so i i don't know i i just didn't know how to take that scene it was a strange feeling reading it um so yeah overall this is an okay book i wasn't that into it i would recommend it to other people if it seems like your kind of thing if you generally like any osano you you've probably already read it um, it's definitely way less, like, twisted and experimental and, um, like, psychologically deep than, say, A Girl on the Shore, whereas that story felt like it had something much more unique to say than this one did. That story explored sexuality and depression in more interesting ways than this book did. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if I could say the same of Oyasumi Poon Poon. Overall, I'm not sure how much Inio Asano is really my, like, aesthetic. I don't really know how much his stories would resonate with me that strongly. Like, even A Girl on the Shore, I, I thought was a, I thought it was a good book, but it's not really my style. Um, you know, I really feel like he's just probably more broadly accessible, but not necessarily for me. Um, but I still want to read his other stuff. I definitely want to read Dead Dead Demons Day 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 Destruction since it's recommended to me all the time. But anyway, that's it. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Welcome again to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that occasionally gets the opportunity to film two videos back to back, ergo padding it out for a beautiful two weeks. We've got Astra Lost in Space. This is a manga from Kenta Shinohara, the same guy who created Sket Dance, which I didn't know until I was, like, already reading it. Um, and it was kind of a thing where, as I got into it, and I started to feel, like, what the sense of humor of the manga was, I was like, who the fuck wrote this? And then figured that out, and it made a lot of sense. Now, I was never a big fan of Sket Dance. Um, it's a Shonen Jump manga, like a comedy gag series, but I don't really enjoy the sense of humor of it, which is a lot of, like, characters pointing out that someone else has done something ridiculous. It's that very, like, Tsukomi bokeh style of Japanese comedy where one character does something stupid and then another character yells at them for doing something stupid, which I think has always been a style of comedy that's difficult for people like me from the West to really appreciate. It's such a, like, Japanese comedy style that I, I don't really understand what's funny about it, you know? Like... Usually the joke itself is funny, but the character overreacting to it is kind of not. And it's rare, I think, that a series can do that really well or, like, downplay it enough that it doesn't get obnoxious. But Sket Dance and this manga do it, like, a lot. And, um, you know, Kenta Shinohara is, like, he's kind of been hyped for the fact that he was, like, the assistant to the guy who wrote Gintama. Um, and Gintama, of course, is, like, a hugely popular comedy series, but I don't think they're really that similar. They've, they've had, like, crossovers and everything, but, but in any case, um, this manga is quite different because it's not comedy-focused. It's primarily a sci-fi adventure series that just has a strong er undercurrent of comedy, and I would say that the comedy is the weakest element of it, and also that it's too dialogue-heavy, but we'll get to that in a bit. But, you know, it's it's a pretty decent sci-fi adventure. It's about a bunch of kids who are going to something called Planet Camp. Because it's, it's in a universe where, like, faster than light travel is common. People go to other planets all the time. We're in, like, a far-flung future setting. 2063. So I guess not that... I mean, he's he's probably way underestimating how long it'll take for us to be able to freely fly through space. But, um, but it's in 2063. The characters are all going to space camp to, like, they're basically, they're just left on, like, a planet, and they're, like, here, you're on this planet, you gotta live for your, like, forage for yourself, you seven kids for, like, a week or whatever, and the adults fuck off. And immediately, these kids get sucked into some kind of space-time portal that deposits them on the far-flung side of the universe, 
and they happen to find an abandoned ship there, which they, they commandeer, and they're trying to find a way to get back to Earth, like, from this way distant part of the of the galaxy, um, while nobody really knows that they're out there. So it's, like, a high-stakes, dramatic sci-fi, but, like, it's all presented very... Very comedically, very, like, low tension. You're not, like, worried that characters are going to die or anything, but they are in a tense scenario. And, and like, it, it, it can have dramatic moments and, like, good character beats because it's in such a dramatic scenario while mostly being, like, a lighthearted comedic space romp. But, um... So, yeah, these characters are, like, landing on alien planets, learning about them, and they have to learn about each other, become friends, you know, deal with each other's hang-ups. There's lots of, like, teen drama in this because the characters are, like, they're, they're very, like, uh, you know, shonen teenager characters. Like, they all got kind of one- or two-note personalities and, like, interpersonal conflicts. There's a lot of characters yelling at each other and stuff like that, which I am not a fan of, and it's one of the difficulties I had reading this book. But, um, you know, the, the idea of it is strong enough of like these characters have to like sort of make do with each other and grow as people so that they'll be able to survive in these extreme conditions. It's a very typical kind of adventure story, but, um, but an effective one. And the artwork is really, it's really solid in the character design sense. These character designs are great. The girls are extremely attractive, especially this girl. She's waifu material. Um, but unfortunately, her personality is just, she's a tsundere, like, she's just really inauthentic and snippy and argues all the time, and she's kind of trying to learn to deal with that as, like, one of the early plot, uh, you know, character arcs in the manga. Um, but, like, while the designs are really solid, I don't think the panel layouts are, like, that strong, I don't think that you often see something that's gonna, like, blow your mind. It's, it's competent. They're, the alien worlds look okay, you know... This this all works narratively and it and is cool enough, but like you're not gonna come to this for the art. Except for the cute girls. Especially all the fucking adorable lolly girls with fucking cute outfits on, which are what sold me on this manga in the first place. Let me try to find a good picture of some cute girls. Um Okay, like look, here's okay. Here's Kutier. She's the girl who I showed you earlier and said was waifu. She's super hot. And then she's got this adorable little sister who's also traveling with them. And she's cute. And so you've got, like, you've got a pretty good hot and cute girl quotient going on here in this manga. Which is what made me curious about it. As well as the fact that it's, like, kind of a weird space thing. And that it uh, had so much dialogue. Like, I'm, I was looking through this and, like... There's just an average of shit tons of dialogue per page. But this is unfortunately the worst thing about this manga, is that it's too fucking wordy. It takes a long time to read a chapter of this, and so much of that is just characters bickering and, like, dumb gags that it just feels like it's taking way too long to get to the point. Like, by the end of this volume, like, they had done a satisfying amount of space exploration, but it had taken so long to read through all of it that I ended up feeling, like, kind of bored a lot of the time. And if this got an anime adaptation, I think it would be, like, grindingly slow. Like, this would probably make up for, like, six episodes, this one volume, just because there's so much fucking dialogue. And, like, unless the anime could really trim that down, which I feel like it wouldn't, because this is a Shonen Jump thing, so, like, I feel like if they adapted this, they'd try to make 50 episodes out of it, and it would just be a crawl, you know? And that's really unfortunate, because I think it could have been, like, a fun space adventure, but there's just too much focus on constant bickering between characters and, and like, you know, these one-note gag personalities that get, get old pretty quickly. And while, you know, there is characterization and arcs to all these characters, they're also just, like, the most average teenage anime character arcs that, like, I can't really resonate with because, like, I've seen it a thousand times, you know? So overall, I would say this is, like, an okay manga. Like, this would be a good, like, early foray into sci-fi for, like, a young person. Maybe if, if, if you're, like, someone in their teens who's, like, both really into sci-fi adventure and into, like, goofy com comedic characters, I could see liking this. Um, for me, it just kind of felt like, I'd rather either have something that's harder sci-fi or harder drama or more goofy and more funny and not quite this kind of middling interaction of those. So I probably won't end up reading any more of this, but hey, 
if you like these cute girls and space and you're less annoyed by Japanese comedy uh, cliches than I am, maybe you'll have a great time with it. I could easily imagine this getting an anime adaptation at some point, so maybe it'll get talked about more in the future, but we'll find out. And that's it for this episode. I'll see you next week. Hello and welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show which always either is like five episodes preloaded ahead of itself or like two weeks late. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about Spirit Circle, a manga from the same person who created Lucifer and the Biscuit Hammer, which I haven't read, uh, but I've read this one and it's pretty cool. Uh, I've, I mean, I've only read the first volume and I'm sure that a lot of viewers who will be interested in this manga will have already read farther than me. This review might not be that helpful for you. But uh, this is a pretty interesting manga about this kid who meets this, this new transfer student girl in his school and she seems to fucking violently hate him but he is like totally in love with her. Also she has a ghost that follows her around and he can see ghosts and so that's weird. And it turns out that the two of them have this incredibly long history each with each other because they have um, been reincarnated many times over the years. And in most of their past lives, they have encountered, encountered each other. As well as in future lives, they will continue to do so. So I think that's going to be incorporated. That, it seems to be suggested by... Uh, it says uh, reincarnations that span across ancient history and the far-flung future, but we haven't actually seen the future in this particular volume. But anyways, uh, so there's kind of like a Cloud Atlas thing going on, I guess. I haven't actually seen that movie either, but it sounds like the same plot synopsis. Um, but these these two characters have to kind of suss out what their histories were with each other and try to resolve this conflict. Because in this current timeline, um, the girl kind of likes the boy. Like, he's clearly a good guy. And she's having a difficult time hating him as much as she wants to based on their past lives, which she has much clearer memory of, and he doesn't. And so he's kind of reliving some of his past lives in dreams over the course of this volume. So a lot of this is just build up to, like, a central mystery. And I gotta tell you, it is very, very rare on this show that I read the first volume of a manga and I want to continue it on the basis of how interesting the story is. Like, on this show, typically, if I do buy the second volume of a manga, it's more about the art style or, like, the attitude, like, reading, for instance, Fire Force, you know, I like it because it's an Atsushi Okubo manga, I like the style and everything, um... But it's been, like, forever since I bought a volume 2, or wanted to buy volume 2, just so I can know how the story continues. And that's how I felt in this. Um, I really like the way that the backstories of characters are portrayed, like, getting into their past lives. Um, we start off with a more simplistic one, uh, just, like, a sort of normal, sappy backstory kind of thing about, um, like, when they were in an Aztec civilization, and the boys... Uh, like, the version of him that existed at, at the time was in love with this young girl. She was used as a sacrifice because that was, like, seen as an honor in this society. And the one who ultimately sacrificed her was the other girl. The girl who now hates him in the present. And, um... Basically, all throughout space and time, he's been causing problems for her previous incarnations. She's kind of been causing problems for him as well, and he's only kind of just realizing it. But both of them are kind of like never the fault of the other person. They're more the fault of the society that they belonged to at the time. And I think that's probably the most interesting element of the storytelling. It's like, the reason the girl had to be sacrificed is because that's how that Aztec civilization was. And later on, we get a much longer memory sequence, which is by far the more interesting one and what really got me like engrossed in this story where we learn about a period in like probably the 17 or 1800s or, or whatever the witch trials were um where the main character his uh, incarnation was a knight who had to murder this witch like he just wholesale murders her because that's what he's been taught is that witches are evil and he has to do that she brands him and he basically has to fade away from society because like nobody will have him around and so he spends like the rest of his life like we get to see this character's entire life over the course of like 20 years where we see how he falls away from society how he makes these friends with like other kind of like social recluses 
who um, all eventually die on him. And he ends up taking in this little girl who somebody just like leaves on his doorstep, raising her to uh, adulthood, and then he dies while he's trying to like move her to the next place. You know, spoiler alert, but like that's not the really important part, like those specific details. It's the way this story is told that makes it so interesting and that we get quite so much detail into this character's life. Like this feels like a complete story of this other character who now feeds into the way that these two main characters understand each other and um the girl is a reincarnation of the witch who he just like murdered at the start of his story you know whereas from his perspective this witch cursed him for his entire life and he was kind of miserable for the next 20 years you know so like it's 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 never quite just their actions but like the way that that destiny kind of led them in this direction that's caused the conflict between them whereas in the current timeline they kind of like each other it's a really interesting interplay of elements, and I really want to see where it goes. Uh, the character artwork is really nice. Like, the character designs are pretty simple and straightforward. It's very, like, shonen manga. Um, like, none of these are character designs that you're going to remember forever. But the panel layouts are really good. Like, this manga has a great sense of pacing, a great sense of drama and tension. Um, you know, there's some really, like brutal expressions when characters are fucking feeling you know some type of way i would say this is just all around like really well constructed manga it's great it's dramatic the only thing that i would knock it on at all is like the art style being like not incredible not super memorable but like the actual construction of the manga is so good that it easily makes up for that and again the story is just really interesting and like it's it's kind of a really different experience with a shonen manga, like, one that that has, like, the typical shonen manga characters in the typical, like, middle school setting, but, like, the story so quickly veers away from that and isn't focused on just, like, the progression of these characters and their power systems, but more about exploring this, like, richly detailed history that they have together and, like, how that affects them in the modern day. So, yeah, great manga. I'd recommend it. I'm definitely going to read more and uh, check it out. See you next week. Welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that has never publicly announced its schedule and hopes that you haven't noticed it. Today I'm going to be revealing, reviewing, rather, Unmagical Girl, which is one of the better manga I've even uh, reviewed on this show. I really like this thing. The premise is very simple. It's about this magical girl who uh, gets sent to our world. She, she's literally from a magical girl anime, and she comes out of a computer... Because the director of the anime uh, died some time ago, and his computer has been handed down to his daughter by his by by uh, by her mom. You know, she was just trying to get rid of it, and she ends up with this computer, and it goes on the fritz while she's looking through the data that it has about the magical girl show, and the magical girl comes to life, and now she has to live with the girl as a roommate. And what makes it fun is that it's sort of like a fish out of water story. But what what's so great about this particular magical girl, um, you know, that that sort of sets her apart from, say, the magical girl in um, what the fuck was that anime called? Re something. The one that it had re in the title it was not re life or re zero, but it was uh, re creators. There you go. Recreators. No, this magical girl is different because she's from sort of an otaku-oriented show. Like, it was made in an early morning time slot and was meant to be a magical girl show, but because her father is sort of a, uh, a lecherous and weird man um, who is into just, like, really, like, bizarre writing ideas and stuff, it ended up being, like, kind of a really weird magical girl series that wasn't that popular, and, like, the spin-offs that came out of it, like, the sequels and stuff were the ones that, like, sort of got things back on track to the path of normalcy, and now it's, like, it's, it's heavily implied that this, like, is Precure, essentially, but, like, the modern incarnation is totally watered down and nowhere near as interesting as, like, the crazy one that was made, um... You know, when the, when the main character was a little girl. It's got this real interesting element to it of, like, commenting on the nature of anime production, first of all. Because, like, it's not only a magical girl show, but also one with, like, a troubled production from kind of a weirdo director, you know, that has, like, a very small cult fan base. And, like, all of these elements play into the story just as much as the elements of just, like, what would it be like if a magical girl came to our world? Especially because she's sort of an older magical girl. She's, like, 
she's portrayed as an adult, essentially, in the story. I don't know if it's that, like, she reached the end of her development at the end of the show and was an adult or something like that, because it's implied that the story takes place, like, after the ending of the show. But in any case... She's basically an adult magical girl. She's the same age as the girl who she moves in with. And the main character girl is like, I want to say 19 or 20, and she's a college student living uh, living alone. So that's nice that it's not just some high school girl. But like, like most, she has no friends, and she's a big anime dork. And she's got like tons of figures and stuff, and just like... You know, is, is, is living the otaku loner life and is mostly okay with it, but it was because of her wish to have a friend like um, Pretty Angel Near Brave here that brought her out of the computer. I could have been using her name the whole time. It's written right here on the back of the book, and I could have read it and remembered. The artwork is cute and cool and expressive and funny, and, and it's all around good. It's a solid time. There's lots of good gags, lots of real fun fish out of water jokes, lots of real fun just like scenarios that the characters get put into. Um, at first, it's more centered on the idea of like really like you know this magical girl has superpowers, but she's in the real world. Though as it goes, it the real world is not super grounded. It's a little bit you know anime enhanced like. Their landlord's like a fucking Yakuza uh, daughter who's like a fucking insane badass martial artist who beats people up and shit. And the other magical girls and like characters from the story start emerging into the world as well. It's sort of implied that everybody from the show has been released from the computer. Um, so it gets a little bit wackier as it goes, but it's still got a pretty grounded aesthetic and, um, and character designs. And it's... It's real fucking, uh, there's some, there's some real good visual gags. I just flipped to one of the better jokes. I don't want to spoil it, though. So, um, yeah, this thing, I mean, I laughed my ass off reading this. Like, I'm laughing just re flipping through it and remembering some of the jokes. So I know this shit's real fucking funny. Um, I, it's not, not every manga I read that is trying to be funny can make me laugh that much. So, yeah. Unmagical Girl, definitely recommend it. I'll definitely be picking up future volumes of it because I was kind of excited by it. If you're a fan of Magical Girls and comedy and, uh, and, and fucking this cute-ass glasses girl that is the main character, like, let me give you a real good... Let me give you a real good shot of her. I mean, you can see her right here on the color pages, like... And, and incidentally, Near Brave, when she's not transformed, which is rare, uh, looks exactly like her. They're basically twins um, because her dad... Of course, modeled near brave after her, so you know, but like an adult version with big tits. She did not, I don't think, grow tits that big actually when she did grow up. But you know, Papa can dream. So, anyways, that's this. Uh, go read it. It's good. See you next week.